Hey, come on. Get them shackles off him. Poor sod can't eat proper. Do you know? I'm not sure I like that. What if he runs for it? He's worth a heap of coin. Ah, bollocks. Been all in him a week, hasn't tried a thing. Why'd he up and bolt now? Matter of fact, got to thinking. What did a sweet, gentle chap like him do to get the Queen of Zericania so riled? She's a shrew, that's what. Queen and witch in one. <laughs> Worst of both worlds. Enough about her. What do you say to one more of your tales? While we toss down some cards. Ah, oh, why not? And since you mentioned one queen... The year 1267. War hung in the air, its scent palpable. The mighty empire of Nilfgaard stood poised, greedily eyeing the northern realms just across the Yaruga. In light of the threat, the realm sovereigns met in summit. They made declarations, pledged fraternal assistance, forged alliances, and then, in good spirits, dispersed. Among them, Meave, Queen of the twin realms Lyria and Rivia. Know the name? Hmm? Heard her beauty extolled? <laughs> Justly so. Remarkable she was. Not for her graceful exterior, but for her persistence and courage. Where was I? Ha! Ah. As the Queen and her retinue neared her capital, Count Caldwell appeared. In Meave's absence, the Count was to have helped her son, the youthful Prince Willem run the Twin Kingdoms. Caldwell had clearly ridden hard. Drops of perspiration dangled from his whiskers, his neck red and chafed from a rough, starched stiff. Hail, Your Majesty. Delighted to see you in good health. The summit, it ended fruitfully, I hope? Yes, at its end letters were exchanged, documents signed, paper. Time will tell of what value. That will suffice as cordialities go, Caldwell. Tell me what's happened, for I sincerely doubt sheer longing prompted you to ride out. Indeed, Your Grace. Another circumstance inspired me to do so. <clears throat> the strays of Sparla, the bandits, I was attend to during Your Grace's absence. The situation's gotten out of hand, I fear. Steady, Caldwell. Come now. Deep breath. All right, speak. What has happened? Be precise. As your grace ordained. I set out and was nipping at the bandits' tails for long. We pursued for weeks, until scouts returned, having sighted the strays' camp in the forest near Lockeran. We waited for nightfall, to surprise them as they slept. Alas, it proved a ruse. We found the tent empty. Straw stuffed dummies round the fire. Soon, we learned that as we waited for the sunset, the strays had snuck away, rounded our positions and ridden to Hawksburn. I beg your pardon, my lord. The tax collectors. That is where they station. So the gold? All of it? Uh, it's stolen, your grace. But I shall do all in my power to recover it. This I vow, if it be your grace's wish. After weeks in the saddle, Your Grace's wishes are modest. A hot bath and a night's sleep in her own bed. Yet, they shall have to wait. I must look personally to this matter. Your force, Caldwell, I will now command. You... Send a herald to Hawksburn. They must prepare for the Queen's arrival. Air the rooms, dust off the porcelain. Make certain they do it. Do you see now, Reynard? I believe I foretold it would be thus. My son wasn't ready in the least to rule an entire country. I confess, Prince Willem has much to learn yet. Hmm, yes. And very little time. Milka, they stretched her over a fire till she told them where she buried her gold. Rather die than tell him she would. But I know where she kept it. Sit tight, sketch it out for you.
Count Caldwell rode at the column's head, scanning its flanks with a wary eye that, despite his advanced age, proved very sharp indeed. Your Majesty! Bandits! There! At the tree line! The Count's footmen, unaccustomed to escorting their Queen, sought to shield her with their bodies and assumed a tight formation to do so. They were promptly knocked aside as Meave charged headlong at the bandits, brandishing her blade and bellowing a ferocious cry. Attack! Charge! Bigger they are, easier they are to target. To attack the Queen? An outrage! Your Grace, the men await. You must lead to begin the attack. A spirit's win. salt of the earth they are, Your Grace. They'd follow you into fire. You need simply say the word. Ha! I shall teach you to respect the crown, you dogs! Think about Look out! Seek cover! We are bombarded! Abolista, your command. <laughs> the strays took tail and run! <laughs> yes! Our victory is assured! Sound the horns! May they sing praises of this triumph for ages! The battle's not yet done. It is better to conserve our strength. Prepare for a strike that will prove decisive. Battle formation! Protect the Queen! Ever have a storm knock out one of your teeth? I congratulate you on your latest victory, Your Grace. The bandits stood not a chance. <clears throat> Matters seem indeed to have gotten out of hand, to put it mildly. Meave said, arms crossed atop her shining breastplate. They've grown bold. Doubtless after the raid on the manor, the tax collectors. I've not heard of an ambush on the high road of foe. Caldwell explained, avoiding his liege's wrathful gaze. Enough, Caldwell. We must put things right. Come! The Queen's retinue set out, cavalry in front, infantry and arbalists close behind, and, following in the rear, the bandits, bound in chains. Ah, I do adore this prospect. Yes, Lyria, the Pearl of the North, with its hills and dales. Why, its beauty matched only by that of its Queen. After three weeks in the saddle, I've my doubts, Count. We shall pitch camp here. Our soldiers need respite. A spell of it they deserve. What can I pour you, milady? Vizima's finest? Or a nice Redanian bitter? A bit of respite, Reynard. Uh, yes. But if you've any new orders, Your Grace, I can be ready at any... At ease, Reynard. At ease. Don't you find it wearisome sitting alone? Wouldn't you prefer another's company? Swapping tales with the innkeep, even? Your concern, I most appreciate, Your Grace. But I prefer silence. Has it always been thus with you? Ever a man apart? Quite the contrary, Your Grace. As a youth, I gloried in company. Delighted in conversation. So what was it that changed you? That delight nearly cost me my head. But, do you truly not know the tale, my lady? How I came to be your departed husband's aid? I don't, but would gladly hear it. I had but twenty winters behind me when I enlisted. Yet I was granted the rank of lieutenant from the start, not by merit, but by birth. The respect of veteran officers, both my peers and seniors, that they could not grant. Nor did I deserve it. To earn that respect became my driving aim, and to seem wise beyond my years, I began spouting off about the King's decisions. This maneuver Reginald botched, that he failed to think through, and yet elsewhere he'd blundered like a schoolboy. Well, a brilliant strategist Reginald was not. They dubbed him the courageous, not the cunning, for good reason, I dare say. It was not long before I was clanking about in shackles. Another officer had reported me. I was charged with Les Majesty. The court-martial took but a quarter of an hour to deliver verdict and sentence. I was guilty of treason, and the noose awaited me. But Reginald first stayed the execution, then ordered that I repeat every word I'd uttered about his person or deeds. Soaked with sweat, 
my voice cracking. I did as he ordained. Reginald listened, raptly and silently. And when I'd finished, he declared I was right. He then appointed me his personal aide. A clever lad like you, I can always use at my side. Indeed. Though hardly sharp himself, wisdom in others Reginald both recognized and heeded. It was then I swore two things. Firstly, never again to wag my tongue like a fool. Secondly, never to betray his trust. And you never did. Know what he told me moments before he passed. Trust none of them, Meave, save Raynard. The old sod was right about that, at least. I thank you for sharing that tale, Raynard. Truly. Alas, I've come to fear a villain might simply not be cut out to be a king, let alone a good one. A harsh judgment, Your Grace. Let's not be hasty. The prince has but sixteen summers to him. And is thus fully grown. The crown he should be able to bear at his age. Yet I left the land in his care for but a few months, and look what's become of it. Bandits roam and loot unchecked. We might yet learn of mitigating circumstances, events beyond his control. Would that it were so, Reynard. Would that it were so. Elsewise, we must hope and say as will demonstrate more wit than his brother. Though I see little chance of that either. It's time I attended to other matters. Is this what I pay taxes for? To be robbed along the high road, and in broad daylight, no less? Were it not for mandatory merchant routes and stacking rights, why I'd have gone round, through Sodden. They told me, they told me, Lyria's a wild land, lawless, chaotic, a damn disgrace. Gods of mercy, whatever is this filth? Necrophages, drawn here by blood scent. For such vile monstrosities to prowl the high roads of my realm. I won't allow it. Attack! The fog in broad daylight, with the heat positively sweltering. Have we to do with some manner of sorcery? We shouldn't exclude the possibility, my lord. And great caution we must exercise. Raynard, what is this? Some spectre? A strigger? I can't be sure, your grace. It's the first I've seen of any such... thing. These carrion eaters, I know them, appeared on my estate last spring, enticed by the corpses of those of my sheep that fell. Harmless at first, until, that is, they fill their guts. Seem to become quite powerful then. Fearsome they look, true, but they bleed just as we do. Onward, slay the filth! I'm a one, say. Ah! So fortunate we routed the beasts before they had a chance to gorge. Your Grace, yet more come. They fill their bellies, ma'am. This doesn't bode well. Oh no, not well at all. Curses. Strong as steers they've grown. And they show no fear. Frenzied, my lady. It's bloodlust. They lose all instinct to survive, feel no pain whatever. I've witnessed this before. Your Majesty, we must give ground. Fall back. We can't win. Must minimize our losses. My Queen, there is no shame in seeding the field when fortunes turn sour. Victory must be ours now. We shall not retreat. Arms at the ready. Attack! Look there! Yet another abomination. Oh, that stench. My salts. Where are my salts? We must trust each other. The beasts hadn't a chance against us. Victory is ours. Soon, Queen and retinue arrived at Hawksburn. The men stationed there they found standing at attention baking under the blistering noonday sun. Your Majesty, Count Caldwell. Stand at ease, Sergeant, and report. The local peasants we've rounded up in the yard, Your Grace. Expect they might have lent the bandits aid. Yet our courtesy ain't inspired them. They haven't peeped a word. Might it please Your Grace to summon the hangman? He ties a noose for them, should have them jabbering right quick. I'll speak to them first. Your Majesty. 
For the Queen to question commoners, why, it's simply not proper. Whom for? I shan't be stripped of crown and titles for it, so no impediment do I see. Lead me to them. Bow low for your sovereign, Her Majesty, Queen Meave of Lyria and Rivia. Have mercy, Your Grace. We bear no guilt, we simple folk. Calm your hearts, good folk. Though your queen I may be, you are subjects, not slaves. Meave extended a hand, the royal ring gleaming upon it. Unfamiliar with protocol, a pleb gripped it firmly and gave it a shake as hearty as a good scrub in the tub. My, we shall be addressing one another by name afore long. This is an outrage! Guards, grab him! I've all in hand, Caldwell. Forgive me, Your Grace. I'm not accustomed, no how. Nonsense. You've a firm grip, a spry handshake, and a bold spirit I can respect. What do they call you, man? Helmer. Son of Florence. Delighted, Helmer. Now understand me, man. I am in dire straits and in need of your aid. So please, answer my queries in full and forthrightly. The bandits. Whom do they follow? Him, my lady. We've seen him. No name, just an odd title. The Duke of Dogs, they call him. My. A blue-blood thoroughbred mutt. Where are he and his hounds bound? Did he say? That recall, Imogen? What did he name? A Gleaton or something? Clayton. Lord Clayton. His estate lies to the south. Sound the horns. Have the men form up. We march at once. Milady, I'll be no eye for the Duke. He's a good man. Gave us proper brass for the welcome we gave him. Shared what grub he had. Shut it, louts. The Queen's had her say. Your Grace, your orders. What are we to do with them? Leave them be. The harvest draws close. Hard work. They'll have their hands full. Oh, my lady. Thanks be to you. Thanks be. I pray, Mother Melita, lay watch over your kind heart. Pray she watches over yours. Should I hear of you sheltering bandits again, of you lying to my officers, I shall return and put torch to every hut, field and orchard. Understood. Meave set off toward Lord Clayton's estate at a gallop, her mount knocking the peasants aside as it kicked up a cloud of dust. The folk of Hawksburn spoke of the royal visit long after, albeit ever behind closed doors and in harsh tones. <sighs> that rumble. What is it? Look out! Rock slide! The bluff crumbles! Fall back! Save yourselves! Your Grace, the wagon, we can use it as cover. Forward, we must move it forward. What now? You're far fewer than I presumed. Summon your comrades, damn it! Chop, chop! The far reach from a whip. Abolista, your command. I'm a war, sir. The wagon! Use the wagon now! Oh, we've come through, Reynard. I thank you. The walls of the temple collapsed. The buttress is doubtless damaged by something. Or someone. A peasant cart, loaded with a heap of hay, came rattling down the road from the opposite direction. Clear the road! bellowed Count Caldwell, standing in his stirrups. Make way for your queen! The peasants obediently turned their cart into the roadside nettles. As she passed, Meave glanced towards it and froze. Atop the hay bale lay a badly wounded man gripped by fever. The thick, sweet stench of rot wafted from his bandaged legs. Gods! Who did this to him? Meave asked. Bandits? Nay, my lady, replied the cartman. Twere a beast. Out to the east, down Wetterton Way, lies a barnyard, old as the elves, they say. The peasant continued. 
Clayton was setting snares round about there. Came running back to us, drenched in blood, rattling on about a long-haired wench come climbing out a grave. We've taken him to the good sisters of Melitale here on bridge. Perhaps they can help him. I'm certain they can. And will, replied the Queen. Though just looking at the wounded wretch, she knew he'd expire before nightfall. God speed you on your journey. The Queen whistled, and her mare resumed its trot. Shall I send for a witcher, Your Grace? Caldwell asked. One of those freaks should make short work of the monster. Until we apprehend the bandits, I shan't allow a single soul to leave our company. Even on such an important mission as finding a witcher. Meave replied. Any who did would be captured at once. But, if fate brings us near Wetterton, perhaps we'll see to this monstrous Harridan ourselves. Your Grace... We've only just fought beasts and scarcely escaped with our lives. This she-beast will take a silver sword. Magic formulae. Yet a dozen arbalists will have to suffice, the Queen said, calmly but firmly. And please, Caldwell, do stiffen your spine a bit. Now onward. Travelling the high road, they heard the bells of a temple to Mother Melitale, situated at some distance. Meave turned towards Reynard. What have we today? A sacred feast? Not that I recall, Your Grace. The Queen's brow darkened, her hands clenched into fists on her reins. Then they sound the alarm. Follow me! Stained glass shards glinted in the grass. Bits of down, ripped from quilts, wafted through the air. The priestesses, gathered in the yard, were seeing to wounded pilgrims, setting toppled, oft beheaded or armless statues back on their feet. What happened here? The strays of Sparla fell upon us, sighed the prioress. Stole the offerings, the monstrances, holy books. My lady, I implore you, come to our aid, recover what's rightly ours. Ever clever, Meave scouts soon discovered the bandits' tracks. They led to some thick hazel groves east of the temple, the perfect place to hide or to lie in ambush. It's all come clear now. Sabotage. It was the bandits who weakened the walls. The bandits had pitched camp in a nearby wood. Spirits buoyed by the wine they'd stolen from the cloister cellar, the brigands had not posted sentries. Another round! To the sisters! <laughs> Neve's soldiers were eager, insistent. The desecrators would be punished. Yet only the Queen could order the assault. High time we put these strays on a leash, spat the Queen, spurring her horse. Two arms! Follow me! Tankards clattered to the ground as the strays reached for their weapons. The brigands would not even fathom giving up without a fight. Hey! Left, right, left, right. Ever have a storm knock out one of your teeth? The Queen's company defeated the bandits and recovered the loot. Silver chalices, reliquaries lined with mother of pearl. Gold embroidered robes. The priestesses would be grateful to have their treasures returned, Your Grace. They would pray ardently for your victory. Reynard opined. Yet, you could also keep the silver, expended on the war effort. And who's to say which, prayer or coin, would be more useful? Hard times the realm now endures, the Queen said. After a pause. Yet this can't justify a lapse in principles. No. We must defend them all the more. Meave ordered everything returned to the priestesses. All of it. Down to the last Gulden. Moved by the Queen's gesture, some of the novitiates joined Meave's ranks, aiming to bring succor to any Lyrian wounded in battle. Queen and company rode off with no gold to show for their toil but most certainly richer in spirit.
Sure, you can bind a rabid dog, tie his four legs together, but you'll not stop him from lashing out and biting. Arrow! You've bested us, I, but you'll not find the Duke of Dogs near as easy prey. Oh, no! Off to Wetterton, are ye? Bonnet turn that. Just the folk of be on shite. As they neared Wetterton, the Queen ordered her company to halt. She then sent men to the town for supplies. Those sent returned more quickly than she'd assumed they would, their satchels empty, their mounts foaming at the mouth. Your Majesty, the townsfolk have gone right mad, herded all the elves and dwarves at Market Square. Tis a slaughter. The Queen knew well that if she failed to intervene, the town's streets would flow with non-human blood. Just as she knew her meager force might not subdue an enraged crowd. What is your command, Your Grace? Reynard's question pierced the silence. What can it be, dear friend? Answered the Queen, then spurred her mount and rode off towards the town. Her troops followed, running as fast as their legs would carry them. When they passed inside the town gate, they saw corpses lining the gutters. Meave realized she had arrived too late to prevent a tragedy. The crowd was drunk on blood. Its rage would need to be quelled with an iron fist. Step away, or see your heads bounce down the cobblestones! Reynard, who started this? I must know. So much hatred. We must put a stop to it. You can try to win them all, but you won't. Discipline shall bring us. strike the largest clusters. Disperse the mob. Happily, Neve restored order without suffering any losses. Reynard then learned that a nobleman's ire had triggered the violence, ire at having discovered a theft. Suspicion fell on the non-humans he employed. He accused them, they protested, and the row soon engulfed the town. But there's something else, Your Grace. Reynard gestured towards an aged man who stood grieving, his face in his hands. I've witnesses who claim the strays of Sparla are the thieves. Though the tragedy seemed the result of a misunderstanding, justice would have to be served. Those responsible for the slaughter would need to be punished. The question was, how severely? You are guilty. That can't be denied, said the Queen, turning towards the bloody rioting's instigators. A false rumor you took, and turned into a cruel lynch. Thus punishment is your lot. A public lashing, fines, imprisonment. But you shall keep your lives, for enough blood has been spilt here this day. Wetterton's inhabitants breathed a sigh of relief, but the non-human survivors took offense at the lenient sentence. Soon after, the Lyrian army's elves and dwarves quietly disappeared, deserted. Few doubted the reason. They would not risk their necks for a queen who held their lives in such low regard. They should have stayed put neath their mount. We'd not have had no problem then. The Lyrians entered the graveyard. Crickets chirped in its tall, windswept grass, and lush green moss covered its crumbling gravestones. Only a fresh bloodstain upon a mausoleum wall suggested that something disturbed the dead in their rest and hunted the living. Save your tears, throw off your grief. An eerie voice sang, its ghastly lament standing Meave's hair on end. Soon your life too shall see. As you pass into the eternal glow. A pockmarked, 
pustule-ridden creature crawled out from behind some gravestones. It vaguely resembled a shriveled, hunchbacked hag, until its head split into two halves, forming a tooth-spiked maw. Attack! Everyone! My spirit's willing and how the... These damn boots are killing me! What... what was that filth? The Queen croaked hoarsely as the dying monster writhed in agony at her feet. I know not, Your Grace, replied Reynard. But to be safe, I would have the corpse chopped up and burned. Elsewise, we will not be certain it shall not return. Yes, have it done, Meave said, brushing her hair from her beaded brow. But quickly, lest dust catch us in this foul place. The Lyrians soon resumed their march. As they left the cemetery behind them, some believed they still heard the haunting dirge upon the air. Or was it just the wind whistling past mossy tombstones? Meave's ear suddenly caught brisk music and voices raised in song. She had no doubt. A wedding ceremony had just begun in a hamlet just off the high road. When the bride's father spotted the royal retinue, he rushed up to beg the queen to bless the newlyweds. Meave obliged cordially. Encouraged, the father boldly invited Meave and her court to join in the festivities. You'd do us a right honor, my lady. A and your men would bolster the strength of fort to march ahead. We beg ye, eat, drink, and rejoice with us. I haven't slippers to dance in, but I trust I'll manage somehow. Lead on, good man. The nuptials took place in the shade of a vast oak tree. Then the newlyweds and their guests walked in procession to a barn adorned with flowers. An uproarious celebration ensued. As she watched her soldiers dance shoulder to shoulder with peasants, Meave felt a surge of pride at being their queen. The heart of Lyria. It beat most powerfully here, not in the gilded halls of palaces. Suddenly, a cry went up as strange armed men rushed into the yard. There's the lass! Grab her! Before anyone could stop them, the bandits took the bride and fled into the woods. The drums and fiddles, suddenly silenced, were now replaced by weeping, moaning, angry calls for pursuit. Deep grief upon his face, the host turned to Meave with a plea. Milady, we beg of you, help us! We'll not leave you wanting, good man! Shouted the Queen, slipping her feet into her stirrups. Follow me! Sure! The earth trembled beneath the weight of horse and hoof. Tankards laid out for a midnight toast to the bride and groom clinked prematurely in the quake and the Lyrians charged forth into the dark wood. Though the Lyrian cavalrymen had imbibed spirits throughout the night, they not only managed to stay upright in their saddles, but even gained on the bandits and cut off any chance of escape. Meave's troops defeated the bandits and rescued the bride. Only to be surprised, for the maiden fair dropped to her knees and burst into tears of sorrow, not joy. Weep not, child, the queen said, placing her arm upon her shoulder. It's over. You're free. Nay, not so, your majesty. My lady, I've no love for Jan, no wish to wed him. It's my father. My family forced me. My heart's fimbers, he arranged the masquerade. I beg ye, if you've one ounce of kindness, if you've a heart, let us leave this place together and free. This scheme you've pursued, I can't condone. Folk have been wounded, some might have died, said the Queen. Yet, equally, I cannot let others force you to marry. So, may we go, Your Grace? You may. Fast as your legs will carry you, afore I have a change of heart.
Though none dared utter a word of chagrin, Meave sensed her subjects' bitter gazes upon her. At the first light of the morn she left, without so much as a nod goodbye. Told you she were an harlot. Told you she'd mean trouble. You spy that column of smoke? God damn it! Make haste! As the Clayton estate appeared from behind a tree line, the Queen and all in her retinue knew at once they had arrived too late. A veritable swarm of bandits milled about the yard. Who have we here? Not take a gander, lads. The Queen herself is deign to come and see us. See you? Then kill you? The strays of Sparla? Tis you who lead them. Tis you they call the Duke of Dogs. Aye, tis I they dub so. And in other pleasant ways. Prince of Pariahs, Thane of Thieves, Baron of Brigands, and Marquess of Mendacity. Colourful titles all, yet you omit one. Come on, cutthroat! I beg your pardon and cry foul! I am anything but common! You needn't get excited, Caldwell. Where is Lord Clayton? Sadly, my lord's no longer with us. Turned us away, you see. Denied us hospitality. A sacred right, after all. Angered the gods mightily, I expect, as he promptly met a tragic end. Fell in the well and broke his neck. I've heard enough. Two arms! Attack! Oh, lads! What say we throw this queen a ball? Ha. Watch your heads! <coughs> Stand back! <coughs> Tis some alchemical concoction! Bravo, Your Grace. Well played. I can't say the same for you, I fear. You'd have done better to die in battle. Bound for Lyria now, where the hangman will have his way with you. Splendid! I've ever wished to see the capital. Quite certain of yourself, you seem. Many a fool you have braided nooses for me, Your Grace. Yet, as you see, my neck's straight as a pike. My threats are never hollow. And if it's an escape you weigh, well, we've yet to see any man abscond from the dungeons of Lyria Castle. I'd hope so. For to be known as second just wouldn't be worth the trouble. Ugh. Take him away. As soldiers placed the Duke of Dogs in shackles, there was a sudden commotion. A messenger rushed in, sweaty, gasping for air, smelling of smoke and blood. His gaze spoke terror. Your Majesty, graces! Nilfgaard's crossed the Yoruga. Black-clad hordes! Villages burn! Folk lie murdered! Nilfgaard! Gods help us! They march for Dravagrad! Prince Willem! He can't hope to arrive in time with aid. Help us. You must. Dravagrad. Blast it all. Listen close, soldier. You're to take a fresh mount, ride hard back to your commander, and say the Queen comes to repel the foe. Your Grace, begging your pardon, our force. We aren't many. Let's send for reinforcements first, elsewise. Reynard, I've seen Nilfgaard's trebuchets at work. Should we delay until we're stronger, they'll leave no stone standing in Dravagrad. We must ride for the town at once. As her men prepared to march, Meave climbed the manor's tower. Smoke rose in columns in the distance. As more black pillars appeared one after the other, she knew they meant another home, another barn, another mill was in flames. Tears welled in her eyes, yet they were tears of anger. Bastards. If it's war they seek, it's war I shall bring them. Reynard, prepare to ride! First bandits, now this. 
Misfortune does indeed come knocking twice. Hmm. In hobnail boots, tramping upon my land. Nilfgaard shall regret this. I swear on all that is sacred and blessed. Suddenly, Meave's force found itself marching straight towards a Nilfgaardian company. To the Queen's surprise, the invaders did not immediately assume battle formation. They proceeded instead in her very direction without a sign of panic. The man leading the Nilfgaardians was clad in rich robes. He exuded pride and the scent of musk. I am Traherne Vardifir, Your Majesty. I was asked to present your esteemed grace the ultimatum of the forces of the Empire of Nilfgaard. The envoy cracked the seal on a scroll, unfurled it, took a deep breath, and began to read. I, General Ardal Epdahi, demand the immediate and unconditional surrender of Lyria and Rivia. Elsewise, I will burn down every city, town, village, and temple, place all your subjects in chains, and your armed men, defeated and captured, I will hang along the roadsides as a warning to all others in the barbarous north. As the final threat echoed in Meave's ears, the envoy put away the scroll and stood waiting for her answer, a mocking smile on his face. He allowed himself this insolence, believing the immunity accorded diplomats would shield him from any form of royal ire. I thank you, sir. A sophisticated missive that proves beyond a doubt Nilfgaard's superiority over the culturally backward north, answered the Queen in a voice frostier than Mahakam's snow-capped peaks. To delay this matter I see no reason, so I give you my response to His Excellency. Go ahead and try, Horson. That said, Meave slapped her mount with her reins and galloped away, leaving the Nilfgaardians in dust. Envoy and escort turned to go whence they came, the Lyrians sending them off with a din of whistles and curses. Then one day, gazing towards the horizon, the Queen spotted Lyrian banners whipping about in the wind. At long last, she said with a smile. Meave resolved to speak with the commander, one Baronet Eldar. It was the first time they met, and the youth very much impressed her. Yet instead of questioning Eldar about the foe's troop movements, Reynard took the conversation down a seemingly irrelevant path. And how's your father, if I may ask? In good health, I hope? Yes, though he still nurses that bump he suffered while hunting last winter. Yet he's not one to complain. I'll tell him you asked. Irritated at the trivial nature of the conversation, Meave gave her horse a dose of her reins and cantered off. Once Eldar and his men were safely behind them, she took Reynard aside. Reynard, this is no time for gossip and pleasantries. We are at war. Yes, Your Majesty. And in such times, little should be taken at face value. Even a man's name. Get to the point, Reynard. Eldar's father died a month past. His son, I venture, should have known as much. But that means... Oh, the bastard. Impeccable accent, though. I fear he's rather representative of what we face. Nilfgaardian spies are ever well prepared. Tell me, how did you know? He wears no mourning on his armor. We're not for that. I dare say I might never have guessed. What are your orders, Your Grace? To observe these Nilfgaardian mummers? Assemble a force. Tell them to follow our new allies. Observe them closely. As you wish, Your Grace. Reynard scouts did as ordered, watching the false Lyrians while themselves remaining unseen. Soon after, a scout returned with news that the false Lyrians seemed headed for Rastberg, a castle several leagues to the north. The false Lyrians approached Rasberg Castle. They sought to convince the defenders to open the gate. 
As their commanders negotiated with the commander on the ramparts, the remaining infiltrators crouched hidden behind a wall, awaiting the signal to rush forth. Time for Baronet Elder to join his falsely claimed father, muttered the Queen. Follow me! <laughs> Discipline! That is what you <laughs> folk lack. The castle is secure, Your Grace. The Nilfgaardians found themselves in a clinch. As boiling oil and tar rained down on them from the walls, they attempted to retreat. Yet Meave's halberdiers cut off their path, and at the fight's end, Meave was victorious. The garrison commander now knelt by the body of the purported Baronet Eldar, in truth a Nilfgaardian spy. He shook his head in disbelief. He... he addressed me by name. Knew our watchwords. Why, if you hadn't come along, Your Grace, I fear even to think on it. Let this be a lesson, then. Trust no one, not a living soul. Though victory was theirs, the Lyrians left Rasberg in mightily low spirits. They now knew well that Nilfgaard's spies were no less a threat than its heavy cavalry, than its war machines that spit fire. Milady, if I may. The enemy yet lurks. You must bolster your force. You must incorporate a detachment from my unit. Times the world a day. Can't even tell friend from foe. Treachery round every corner. What the devil is going on? Where are our reinforcements? Why does Willem not ride out to face the foe? Relieve besieged towns? I can't say, Your Grace. We haven't had a single scroll from the Prince. Gods be damned! I've the impression I'm alone in fighting the Black Clods. Meave's retinue was riding through a narrow gully when a shrill cry cut the air. And van den order! The gully came alive and soldiers in black armor rushed forth. A cry in turn went up and down Meave's ranks. Ambush! I'm a warrior. I want them taken alive! I need answers! After the skirmish, the Queen's troops brought several Nilfgaardian prisoners before her. Reynard, who had the best command of their mongrel tongue, interrogated. His first question? How many battalions were marching on Dravagrad? Kes Zagdran Ep Dravagrad Ven. The prisoners whispered feverishly, then one spoke on their behalf. They would answer no questions until the Queen pledged to free them in return. The Lyrian soldiers saw this as arrogance and said as much. Conditions they're giving us now? Sons are whores! I say, we find a tree with a strong bow, several... Ignoring the objections of her retinue, Meave pledged what the soldiers wished. They, in turn, admitted their commander had pushed forward ahead of the army's core force. He now awaited reinforcements that would let him take Dravagrad. The prisoners claimed these units would march through the village of Turnifen. Hmm. To lay there in ambush. Hold them. They could not join forces, Reynard whispered, leaning in towards the Queen. We would gain the advantage for the decisive battle. Neve had obtained invaluable information while the prisoners would gain their freedom. Or so it seemed at the time. I would ask you to pledge to not reveal our position to your commanders, said the Queen. Yet so eager were you to share your army's secrets with me that your word is of no value. Leave my sight. Once the Queen's words had been translated, the prisoners breathed a sigh of relief. Freed, they ran as fast as they could towards a wood, glancing back to make certain there was no pursuit. But Meave kept her promise. Meave's force made its way to the place the prisoners had indicated, a quaint village named Turnifen. And indeed, soon a cloud of dust appeared on the horizon, 
A large enemy force approached. We await your order, Your Grace. Reynard peered at Meave expectantly. Meave could not let this opportunity pass. The Nilfgaardians marched on, oblivious to the threat. As soon as they found themselves within range, she signaled her arbalists to loose their bolts, then led her cavalry in a charge. At them! Follow me! Geop! At them! Valyria! My prescription. A bit of bloodletting. Hmm. A highly curious case. Splendid! One last push now! Not a black clad to remain within sight of Dravagrad! Thus Meave led her force to victory. Historians would later term this encounter the Battle of Turnifen. Those Nilfgaardians who survived it spoke of a terror on the field. A woman warrior in gilded armor spattered with blood, her blows so powerful as to pierce the heaviest breastplate, the thickest buckler. The Lyrians now set off toward Dravagrad, buoyed by the vision of their foe expecting reinforcements, friendly banners on the horizon none of which would ever arrive. The black clads may outnumber us, but we're the more cunning with the wit! Black clads trampled me son, your majesty. They saw him walking along the road. They didn't slow, not one bit. My lady, I've nay much, but I'll gladly give me last coin for the cause, for vengeance. Meave and company passed by a village evidently pillaged by the Nilfgaardians. From afar they had heard cries, but as they drew near they recognized them not as cries of grief, but as cursing cries of anger. Give him a proper walloping, the scoundrel! <laughs> Mercy, good folk! I've done nothing wrong! The villagers stood gathered near the hamlet's center, surrounding an elf, bloodied and cowering. Stones in hand, the peasants threatened and cursed him. The queen demanded an explanation. A ruddy-faced blacksmith stepped forth and spit. A Nilfgaardian spy the horse and his, your majesty. He's the one brought him here to raise the village. He's got a hang. The other villagers agreed with the smith. The elf fell at the queen's feet and groveled. Have mercy, Renner. Save your loyal subject. They lie. They fought me only as I am an elf. Meave was torn, could not decide who spoke the truth. She thus resolved not to meddle at all. Coming to the elf's defense could only rile the resentful crowd. Later, as the villagers placed a noose around his neck, the elf cursed the queen's indifference to his fate. Devils take you, bleder bragger! Devils take you, your line, your whole damned land! Meave gave the signal to depart. As her force marched off, all heard the elf's cries of grief and pleas for mercy. Then they stopped mid-sentence. And the silence rang in Meave's and her soldiers' ears. One traitorous head less than we had afore. <laughs> Remember this, Nelf Guardians. You'll not defeat the gods. They fear not your torches. They fear not your swords. Blasphemers, pagans, idolaters who prostrate themselves to the sun. Never seen so many armed men in my life, and each one in black plate and winged elm. Heard them Nilf guardians got hearts of stone. No mercy for a single soul. A dark shadow suddenly cut across the sky. The queen instinctively brought her shield up, convinced a Nilfgaardian catapult had lobbed a boulder their way. But when the boulder landed in the road ahead, it smashed into splinters and proved 
an empty barrel. This is what they cast at us. Barrels. Is this some jest? Well, they're not known for their sense of humor, the Nilfgaardians, answered Reynard. Meave stood in her stirrups, squinted, peered into the distance, and let out a hearty chortle. For the barrel had been loosed by neither catapult nor trebuchet, but by a rock troll consumed by fury. At what? A company of Nilfgaardian soldiers had pitched camp by the cave the troll called home. Troll or non-troll, said the queen, drawing her sword. None deserve to die at Nilfgaard's hands. Follow me. Larum, a sail to the Navian. Protect the troll. Ah, it's safe. Your grace, uh, the troll. It's a bit... unpredictable. Humans good do. Shoop hell. The Lyrians smashed the Nilfgaardian force. The troll, having grown suddenly pensive, gazed and picked at the invaders' corpses. <sighs> Clad in black, humans. No good humans. Just so, uh, Sir Troll. The North Guardians are a devious lot. Our land they've attacked most treacherously. Uh, clad in blacks, humans hard. Why no good humans? Big lot armor. Chew got to. Try morsel of human, you wish? Do you know to whom you speak? This is Her Majesty, your Queen. Greeting, your Queen. Shoop is me. There, there, Reynard. I believe I can manage this. Say, Shoop, you've quite the stockpile of kegs. Do you engage in custom, perhaps? No. Keg's good for smash-mash when Shoop angry gets. Ah, uh, but the uh, costume engaging. That what mean? Hmm, it means... Well, to trade one thing for another. At a profit. One thing for other? For... 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 For, for glitter rocks, even. Yes, if you play your cards right, you might just convince someone to pay you in rocks. Cards. Cards, kegs, trade, glitter rocks. Oh, soup plan god. Soup gotta go. Uh, a four human go, soup human give. Your queen aid give. Your queen aid get. The troll turned on his heel and ran out of his cave, his destination known only to himself. As she moved to leave, a hunch told Meave the world would yet hear of this troll named Shoop. Home at last, your grace. Mm-hmm. We shall not enjoy it long, I fear. Soon we must face the black clads in the field. Yet a moment's peace we will have. After that drubbing you gave them at Dravagrad, they'll wish to rethink their strategy. Neve had ridden out of Lyria in early spring, her retinue modest, as none larger was needed for the brief summit of sovereigns. She returned now to her capital, at the head of an army that dragged behind it Bandits and Nilfgaardian prisoners in chains. The whole city came out to greet her. Its traders, craftsfolk, priests. Also, her eldest son and heir, Prince Willem. A boy who, it seemed, might never be prepared to rule. Neve and Willem rode side by side past the cheering throngs, their faces frozen in regal smiles. 
It was not until they reached the castle stables that they found a corner in which to speak freely, candidly. Welcome home, Mother. Content I am to see you, to be sure. And I'm happy to see you. Though I dare say I'd have been much happier to witness you leading an army towards Dravagrad. Willem, I trusted you. Left the realm in your care. Indeed. And I, in turn, did my utmost to choose the best course for... Willem, don't be so damned courtly. There's no one else here. My son. Nilfgaard has invaded our home. We're at war. When rulers don't strive and don't choose, when rulers grab their swords and shields and ride out to defend their subjects. You didn't let me finish. All right. Say what you wanted to, please. I fear I'd be hasty, Mother, and I didn't want to be. When we got word of the invasion, the lords convened at the castle. They demanded I hear them out. They wanted to give me counsel. If I'd rushed into the field to confront the foe, I'd, I'd have been half blind to the situation, not known all the options I had at my disposal. A ruler never knows all the options, yet he must decide and act nonetheless. I need to prepare. I'll see you at the Council of Peers. And indeed she did when the peers convened in the throne room. Surrounded by animal hides and Zeracanian tapestries, the Lord stood in tense silence, awaiting the Queen. When her figure filled the doorway, they fawningly prostrated themselves. We've myriad matters to resolve, so I trust you're well rested. Whatever the case, I've no doubt we shall meet the dawn afore we're done. Firstly, we must ask assistance. Pen a letter to King Demavend. Scribe, take this down. Dear... What? Uncle? Cousin? Blast. Again. I, Meave, by the God's grace, Sovereign of Rivia and... Your grace? Mother? The peers and I, we've come to propose another solution. Yes, out with it. We wish to acknowledge Nilfgaard's authority. Pledge fealty to the Emperor. I beg your pardon. The black-clad hordes outnumber our forces manifold, and they're far better equipped. We stand not the slightest chance against them in open... You will not lecture me about Nilfgaard's army, my son. All you know of them you garnered from coloured renderings, whereas I faced them at Dravagrad. I faced them and crushed them! But your grace, the losses! For this fleeting victory in which you delight, how many of your subjects had to perish? Bend a knee afore the Emperor, and you shall spare thousands. Nay, never! Understood, Caldwell, not ever! I'd hoped to persuade you, but it seems I've failed. Nonetheless, the die's been cast. We've signed the accord with Nilfgaard. Our noble lords stand with me. The blood left Meave's face. She had realized her son, who had ever professed to detest politics and shirked his duties as crown prince, had just stabbed her in the back, as had her entire court. What is this? Treason to my eyes! The gallows is what awaits you! Willem rules Lyria now, and should you not acquiesce and approve the accord, I fear only you, milady, shall have the pleasure to meet the hangman. Don't get ahead of yourself, Caldwell. My mother will not be harmed. Not one hair on her head. Understood? Confine the Queen to the tower. You err deeply, my son. The Queen was confined to a cell. Gilded armor she had traded for a simple robe. A courtly retinue for a swarm of rats. She was the very picture of misery. At the window of her cell, gripping the bars, Meave stood powerless, her anger so great she wept and wailed. Her Lyria was free no more.
Have I come at a bad time? Demons take you, Coldwell. You've long been at this scheme, haven't you? You left the strays of Sparla to roam the realm, to forage, so that I would have to look to them. And thus gained your cohorts the time they needed to complete Lyria's sail to Nilfgaard. You've seen through it all, that's clear. After the fact, of course. But still... <laughs> Willem. You turned him. How? The boy's not fit to wear the crown. Hasn't sufficient wit nor valour. I know this. You know this. Just... he knows it not. Willem fancied himself a statesman, which terribly to prove he was one. I made it possible. I've been amply rewarded, I have. Palatine since just yesterday, in fact. You'll have neither my blessing nor congratulations. Sorry to disappoint you. I seek neither. I've come for another reason. To bid you adieu. Willem does not seek your death. Does not even fathom it, as you well know. Moreover, his resolve will wilt in time, and he'll wish to free you. So, come the morn, when the young king rides out to pledge fealty for General Epdahi, you shall use your bed linens to hang yourself. <laughs> I see. You wish to see me bow before you, lie prostrate, beg you for mercy. Plow yourself with a pike, Coldwell. And you needn't send your thugs. I'll not falter nor hesitate. I'll take my own life. Adieu, Your Grace. And use your last evening wisely. Meave felt a rush of despair, yet bit her lip to mute any weeping. No, she would not give Coldwell the satisfaction. Morning arrived with the sound of footsteps in the corridor. Neve rose from her cot and stood in the center of her cell. She was prepared for anything. Well, nearly anything. The... the Duke of Dogs? Titles seem senseless under the circumstances, don't you think? Let's forgo them. I'm Gascon. Has Caldwell sent you? To kill me? A no and a no. Actually, you're free. How shall I put this? That cad, Count Caldwell, used yours truly and the strays as bait in a scheme aimed at kicking your shapely backside off your throne. Now, I'm hardly vindictive. First to forgive, in fact. Take your threat to send me to the gallows. Forgotten already. Yet being played for a fool, I cannot abide. So when the strays freed me, I knew what I'd do to spite the Count before I disappeared. I'd free you. That's to say, on one condition. You've got to request it of me, my lady. Courteously. For my realm I will do this, and much, much more. Even bow for a brigand. Thus I beg you, Gascon, Duke of Dogs, grant me my freedom. Ha! Incredible! I've lived to see someone grovel with dignity. A true ruler you've got to be. You are free. And grateful. Now please let me pass. I must get to the city jail at once. Would you look at this woman? Free her from one prison, she flies off to the next. They hold Reynard there, and if I've any ally left, anyone who's not betrayed me, it's him. I must get him out. Hold, my lady. Unarmed. Alone. Have I any other option? Hmm. In a sense. See, they locked a few strays in the city pits, too. Got a common cause, I'd say. Care to join forces? The Queen took Gascon up on his offer. Then she, Gascon, and the strays snuck through the city to its dungeon. Reynard had not wavered for a moment in his devotion to the Queen. 
never the slouch. He had also not lost any time. I've inquired among the other arrested soldiers. Many are prepared to fight, even die at your side, Your Grace. Seems they may yet get their chance. But now we must flee. All of us. Yet in leaving the jail, the company ran into trouble. When Caldwell's cutthroats had failed to find Meave in her cell waiting for her secret execution, they had informed the Count. He, in turn, dispatched patrols into the streets. The Queen and her cohorts ran into one such unit. Blast! We shan't outrun them. Two arms! Gascon! Bloody hell, where'd he get to? Your Grace, we must make haste! Caldwell's roused the whole city by now. Ah, should have listened to me, old lady. Didn't think I'd leave you just like that, did you? Honestly, I did. Your Grace, what guarantee do we have that they won't stab us in the back? Catch! I thank you, Gascon. You and your men. For your aid. Tis now, my lady. Strays never say no to a proper brawl. No brawl this was. Sun rising against mother. Lyrian striking at Lyrian. I fear a blood war's begun. Come now. Seems to me the war's ended. Your realm's lost to Nilfgaard. You've no army to speak of. Then I shall assemble a new one. And with it have Caldwell hanged and drive Nilfgaard back across the Yoruga. <laughs> You're mad! How will you find the men? Riding from hamlet to hamlet, speaking from atop a crate? No. I shall find them in Edurn. I've a favour to call in with King Demavend, and I'll sway volunteers to my cause on the way. Well, you've your first willing warriors already. How so? We've nothing left in Lyria. Our hideouts are compromised, Caldwell's sure to set a price on our heads, and Nilfgaardians roam the land in numbers. Besides, I'll be right tickled to see proud Queen Me fighting elbow to elbow with a bandit she'd wish to hang just a half day afore. Well, it is said my foe's foe is my friend. And I'd be a fool to turn down assistance now, no matter who offers. So be it. Very high-minded of you, my lady. So, shall we shake on? Nay? Well then, the high road beckons. Though first we must escape the city with our lives. Follow me. Lyria was hers no more. Meave now had to flee her capital and realm as quickly as she could. Wont to travel the city streets in a gilded carriage, the Queen now saw them from a slightly different vantage point. Ugh. Is this the only way? Are you quite certain? The Queen is a common fugitive now, so she'd do better to pinch her nose and whinge not at all. At long last, Meave reached the gate. Yet this she found shut tight, locked and guarded. Gods be damned! Easy, Your Grace. Nothing we can't solve with a quiver full of quarrels. Those are our men. They were, Reynard, were. Gascon's raiders were poised to loose their bolts, but were thwarted when the Queen stepped out in front of them. What she... Your Majesty? I... I've orders to arrest, Your Grace. Place me in irons, then. Please understand, I, I haven't a choice. Fear not. You'll be rewarded by Coldwell in Nilfgaardian Florens. The captain's head dropped. His cheeks burned crimson. Go, your grace. Flee now, but only to return. Remember this, Gascon. I'm no fugitive. I'm a queen, robbed of a rightful crown. And though I may need to venture to the world's end before I return, I shall have it back. Having fled Lyria, Queen Me ventured into Edirne, her old friend Reynard and new ally Gascon at her side. 
The war had bitten into this land too. Still, Meave hoped to sway King Demoven to her cause, and with his aid, to oust the traitors, retake her throne, and drive the Nilfgaardian invader from her realm. Yet to start, she was forced to fight, Scoia'tael no less. Emerging from a wood, Meave's retinue encountered a unit of elven rebels just moments from hanging a handful of prisoners. Among the latter, the queen spotted a woman, a proud warrior with a striking, thick black braid. The lass I believe I know. Well, unless we rush to her rescue, it'll soon be you knew her. Well said. Lyrians, attack! Hang the butcher! Veloa! Nay, do on vacation. She can't breathe, Your Grace. We must rush to her aid. I shall not fail! The elves, scatter them. They block our path. The Scoia'tael warriors shocked the Queen with their speed, their cunning, and their cruelty. Yet in the end, the Lyrians prevailed. When the last elf hit the ground, the Queen had her men untie those they'd sought to hang. A thousand thanks, Your Grace. Her many tales of your valor. Pleased to see there weren't just flattery and propaganda. I'm... Black Railer. Hager, we saw you there. You command King Demoven's special forces. That's right. Though not many remain to command. So I see. How did it come to this? My liege sent me to wipe out a Scoia'tael band, led by a rat called Eldane. Followed the vermin's tracks for several days, straight into his trap, turned out. Hunting elves in the woods. Truly inspired, I must say. Had no choice. Doing nothing would have brought a surer, swifter doom. The Black Cloud have invaded Edurn. Thanks to Elvin aid. They snap our supply lines, lurk like dogs, prey on vulnerable units and scouts. You mean to say Nilfgaard's broken your defences? Aye. Though their march will soon halt, believe me. To advance, they'll have to take Rosberg. A stronghold that's yet to fall once. They'll break against its walls like waves upon the rocks. While Edurn stands, the North is not yet lost. I'll convey Your Grace's words to the King at the first occasion. I'd rather hope to convey them myself. I have come to Edurn seeking aid. I wish to ask Demovend for support. The King is in Rosberg, overseeing siege preparations. I'm heading that way too to report on our skirmish with the Scoia'tael. I might serve as your guide. These lands I know better than any. Excellent. Guide on. Yes, Your Grace? <sighs> How has it come to this? I, Queen Meave of Lyria and Rivia, must prowl about the underbrush like a common bandit. And you, General Rayna Dodo, once proud commander of four elite regiments of footmen, now lead a gang of deserters, bandits and scythe-wielding peasants. I do so proudly, Your Grace. You must be joking, Reynard. Your Majesty, under your husband I served ten years, under you another eight, and never in that time did I fight for a more worthy cause. We seek not to grab land or stifle a peasant revolt. We fight for all the North, for our freedom, that of others. And you alone didn't give up, didn't even consider bending the knee before Nilfgaard. Yes, all true. Yet look where it's brought me. Your struggle has but begun, Your Grace. And I will do all in my power to see you triumph in the end. I cannot forgive myself one thing. That I failed to see through Caldwell's schemes. He must have plotted treason for months, years even. Yet I suspected nothing. Don't be too hard on yourself, Your Grace. Easily said. Ugh, if I'd only realized it in time. Nilfgaard would have found a different traitor, or sent an assassin north. 
It was unavoidable what happened. The Blackclads would have attacked in any case, and we'd have stood no chance to defeat the foe in open battle, repel him, drive him out. So, had you been there when the Peers assembled, you also would have voted to bend the knee? No. My honor would never have allowed it. I'd have thrown myself into the fire, and probably died a fool for it. As matters stand, I still have a chance to thwart the invader, his intentions. It seems, in a twisted turn of fate, I should be grateful to Cordwell. It's time I attended to other matters. So, Gascon, the soldier's life, does it suit you? <laughs> About the same as the bandit's life did. I beg your pardon? The tents are cold, the food's shite. On the plus side, plenty to drink, most days. A skirmish here, a scuffle there, Nilfgaardians one day, elves the next, and whoever we rout, we rob of what they've got. Requisition, you mean? Fully in accordance with the laws of war? Oh, please. Save your excuses for your father, Confessor. The Duke of Dogs. Whence the name? Not certain I should tell you. It's uh, a personal story, somewhat. I insist. So, thing is, I'm a werewolf of sorts. Did I hear werewolf? Of sorts. You see, when the full moon glows in the night sky, I transform into a creature that's half man, half dash hund. And then all the other hounds of the night hearken to my command? Howl! Oh, forget I asked. Uh, with pleasure. I can't stop wondering. How did your strays break into the tower in Lyria? They exploited its chief weakness. What weakness is that? I oversaw its construction myself. Walls five feet thick, bars and grates of the sturdiest iron. All tremendous, I'm sure. But how much do you pay the guards? What? I, I don't know. The garrison's commander is in charge of that. Let me tell you then. Not much, Meave. Not much at all. From atop a throne, it's hard to spot the little things. Example, a guard hard up for coin, or one with ambitions. But seeing that second nature to even the most ordinary bandit. Take any castle door. To open it, to open all, one needs but a pouch of gold. It's time I attended to other matters. Farewell. How fare you, Rayla? The quartermaster, did he assign you a tent? He tried. Oh, and? I refused it. Best to sleep beneath the stars. Little chance of a foe catching you off guard. Rain accepted, perhaps. I'm not made of sugar, ma'am. I'm not gonna melt. One sees very few women in the ranks, let alone in the special forces. How did you come to join? On merit? Proved I'd be of use? Yes, well, naturally. But how exactly? I was 15 when I went to enlist, but the sergeant in charge of signing folk up told me to scurry on home. So I proposed a wager, arm wrestling. If I won, he'd let me join. If I lost, I'd pay him a hundred crowns. And that kind of coin? You had it? No, so I had to win. As we sat down at the table, across from each other, he laughed and rolled up his sleeve. When it was over, all around us were laughing at him. Then I just followed orders. Did so well enough to draw the king's attention. I must go. We'll speak later. Gods. The entire country up in flames. Eptar, he warned punishment awaited Edurn, that he would show the land no mercy. What in God's names did you do to him, Rayla? Nilfgaard offered us an alliance against the rest of the North, but Demaven declined in his clipped soldier's speech. They say Eptar, he flew into a rage and swore he'd reduce Edurn to rubble. The Lyrians arrived at an ancient, half-desiccated beach. Its trunk sat atop a tangle of thick roots and scraps of paper covered with tiny scribblings fluttered over it from top to bottom. 
Travelers crowded all around. Barefoot refugees, bony pilgrims, peddlers with armored escorts, and shifty-eyed men with the haggard look of deserters. The Wayfarer's Beach, Rayla said. Travelers of all sorts swap tales here. Perhaps we can glean something about our enemy's movements. Or paint the enemy a clear picture of our own. Gascon interrupted. Nilfgaardian spies no doubt flock to this tree like flies to particularly pungent dung. Disregarding matters of status and station, Meave personally asked the travelers for the latest news. They soon transformed from terse to talkative, sharing tales of an elven bandit named Eldane, a Nilfgaardian general called Frighef who murdered an entire village, and a sorceress who cure any ailment for a few coppers. Then a blood-curdling scream put a halt to the gossip. Meave's soldiers had begun to quarrel with the merchant's guards, one of whom now lay dead on the ground, his throat a gaping wound. The filth besmirched your honour, your grace. I said you took Dale and, and ran from Luria like a belted bitch. The travellers were unmoved by this explanation. They demanded the Lyrian soldier be punished according to Eden's laws by chopping off the hand that dealt the fatal blow. With a heavy heart, Meave decided the soldier would have to be punished. Reynard silently drew his sword from its scabbard. No, I shall do it, Meave said in a tone that left no room for discussion. Soldier, you sought to defend my honor. For that I praise you. But you committed murder. For that, I must punish you as called for by this land's customs. Tears streaming down his face. The foot soldier rolled up his sleeve and placed his arm upon a tree stump. Meave took a deep breath and raised her sword. A terrified scream filled the woods. The travelers gained newfound respect for Meave. Though far from rich, they passed a cap and presented the queen a handful of coins to show gratitude for upholding their laws. As for her Lyrians, they marched away from the wayfarer's beach in somber silence. You'd folk in Crumhorn are trading with the Scoyatel by day for all to see. Soon after entering Edern, Meave ordered a halt. She wished to sit with Black Rayla and plan their onward march, for Rayla knew every path in the realm, including ones not drawn on any map. They were hard at work when shouts rang out among the tents. One final time I shall say it. As your senior officer, I order you to depart the training grounds. Or... Or oh, what? Pray tell, you'll have me drop and give you fifty? What is the meaning of this? Your Grace, I had thought to use this interval to drill the recruits, teach them... To walk. To manoeuvre, Gascon. A world of difference. In perfect harmony must soldiers traverse the field of battle. Otherwise, they could break formation. The enemy would penetrate our lines, and our army could be slaughtered. And therein lies the rub, dear Reynard. Army. This is no army, but a band of partisans. If we do not adapt to the rules of desperation, if we adhere instead to the Academy Codex, we shall lose. Laying traps, wiping tracks, that's what we should teach the lads. Not marching to the beat. Oh my eye! A fighting force must have discipline. Otherwise, tactics and planning are impossible. A soldier must obey orders. A point on which we all agree. And since they are mine to give, I order you both to calm yourselves at once and never air your squabbles in front of the men again. Our resources are limited. We cannot do everything at once. Prepare your proposed plans for training the recruits and I shall decide which we shall follow. Clear? Then get to work. Your Grace. Meave heard Reynard call out from behind her. A scout's returned. Claims to bear an urgent message. The Queen halted her horse and waited for the soldier to reach her. He abandoned all formalities and jumped straight to the point. Lady, a black-clad caravan, armed to the hilt, rides this way. To believe the rumors, 
they're hauling a load of war loot back south. Raynard gave the soldier new orders, then turned to Meave. Hmm. Sounds like a prime opportunity to replenish our coffers. Indeed. An opportunity we cannot ignore. The Queen said. Your unit will block their path. Gascon and his men will hide in the woods and strike their flanks, while I shut the trap, attacking from behind. Their plan established, Meave gave the signal to move out. A brief moment later, the fight began. We must drive them into the ambush! Follow me! The caravan is ours, milady. Their plan ended in success, the Nilfgaardians crushed. As soon as the dust had settled, Neve tore the canvas off the nearby wagons to see what precious loot they had so carefully guarded. She expected to find gold, jewels, or exquisite silks. Instead, she saw dirty, terrified figures bound in chains. Slaves, Raynard muttered. Their precious cargo. Slaves. Behold the glorious future the Empire brings us. Meave ordered the prisoners freed and discovered they were Adernian peasants on their way to dig canals and dredge swamps as forced laborers. You are free. You can return to your homes, the Queen said. If she expected words of thanks and gratitude, she was in for a disappointment. What homes, my lady? asked one of the peasants, holding back tears. Took our land, they did. Nothing we have now. Not a rag to wear, not a crumb to eat. Leave us, we die. Soldiers don't do us in, monsters will. Us human hunger and cold don't get us first. The Queen was about to answer when she heard Gascon, standing behind her, whisper, Before you make any rash promises, please, some maths. Dozens of hungry mouths to feed, and weak bodies to defend, twice as many tired legs to wait for, while war rages all around. You do realize... You cannot save everyone. I attacked this caravan hoping to fill my coffers, the Queen said. Instead I have only secured a new drain upon them, but very well. In these ill times we northerners must help our own. Women and children in the wagons, the men shall march alongside to the rear. I warn you. If you cannot keep pace, we shall leave you by the roadside. Move out! The Queen's gaze momentarily caught the eyes of an old woman her soldiers were helping onto a wagon. Tears of gratitude poured down her soot-stained face, across hard lines left by years of destructive toil. Meave was convinced she had done the right thing. As Meave neared Gatberg, her eyes were drawn at once to the black pennants flying over its palisades. Nilfgaard's pennants. Her scouts found the city's buildings intact, its streets unstained by blood. Black-clad soldiers could be seen guarding storehouses holding loot pillaged from nearby settlements. Curiously, these soldiers were very few in number. The gates stand open. Clearly the Imperials expect no attack giving us the element of surprise. We can take back the city and... And make off with the gold. Gascon finished. Meave hated Nilfgaard and needed gold to maintain her army. Two very good reasons to attack Gatburn. Her decision made, she ordered her men to prepare for battle. Now the invaders would have to try their hand at defending. Larvan! I say to nothing! They feel at home here, the North Guardians. Let's show them they're wrong. Scrubbing duty again? Oh, oh gods. Oh. Notice! All roads! No signs of fighting! These horses must have opened the gates for the black lads. Off to the front yet again. The battle's oh. won, Your Majesty. Oh. The Battle of Gatberg ended in Meave's victory, much to its inhabitants' displeasure. While she examined the Nilfgaardian storehouses, the city's mayor, an elderly gentleman with a walrus moustache, requested a private audience. Your Grace, 
I am old. Kill me, you'll merely save my gout the trouble. So I'll be frank. You've but few men. You'll not spare a one to defend the city. When you ride off, the Imperials will retake Gatberg, peer into their looted storehouses and seek revenge. You will be far off while we shall be oh so terribly near. The old man creaked down onto his knees and gripped the hem of the Queen's coat with knobby fingers. Your Majesty, I beg you, leave the gold, or the streets of Gatberg will flow with the blood of our women and children. Meave contemplated what to make of the fellow. Should he be praised for his forethought and concern for his townsmen, or condemned for cowardice and insolence? Black Rayla, however, had no such doubts. Traitors all. Small wonder the town's untouched. Must have opened the gates wide for the sudden scum. Now they want us to let them fill their pockets with plundered gold. After a moment's hesitation, Meave had her soldiers load the stolen gold onto their wagons. As you pointed out, Mayor, my army is small which is why I need gold to expand it. The mayor said nothing. He bowed to the queen, then hobbled off, leaning heavily on his cane, as if this short exchange had cost him years of life. Was here, just a week past. That was a mill, an inn, out more than ashes now. And of the people, not a trace, not even the bodies. Look to the high road. The earth, furrowed by wheels, hooves. The black clouds went at Rosberg with all their strength. An ominous sign. For Nilfgaard, I'd say. The fortress boasts two new towers, a deeper moat, gate of raw iron. It cannot be taken. What, what happened here? Sadly, it was Rayla who met with surprise. A hundred-yard gap gaped in the unbreachable walls of Rosberg. The fortress itself was aflame, spewing black smoke into the sky. I don't... How? It can't be! There was no time to consider her question, for Nilfgaardian scouts had spotted Meave's company. The Queen knew battle was inevitable, so she gave the signal to form a defensive line, then drew her blade. Your Grace, no guardian fighters remain in the city. There you are! I refuse to believe it. The king could not have died here. Watch for Demoven's banners. If he's here, we must find him. The Lyrians met one note of luck in this song of woe. Rosberg had fallen, yes, but the Nilfgaardians, not expecting reinforcements from the south, had stationed only a small detachment to hold it. Meave led her men to victory and retook the fortress. Or rather, what was left of it. What they did not demolish during their assault, the Nilfgaardians burnt once inside the city. Countless charred corpses of both defenders and peasants seeking shelter from the invaders lay among the blackened ruins. Some had tried to shield their children from the fire with their own bodies, to no avail. Gods be damned! The queen cried, pounding her fist against the wall. Meave was about to give the order to move on when she caught a stifled whimper coming from a pile of rubble. Her soldiers ran to the rescue, their bare hands digging through the fiery bricks. He's alive! The man they pulled from the ruins had suffered horrible burns. His face was a stew of seared flesh and pus-filled boils, and he reeked of burnt meat. Seeing Black Rayla, the poor soul staggered to his feet and lifted a shaking hand in salute. Engineer, Lieutenant Xavier Lemons, reporting for duty. Medic! Send for a medic! Le lemons what the devil's happened? I... <clears throat> I know not. The East Tower, I led the defense. <sighs> Heating oil to tan Nilfgaardian hides. <clears throat> A catapult struck. The cauldron tipped. 
<clears throat> burst into flames. The rest, I cannot say. The fortress fell. Fell? Damned Scoyatel. What was that? Our preparations were perfect. A month, two we could have lasted, but traitors were among us. Elves, dwarves, planted charges on the buttresses. An explosion shook the tower, a hole gaped in the wall. Our men threw themselves in, filling the breach. Vermin, filthy, rotten vermin. I know you suffer, soldier. But Queen Meave wishes to meet with your sovereign, Demavend. We must know what's become of him. Gone, luckily. He oversaw the preparations, then returned to Aldersburg. Two, three days past. Then let us do the same. Reynard, prepare our departure. Hold your grace. Did... Did anyone survive? Anyone at all? The Nilfgaardians might have taken prisoners. There's hope. How could they? An entire detachment? An entire city? The animals. Soldier, my medics will tend to you as best they can. Then we can escort you home if... This is my home, Your Grace. Rosberg. I beg you, let me join your company. Let me exact revenge. I respect your fighting spirit, good man. But in your state... Your Grace, I can hold neither shield nor sword, but I can still fight in my own way. I'm an engineer. I build siege towers, ballista, bridges, whatever you wish. I pray, grant me a chance. Such pain, such ferocity resounded in Xavier's rasping, distorted voice that Meave could not refuse his plea. Once the medics had bandaged his wounds, Meave's men set out towards Aldersburg, following Demavend and the Nilfgaardians. At one point in their journey, Black Rayler rode up next to Meave. The warrior's lips were a thin line, bitten to blood. Milady, the road to Aldersburg leads through Mulderwood, where Eldane's Scoyatel prowl. Same filth who killed my men, and delivered Rosberg to the Black Butchers. Rayla breathed deeply to steady her furious, shaking voice. Please, my lady, I ask you upon the holies, let us find them and destroy them. Meave gave a slight nod. It seemed the road to Aldersburg would prove long and full of challenges. Certainly, Xavier. I welcome all foes of Nilfgaard to march beneath my banner. But what did the field surgeon say? Have you not resumed work too soon? I've strength enough to wield a hammer, though my scars still burn, and fiercely so. My lady, I've seen folk turn and frown at the very sight of me. If my appearance disgusts you, I can... Nonsense. The Nilfgaardians, not you, should be ashamed. You've no reason to hide, no reason to cower. Thank you, my lady. It means a great deal to hear that. You've long served in King Demaven's army, haven't you? Yes, Your Grace. Why enlist at all? What prompted you to do so? Hmm. The King needed engineers. I answered the call. Not terribly talkative, are you? I can build any bridge, any ballista, but to talk, well, it hurts to talk. I see. Well, do not worry. I prefer deeds to words, in myself and others. Other matters await my attention. We shall speak later. As you wish, my lady. Yes? This Eldane, could you tell me about him? He should hang. I'd hope to hear advice that will be useful to us in battle. Hmm. First of all, you can't rightly trust the bastard. He doesn't respect our laws, doesn't share our morals. 
The king once dispatched an envoy to Eldane, despite my advice to the contrary. Found the envoy the next day, eyes gouged out, shaft of his white flag jammed down his throat. So, diplomacy's clearly not the wisest course. But what of battle? What tactics does he employ? Like all elves, he's a worm. Avoids open confrontation, sets ambushes, attacks from the shadows, from midst the trees. It would be best to burn this whole forest to the ground, deprive him and his folk of cover, any place to hide. Sounds rather drastic. Like tossing the babe out with the bath. Believe me, they'd not hesitate to do the same to us. Not for a moment. Rayla, how are you holding up? Not certain I understand what you mean. <laughs> All Edurn is aflame. Nilfgaard's banners fly over its cities. Don't tell me you're not troubled. Of course I'm troubled. I stationed at Rosberg for five years. Knew all on the crew there by name. But that's war. That's its nature. No sense bemoaning it. I see. Just know if ever you wish to talk. I won't. But I do appreciate your concern, ma'am. I must go. Meave's ears caught the sound of a ruckus coming from the camp. Feet! Ingrid! A pox upon you all! It was her quartermaster hurling oaths at the peasants she had freed from the Nilfgaardian slave convoy. A few had stolen supplies under the cover of darkness and escaped into the woods. Terror and dread gripped the other freed prisoners. Meave mulled over what to do with them, and Reynard, as always, offered some advice. Tis high time they went off on their own, Your Grace. They are too great a hindrance. They slow our march, divert our soldiers from more important tasks. And now this. Gascon was listening to their conversation. Meave shot him a questioning look. I opposed taking them in. So, for consistency, I now oppose forcing them to leave. We made their miserable lives our responsibility, did we not? Well then, that is a burden we cannot simply shrug off. Let us not mince words. We cast off these peasants now, they shall die. Meave said in the end. Let them stay. But I want them watched. They cause any more trouble, military justice they shall face. Understood? The freed prisoners sighed with relief. The infantrymen assigned to watch over them, however, grumbled their disapproval of the Queen's decision. It is an army, not a shelter, they said. Meave's ears surely caught the complaint. But the Queen had never let the opinions of others guide her in such matters trusting only her own judgment. Not liking the looks of this, Gascon said, furrowing his brow. Meave followed his gaze. Before them, beside the road, stood a hut with a scorched thatch roof. Why? Huts abandoned, yet dried fruit and mushrooms hang from the eaves. Famine raging all around and no one's been tempted. I'd send a scout if I were you. The Queen did as Gascon suggested, and sent three infantrymen to reconnoitre. They entered the hut and found only silence, that was soon broken by a blood-curdling growl. The soldiers ran out at full speed, tripping over their own legs. Meave drew her sword, convinced a horde of neckers or ghouls would soon attack. But her fears proved unfounded. Instead of monsters, out of the hut came a shaggy dog, a torn scrap of fabric clutched in its teeth. Uh, uh, milady, one of the soldiers began, his face red with embarrassment and his hands covering a hole in his breeches. Uh, was dark as a well inside, uh, and that hound, he jumped out at us all of a sudden biting it and snapping. Bad boy, Gascon said with a smile, then pulled a hunk of dried sausage from his bag. Bought by this generous offering, the dog calmed down at once. Further examination showed the dog was the hut's only resident. Like many others in Edurn, its owners had disappeared without a trace. Their loyal mutt still guarded the premises, waiting for his master's return. Let's take him with us, Gascon said. Otherwise, he'll die here of his own hunger or someone else's. A watchful sentry like this could prove useful in our camp, said the Queen. Fine, he can join, but he shall need a name. How about Reynard? proposed Gascon, a cheeky grin smeared across his face. That way he'll come when you call, 
sit on command and always be a heel. <clears throat> uh, always heel, that is. Watch your words, said Reynard, hand tightly gripping the hilt of his sword. Or you'll learn I'm not at all as tame as you believe. Enough, both of you. That's an order. As for you... The Queen took a good look at the dog, who still had a scrap of fabric in his teeth. Since it seems you have a taste for the cloth of the nether regions, I dub you... Knickers. Will that do? The dog wagged its tail vigorously, as if thoroughly pleased with its new name. Neve's company marched off, a furry new recruit richer. Neve and her companions neared the Moulderwood, a dense, ancient forest of trees whose tangled branches had witnessed the conjunction of the spheres. It was not until King Vidamont's day that a road was finally carved through the primeval thicket, significantly shortening the journey from Rosberg to Aldersburg. Even when peace reigns, danger rules this road, Rayla said. Now, now no one dares travel it. At the edge of the wood by the road stood an enormous willow. Its branches swept down to cover its trunk, looking for all the world like long tresses shrouding a woman's face. Meave had an ill premonition. She did not like the sickly sweet aroma wafting from this tree, nor the metallic buzzing of insect wings. She sent a scout to investigate. He drew aside the drooping branches and stumbled back. There were men bound to the tree, covered in sap oozing from gashes in its trunk. Its heavy scent had attracted swarms of insects, flies, wasps, bees and beetles. They seethed over the bound men, crawling in and out of their ears and nostrils. Eldane welcomes us to his wood, Rayla whispered. Meave stepped towards the tree and saw the men stuck to it were all still alive. Those the elves had caught recently writhed and howled for rescue. Those hanging longer merely followed the queen with half-crazed, bloodshot eyes. Well, are you to stand there all day? Meave screamed to her dumbstruck Lyrians. Free them, at once! Her soldiers needed no more prompting and set about sawing at the ropes with their blades. As soon as they had freed the first captive, before even a word of thanks could be uttered, a flaming streak soared through the air and stuck in the tree. The oozing resin burst into flames, engulfing the prisoners as well as the soldiers who had come to their aid. Elder speech battle cries rang out from the woods as elven warriors launched their attack. Nilkansia! It's a trap! cried Reynard. Defend the Queen! Keep your heads in the fight! They'll seek to blind us with shock and awe! Don't let them regroup! Finish off the wounded! The battle done, Meave surveyed the carnage, her breath still ragged. The thick stench of blood, sap and ash she sucked in made her stomach churn and head swoon. The Scoyotel. I'd heard of their cruelty, but... The Queen said, sheathing her sword. But I... Never have I countenanced a thing like this. Black Rayla, who had just extracted her blade from between an elven gorilla's ribs, smiled darkly. Worst is yet to come, my lady. The Queen regrouped her forces and marched into the Moulderwood. The Lyrians sang none of their usual marching songs. Instead, they walked in silence, eyes darting constantly to their flanks. Hear that? Nightingales. Unmindful of war, they sing on. Those are no birds, my lady. Just Scoitel scouts use animal cries to communicate. Tell the men to hold to the road, my lady. Anyone wanders in the trees, they don't come out. What was that? Meave asked Reynard, who rode beside her. A scream. A man's, I think. Need to investigate. Gather a few men and we ride. Quickly! The screaming came from a small settlement. When Meave rode up to its farmhouses, her horse reared and neighed in terror. Necrophages swarmed all around. The monsters surrounded a few Nilfgaardians who were trying, with no success, to chase them off with torches. Reynard swept his gaze over the carnage and said, They cannot stave them off, and their armor is too heavy for them to flee. 
Neve was uncertain at first how to act. But when she saw Ghoul snatch one of the Nilfgaardians and rip him to shreds, she drew her sword. No one deserves such a death. Not even a Nilfgaardian. Follow me! Lower your weapons! We're here to rescue you! Let the ghouls eat them, I say! Silence! The Queen has made her decision! It worked, Your Grace. The monsters flee. The Lyrians and the Nilfgaardians fought the monsters side by side, a united force. But when the last necrophage fell, the soldiers immediately returned to their respective divisions. Meave's soldiers looked at the invaders askance, uncertain what would happen next. Suddenly, one of the Nilfgaardians broke ranks and fell to his knees. Your Grace, I know you have no reason to trust us, but we are not enemies. We hail from Geso, a land Nilfgaard conquered and made its province. We did not ask to fight in this war by force. We were conscripted. The soldier hefted his sword by the blade and handed it, hilt first, to the Queen. We yearned for a way to desert, and we have found it. Your Grace, allow us to join your army. We long for the Empire's defeat every bit as much as you do. Meave helped the kneeling soldier to his feet. The enemy of Nilfgaard is my friend, no matter who he is or whence he hail. The Lyrians were clearly displeased with their queen's decision. The black-clad deserters from Geso would need to earn their trust. Meave's path took her to the village of Eichenfurt. Unlike most settlements in the area, not a single human dwelled here. Instead, only elves and dwarves sat on its porches and stared at the passing Lyrians with clear aversion. Not a single greeting was extended to their allies in arms. Not a single peddler tried to hawk their wares. The only sound was that of snapping shutters and slamming doors. Something's amiss, Rayla said, furrowing her brow. Order a halt, my lady, and give me a moment to look around. You've a quarter of an hour, Meave said as she dismounted. And not a moment more. The Queen sat in the shade of a large pear tree. She shut her eyes and listened to the chirping of crickets in the grass, savouring a rare moment of relaxation. But the calm did not last. Within moments, one of her scouts returned, a certain Sergeant Niedermere. Tears streamed down his weathered, scar-pocked face. A lady? Come with us, please. You'll need to see this for yourself. The sergeant led her to the still smoldering remains of a mill. Her soldiers were picking things out from the ashes. When she got closer, she realized in horror they were human skulls, some no larger than apples. Tell the villagers to gather by the well, the queen said in a strained voice. Or be executed. The elves and dwarves attempted no denials. They admitted Eldane and his Scoia'tael had helped them round up all the humans in their village, march them into the mill, then set it aflame. They stole our lands, defiled our names, beat us, murdered us in bloodthirsty pogroms, shouted one of the dwarves. They had it coming to them. Got their comeuppance, I'd say. Meave was no stranger to the cruelty of war, but the enormous evil she found in Eichenfurt overwhelmed her. She felt a terrible weight on her chest, found it hard to draw breath, and her head spun. She felt she could hear the cries of humans being burned alive. Ma'am, whispered Reynard, you must... You must pronounce something. Or simply turn the matter over to me, Your Grace. Rayla interrupted. I know what to do. You know what you deserve, Meave said. But my soldiers are neither murderers nor executioners, and you are not my subjects. So I shall have you escorted to Rosberg. Let the authorities there mete out justice. With a noose, I hope. 
the Queen chose a dozen soldiers and tasked them with seeing the non-humans of Eichenfurt tried by an Adernian judge. In doing so, she weakened her forces, but saved herself and her Lyrians from having to carry out a bloody sentence by their own hand. On the edge of the Moulderwood, there stood a small village, Crumhorn. The hamlet was surrounded by a high palisade, while the villagers carried makeshift weapons, flails, axes, and nail-studded planks. Life as the Scoyatel's neighbors was clearly not easy. While her men rested, Meave approached two of the villagers. They lowered their heads in respect and fidgeted nervously with their shirt hems. My lady, reckon you ought to know? Elves meeting traders in the woods at night. Buy swords, herbs. Rayla, who had overheard the conversation, twisted her mouth in a hateful scowl. Hawkers stink worse than vermin. Willing to help murderers for coin. Please, milady, we must find them and punish them. You, talk. Where do these meetings take place? The peasants looked at each other. One scratched his head, the other towed the sand. Finally, one of them blurted out, Could tell you, milady, yes, but uh, only for gold. I see I'm dealing with shrewd men of trade. Fine. Your fee. Meave took a few coins from her pouch and tossed them on the ground. The peasants dropped on all fours and started snatching the coins from the grass, ignoring the contemptuous gaze of the Queen's soldiers. Them orcas wheeled them goods to the old fishing hut north of here. Scoyatel come a-crawling from the woods, the first crow of the cockerel. The Queen told her men to prepare to fight the Scoyatel and their abettors. Black Rayler sat on a fallen trunk and sharpened her sword. The grinding of stone on blade sounded a grim promise. Meave arrived at the hut the villagers claimed to be the meeting point for the Scoyatel and the Hawkers. Torchlight flickered amidst the trees, and she heard the sound of hushed voices. Your Grace, whispered Rayla. They're in our grasp. We must act quickly if all the elves retreat into the woods. Worry not, Rayla, the Queen said, patting her on the back. I shan't let a chance like this slip. Attack! The Lyrians rushed out of the woods at the unsuspecting elves and merchants. Moments later, the sound of combat filled the dark wood. Hawker scum! There's but one penalty for trading with elves. Meave pulled off a rare trick. She laid a trap for the Scoyatel in their own woods. The surrounded elves fought to the bitter end, choosing death over human captivity. Meave cracked open the hawker's chests and stared at a mass of tangled oakum. Perplexed, she dug deeper and found the real goods hidden underneath. Bolts with entrail pureeing hooks, leg-snapping bear traps, and incurable poisons. Instruments of cruelty, said Reynard, looking over the chest's contents. Designed to deliver maximum pain and a prolonged death. Gascon did not share in the general gloom. He reached for one of the arrows and balanced it in his hand with curiosity. A corpse is a corpse. It cares not how it became one. And these marvels, oh, my lads could do fine things with them. The ends justify the means, Meave said curtly as she grabbed a weapon from one of the chests. Her soldiers followed suit and equipped themselves with hawker arms. Soon enough, the elves would feel the pain they'd hoped to inflict on others. Meave was discussing some matter with Gascon when a scout approached. His blood-streaked uniform revealed the matter to be urgent, so the Queen cut short her conversation and requested a report. We were scouting, milady, and we found a cave entrance. Small scattering of elves guarding it, but we took them right out. Hmm. Gascon scratched his chin. I'd wager ten Novigrad crowns there are more Scoyatel squirreled away inside. We strike afore they know we've snuffed out their guards, we might well catch them by surprise. But we must act quickly. Then let us act. Gather some men and prepare them for an attack, but keep quiet. 
The Lyrians crept into the cave. They moved carefully, noiselessly even, avoiding notice for quite a while. Nevertheless, elven warriors soon came pouring out of a side cavern. For Vort Tuan! They're not backing down. Must be something of value to them here. They resisted to the very end. When the Lyrians broke the elven ranks, Meave was convinced their foe would retreat and regroup. But to her surprise, the Scoia'tael fought to the bitter end. She concluded there must have been something truly valuable hidden in that cave. As Meave entered the next chamber, her nose caught the stink of blood, pus, and urine. Then she understood. The elves were using the cave as a field hospital. Wounded fighters lay by the cavern walls. They made no attempt to defend themselves, nor to beg, nor to make peace with the gods. They merely watched the Lyrians calmly, with stark contempt. Milady, whispered Rayla. You saw what the Scoia'tael are capable of. What they do to humans. They would have no mercy for... Raynard, usually calm, could not hold back and cut Rayla off. What, pray, do you suggest? That we murder the wounded? The warrior responded in a whisper, slowly emphasizing her words. I suggest you leave. Leave me and my men. We'll take care of the rest. Meave looked the warrior in the eyes and was terrified by what she saw. No, Rayla. We shall not touch them. Do you understand? Rayla was quiet for a long moment. Finally, she nodded and left the cave. Raynard followed her with his gaze, hand on hilt. Raynard, listen to me. You are to keep a close watch on Rayla until we are at least a day's ride from this cave. If she separates from the column, if she tries to double back, I wish to hear about it. Do you understand? Raynard nodded. Despite the day's victory, they left the cave in a somber mood. Have... have we not passed this way before? Scouts say no, Your Grace. They mark the trees. Elves could have erased the marks, or left new ones where we've yet to tread. Best to follow the sun. Only way not to lose your bearings. Meave was riding at the head of the caravan when Black Raylo rode up and leaned towards her. She spoke in a whisper, a hand shielding her mouth. Your Grace, I have something important to tell you. Yet you can't show anything to miss. Look straight ahead. Make no sudden moves. Meave nodded slightly and waited for her to continue. Scoia'tael scouts in the woods, watching us. Eldane's near here somewhere, preparing his attack. So what do you propose? Asked the Queen, her gaze fixed on the road ahead. Let him catch us out in the open. We're sitting ducks. But there are ruins nearby, an elven cemetery. We can find cover behind its walls. Meave was accustomed to discussing important decisions with all her advisors. But she knew there was no time for consultation now. She had to trust Black Rayla's advice, and so without further delay, issued the appropriate orders. Meave's retinue reached the cemetery before dusk. Her soldiers knocked down the marble statuary and piled them into barricades, while scouts took up positions outside the walls to watch for the foe's approach. When the sun set, the woods exhaled the heat of the day, and a thick fog soon arose. Out of the mist stepped Raynard's scouts, bound and pushed forward by elves. One of the Scoia'tael, a sturdy elf with long hair, stood by the cemetery wall and cried, I am Eldane. I would speak to Meave. I am she. Speak. Cadmil and Kedva Genved, Rena. This place is of great import to us, the Enshe. I would tell you of its monuments, of the weeping Ensevern, carved by three generations of sculptors or of the alabaster relief of King Kellad, so beautiful even the birds would gather to admire it. But I see your men have found our memorials, and in the way of Dwan, destroyed them without a second thought. I cannot say this comes as a surprise. You've already shown the gods molded you from the basest of matter. Get to the point, Eldane. So I shall. As you certainly know, the necropolis is surrounded. 
Soon there shall be a battle. But it is unseemly to fight in a cemetery. So I ask you to come out into the open. And surrender our tactical advantage. I suspected a matter so impractical as respecting the dead would mean nothing to you, Duan. So I submit one more argument. The lives of the soldiers you sent to spy. If you leave the cemetery, I shall set them free. They will fight at your side. If not, I shall kill them, here and now. Milady, don't listen to him. He can't be trusted. Rayla, those are good men. Fabian, get it, Matthias. They've served me for a decade. They'd crawl through seven hells for their queen. They do not deserve such a death. I accept your conditions. Your Grace, I beg you. Soldiers! We march into the field! Eldane clasped his hands in thanks. Then, in a swift, almost careless movement, slit the throat of the scout standing nearest to him. You should have listened to Rayla, Your Grace. We elves truly cannot be trusted. Sparla! I warned you, now we've lost the advantage. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Grace. I take full responsibility. Blega! Bina! After a long, bloody battle, Eldane's unit was destroyed, and Eldane himself sat at Meave's feet, defeated and dying. To die in a cemetery. Something amusing in it, wouldn't you say? I am surprised you are in the mood for humor. All my tears I shed years ago. My family killed in a massacre aimed at eradicating our race. Senseless. Utterly senseless. Reyna, we have lost. Me, my Scoia'tael, the Enche. We shall vanish from this earth. Your grandchildren will know us in fairy tales only. I know I deceived you, but lay my bones to rest in a grave. Let me part this world with dignity. Eger Dregared. Oh, please! How dare he! Look, he laughs, Your Grace! This dog should rot in an open field. Need I mention the willow? The men he strung from it? The men he burned alive? Mercy you don't deserve, Eldane. I shall leave you where you lie. Where rats will gnaw at your bones. <laughs> in your boots, I would do the same. Vasse derad, ep. Again. Meave gave the order to march that very night, not waiting for the day to break. She wished to leave behind as soon as possible the Moulderwood and the rotting elven remains littering Kedva Genved Cemetery. Black Rayler rode at the head of the caravan to the Queen's right, a satisfied smile playing on her lips. Oh, at last. I'd begun to think this wood had no end. And I thought bandits knew their way round a wood. We do. Around doors not brimming with elves armed at teeth. The burning fields and orchards spewed thick black smoke, turning day into darkest night. Riding in the middle of her caravan, Meave could see neither its head nor its rear. Raynard ordered the men to keep formation and march in silence. Eyes open, fore and aft. The foe might well use these conditions to spring a trap. When a scout's shrill horn cut through the silence, Meave immediately galloped to the front of the column. She found herself in a pile of red-hot coals that had once been peasants' huts. What the devil happened here? Bodies lay amid the ashes, barefoot men in nightshirts as if caught in their sleep. Meave deemed them yet more victims of the black-clad invaders, but Gascon had another interpretation. Look at the arrows. 
Imperial issue? Not hardly. Nor are they the type the Scoia'tael favor. And the tracks in the mud, the attackers fought not in formation, but man to man. Bandits. It must have been. Raynard, standing next to him, nodded in agreement. Gascon can be relied on here. After all, he knows of what he speaks. An uncomfortable silence fell over the group, ending only when Meave ordered the scouts to determine the direction of the bandits' tracks. They returned to report the killers were hiding somewhere to the north. The scouts reported the bandits who attacked the village that night now occupied a fort the Adernians had hastily abandoned during their retreat. They left crossbows, arbalists, ballistae. The bandits are armed to the teeth. What's more, according to the local folk, they had a witch among them. In light of these reports, Meave's advisors debated whether it was worth risking a fight with the brigands. Let's call it as it is, Gascon said. The game's not worth the candle. Game? Rayla said, struggling to swallow her anger. They slaughtered an entire village. We cannot let them get away. The stage seemed set for a long debate, when Meave pounded her fist on the table. I am a queen, for God's sakes. I shall not cower before common rogues, even if the entire conclave of mages stands with them. Reynard, have the men prepare their arms. Reynard saluted and left the tent. If one had seen him then, he would have sworn the grizzled soldier smiled to himself, beaming with pride in his ruler. Did you hear that? A kind of incantation? Something's not right. They should be dead with those wounds. We must find a gap in the fortifications. The fort is ours, Your Grace. They battled long and hard to take the fort. Meave could have sworn she saw bandits stalking its ramparts. Bandits who moments before had taken a bolt to the head. By all rights, a mortal wound. What the devil is going on here? She swore as she took cover behind her shield. The secret was unraveled only after the battle's conclusion. Meave's soldiers dragged before her a grey-haired woman in coloured robes. The aura radiating from her left no doubt. They had fought a sorceress. It was her healing spells that enabled the bandits to hold off their attack for so long. What is your name, sorceress? Ishbel of Tretagor. I take it you did not keep company with bandits willingly? Not at all. They kidnapped me and forced me to aid them. Forced? I do not understand. As a woman fluent in the arcana of magic, you could have freed yourself with little effort. True, I could have. But I would have had to kill, and I swore never to use my talents to harm another. Not even in self-defense? Not even then. Then you live in truly unfortunate times. War rages all around. You cannot hide from it. So be it. Then I must entrust myself to the care of the gods. Or a passing queen. You stand before Meave, by divine right ruler of Lyria and Rivia. We seek the lord of these lands, Demavend. Oh, forgive me for not recognizing you, your grace. You do not look like a ruler, more like a mercenary. Nor do you look like a sorceress. True, my lady. Forgive me. I meant no offense. I accept your apology and would gladly welcome you into our ranks. Truth be told, a skilled worker of magic would prove most useful to us. Thank you, my lady. But you must know, an army is no place for me. Should you wish it not, you needn't fight. We have many civilians among our ranks who... Who do their part in the slaughter. Indirect guilt is enough. My soldiers do not slaughter. They fight. Lofty words, but the result is the same. Piles of corpses. Well, a bandit I am not. I shall not force you. Reynard, prepare the men to march on. Of course, but if I may, perhaps Xavier might have a look at the war machines we captured. 
He may find some parts of use. Me followed Reynard's suggestion. Xavier went to work. Yes, Your Grace. God, what happened to him? He was in Rosberg when the stronghold fell. Nearly burned alive. How... how are you healing him? The medics recommended regular poultices of dog's tallow, but whether they've any effect... Of course they've no effect. For such wounds. How he must suffer. In the day he reveals nothing. But at night one awakes to hear him sob with pain. You see? I need healers. I shall go with you. But never shall I use magic to take a life. Do I make myself clear? Yes, you have put it quite plain, and rather bluntly. Forgive me, Your Grace. It has been long since I played the host. I forget the custom. Your spells mean more to me than your manners. Welcome to our ranks, Isbel. Isbel sat in one of their wagons and shut her tired eyes. Her long grey hair seemed to flutter ever so slightly, though there was neither wind nor breeze. Mom, it's good you're here. We ought to speak. Yes? Concerning what? I've spent time with your troops, dressing their wounds, treating them. They respect you greatly, would follow you into any fire, any flood. Happy to hear it. They're good folk, one and all. Yes, precisely. In fact, too good to die in a senseless war. Not certain I understand. The Imperial Army's enormous. Just how enormous we know, both. Had you all the Norse kings at your side, victory would still be unsure. Yet you fight alone. No well you cannot rely on them. Agreed. Nilfgaard's far better equipped and greatly outnumbers us. Yet, though try, they cannot be everywhere at once. They've stretched their forces thin, too thin. An error I aim to exploit. You may be right. I hope you are. The lives of those you lead depend on it. Hmm. You're proud, persistent, and sure of yourself. Just as I was at your age. It may work in your favor. Only time can tell. Meanwhile, how might I help? You're no village witch, no healer. That much is clear. But nor do you look like our northern sorceresses. Hmm. I use no glamour, true. I've come to feel a body must age, and honestly so, as nature intended, as is the order of things. You sound much like a druid driveling on about balance, harmony, the good that is rot. Rather poor, their reputation, druids. Yet they're in the right in this regard, I believe. Defy nature's laws, and nothing good can come of it. Is that also why you wear no shoes? Ah, no. I simply like to feel the grass between my toes, the sand, the mud. You must try it sometime. Hmm. I shall think on it. Thank you, Isabel. Duty calls. I must go. Of course. Should you need me, I'll be here. Meave shook her head in disbelief as she surveyed the landscape before her. The Nilfgaardians had destroyed everything in their path. Burned farms, trampled fields, leveled orchards. The bastards! She hissed. They mean to cause a famine. When the Lyrians reached Braithwaite, a small village near Aldersburg, they saw gaunt men and women, more bone than flesh, gnawing on acorns and boot leather. The invaders had requisitioned every scrap of the village's food stores and hauled it off to their nearby camp. In strained voices, the villagers begged the queen to help them retrieve their supplies. Milady, 
Frost'll come before we know it. Felt help us. Why not a soul will live to see the Thor? Meave looked around at the blackened, scorched village, at the walking skeletons who dwelled in it. The suffocating smoke bellowing up from the fields sent tears streaming down her face. I'll do what I can, was all she said. She knew this was not the time for a rousing speech. She needed to act. The Lyrians reached the outer defenses of the camp where the Nilfgaardians had taken Braithwaite's food stores. Rayla delivered her report. Three heavy infantry regiments, Nazari arbalists, the warrior said. And I heard neighing, so they've cavalry as well. Meave said nothing, working it over in her head. The fate of the starving villagers weighed on her heart, but was it worth risking heavy losses to aid them? The Nilfgaardians keep food in storage and watch it rot while peasants perish from hunger. Will we allow this? The Queen said, addressing her soldiers. <laughs> Cried the soldiers. I didn't think so. Neve said with a smile as she drew her weapon. Lyrians, attack! Today our swords shall taste imperial blood. Your Grace, the battle's won. We've secured the storehouses. Neve managed to rout the Nilfgaardian troops and regain the stolen supplies. However, the Queen's good humor faded soon after the battle. Her soldiers began loudly demanding she not return to the village, but keep the food for her troops. We've nigh empty bellies too, my lady. And whatever we give them, the black-clad bastards will just steal right back. Better to strengthen our own army than the enemy's. Easy it would have been to take offense at the soldier's words, to accuse him of greed. But his words held much merit. Meave's army had no less need for the food than the peasants, and in war-ravaged Edern there were few chances to replenish their supplies. After a moment's hesitation, the queen announced her decision. We shall divide the food. Half we return to the peasants, half we keep for ourselves. At first, the peasants were glad to see the soldiers, but their joy quickly turned to anger when they found Meave had decided to return only half the recovered supplies. And for a queen to stoop so low, so low, robbing good folk, starving good folk. Ugh. Meave refused to argue with the villagers. Yes, justice was on their side, but in times of war, justice counts for little. A thief who takes half your coin is just as much a thief as one who takes it all. Remember these words well. Meave's mount reared and flattened its ears, spooked for no visible cause. Trusting in animal instinct, Meave jumped to the ground and felt tremors under her boots. At first they were faint, barely palpable, then grew stronger and stronger. What's going on? Meave cried. Why does the earth tremble? Before anyone could respond, a scout from the forward guard let out a terrified cry. A moment later, snap trees crashed down around them, and out of the woods came a 30-foot-tall stone giant. Gods, whispered the queen. What is that? A golem, Isbel whispered back. Favorite servant of Nilfgaardian mages. As if to confirm his words, soldiers marched out from behind the giant, clad in heavy black plate. Their leader, however, wore but a light tunic, and his hands glowed with a strange blue light. Dithen Quan Illyrian! He shouted, giving the order to attack. Gloir and Ard Feyin! My powers are you. Adart! Mom, break the mage's spell and the golem's power will wane to naught. Your Grace, it worked! Raising her shield against the whistling rain of arrows, Meave fought her way towards the Nilfgaardian mage leading the attack. At close quarters, magic arcana would stand no chance against a well-swung blade. Yeah! 
Mead roared, delivering a powerful blow. Her blade severed the mage's aorta, and drowning in his own blood, he fell to the ground. He choked out by way of last words. Then the blue aura coming from his hands flickered out, and the stone giant thundered to the ground in pieces. When the dust of the battle had settled, the queen ordered her men to search the Nilfgaardian camp. In the mage's tent, they found a rare instrument used to communicate at a distance, a megascope. The crystals encrusted in its brass frame were still warm, meaning it had recently been used to conduct a conversation. The burning question was, with whom? Isbel! yelled the queen. The mage dutifully came closer. This device, could you activate it? Yes, your grace. But are you sure? I am. Get to work. Isbel nodded, then began calibrating the magic device. Finally, something clicked. A light flickered on, and before Meave's eyes appeared the outline of a Nilfgaardian general. <sighs> Speak common, please. I know not your tongue. Oh. Forgive me, I thought I spoke to someone else. Good to see you in good health, Queen. Or ex-Queen, I suppose, would be the more apt title. Instead of fretting so much over my title, give yours. Of course. Where are my manners? Duke Adel Ebdahi, Grand Chancellor, Commander of Army Group East. I believe you've heard of me. No. This is the first time I hear the name Ardle. Ardle what? <laughs> I see you've a poor mind for names. Perhaps you should ask your son. He knows me very well. You Horson. <laughs> oh, what was I thinking? You're not on good terms, are you? Such a sad story. But don't worry, it'll soon be over. Is that a threat? <laughs> no. A simple prediction. Enough of this. Why use this megascope? What is it you want? I wanted to see the man who's butchering Edern. The man responsible for the deaths of thousands of women, elders and children. Then your desire has been satisfied. It was I who gave the order to cleanse this land of unwanted elements. To prepare it for settlement. For... Unwanted elements? Those are living folk you speak of. If you were to look at this war in historical perspective, considering the wider geopolitical context... <laughs> forget it. It's impossible for you to grasp. Farewell, Your Majesty. Or rather, till next time. For there will be a next time, I assure you. A quiet fell over the tent. The queen stepped outside, squinted her eyes against the glare of the burning fields, and swore to herself that when she did see Grand Chancellor Adel Epdahi again, he would be a whole head shorter. Coming across a small brook, Meave ordered her soldiers to replenish their water supplies. When they returned, it was with empty water skins and troubled expressions. Milady, the water tastes of blood. Uh, not like black pudding, mind, but uh, rancid, uh, filthy. Meave had no choice but to march on. She gulped dryly and wondered how to interpret this strange event. An omen, perhaps? A warning from the gods? She soon learned the truth. Following the brook upstream, the Lyrians arrived at a small pool. Bobbing on its surface were dozens of corpses. A young woman caught Meave's gaze, her long hair spread delicately atop the water, 
wide open eyes reflecting the sky, a fine nose peppered with freckles, and a gaping wound slashed across her throat. We shall stop here, the queen said calmly, and give these souls a proper burial. Reynard sends scouts. Tell them they are not to return until they ascertain what has happened here. When the scouts returned a while later, they brought with them a barefooted peasant they'd found hiding in the woods. They claimed he hailed from Horton, a nearby village, the village whose inhabitants had been murdered. Then black-clad wretches stormed the village, my lady. The devil free gave at the fall. Rounded us right up, took us down to the lake. Whole village, mind. Then chop, chop, and splosh, splosh. It was I alone gave him the slip. Meave listened to the man's tale, then placed him in the care of her medics and ordered the Lyrians to break camp. She rode at the head of their column, Reynard at her side, her knuckles gripped white on the reins. Do we know where this Frigef is stationed? Our riders report he's pitched camp to the east. Then let's pay him a call. They killed all, like Rosberg. My lady, please, make them pay. Milka, Bezrad... Kristan, all killed, souls snuffed out to the very last. The Lyrians had no trouble finding Vrigov's camp. It was the size of a sprawling town. Meave stopped her caravan and called for a council. The first to speak was Reynard. Seems our scouts were both right and wrong, Your Grace. They did pinpoint General Frigef, the butcher of Horton. Unfortunately, they underestimated his detachment. It is much larger and better armed than our own. That changes nothing, Meave said, forestalling all protest. If I leave him unpunished, without so much as an attempt, I shall never be able to face my reflection again. We must attack. Reynard bowed and passed the order to the Lyrians. Later that same day, Meave and Vrigov's forces stood face to face on the field of battle. Come out, Frigef! It's time you pay for your crimes! You are dogs! There! Frigga! I see him! We've got to catch him! The Lyrians won the day, despite their foe's distinct advantage. Historians later ascribed Meave's victory to her light troop's superior manoeuvrability in the difficult terrain compared to the plate-clad Nilfgaardians. But if you ask me, that wasn't it at all. A storm of fury had been quietly gathering in the Lyrians' hearts. A squall of rage stoked by the Nilfgaardians' unparalleled cruelty towards the conquered. And no one embodied this barbarism more perfectly than General Frigif. Meave's men were ready to sacrifice anything to see him punished. They dragged the defeated general before Meave. The Queen wished to learn why he'd ordered the execution of an entire village how the Nilfgaardians could possibly justify such a crime. Two weeks prior, I'd sent a detachment to Horton to procure feed. Captain Gaynor commanded it. While he was verifying their grain stores, they barricaded him in the barn and put it to flame. The Queen listened to the General's story, her face a mask, betraying nothing. Murdered. One man was murdered. Frigif raised his eyes to Meave's. The Queen was surprised to see them wet with tears. Yes, my lady. My son. The General's simple words bore pain, grief, and a thirst for revenge that would never be slaked. The Queen had to decide what to do with Frigif. No doubt the General had earned punishment, the harshest possible at that. Yet... Such a weighty personage could fetch a hefty ransom, and Meave's army desperately needed the gold. In the end, the Queen decided to return the General for a golden ransom. Whether she chose the path out of mercy, moved by the Nilfgaardians' tears, or out of pure material calculation, Sensing an excellent chance to replenish her war chest, it is hard to say. One thing is certain. Her men were crestfallen at the news. They had challenged Frigif's greatly superior forces in the name of justice. 
not gold. Meave's Lyrians were traversing a wood when they heard the loud, drawn-out blast of a horn. One of our scouts? The Queen asked, clearly perplexed. She turned in her saddle to face Reynard, who shook his head. Strange. Gascon, appoint a few of your strays, ones who know how to blend in. Have them sniff out who blows that horn, and why. The scouts returned a short while later with their report. Soldiers had pitched camp in a nearby meadow. They wore Adernian uniforms, cut by sashes bearing a golden sun. They addressed their leader as Fulberson. Know the name, Rayla said. Fulberson went over to the enemy first day of the war, took his whole division with him. Your grace, a chance like this won't come again. Let's teach the traitors a lesson. We must send a strong signal, when all the North will hear. From the Yoruga to the Dragon Mountains, announced the Queen. Whoever collaborates with the invader shall pay with his head. Prepare to attack. Rayla nodded, clearly pleased. The Lyrians surrounded the meadow marked by their scouts. Moments later, a flaming arrow pierced the sky, giving the signal to attack. Is that Queen Meave? Two arms! Hundred and one, hundred and two, hundred and three. This man has suffered much. Mercy, your grace. We surrender. The traitors, perhaps used to fighting unsuspecting foes, stood no chance against the determined Lyrian attack. At its conclusion, Meave personally knocked Fulberson off his mount, then tore off his visor. The face she saw evoked more sympathy than hatred. Fulberson was an old, sickly man, his skin pale and blemished. With great difficulty, he pulled himself up on his knees, then extended a shaky hand in pleading. Your Grace, have mercy. The Nilfgaardians forced me to treason. They threatened torture. Me felt her soldiers' eyes on her. They awaited her decision. How would she treat this traitor? Would she really execute him as a warning to others? I hereby dissolve your division, Falberson. And you, surrender your sword and be on your way. The traitor threw himself at the Queen's feet. You've shown mercy befitting a truly great ruler, your grace. A thousand thanks. To the south of here lie my lands. Visit me. I shall throw a sumptuous feast in your honor and provide a generous donation to your fight against our common foe. Meave ordered Fulberson to stand. Her Lyrians reluctantly stepped out of the departing traitor's way. When he passed Black Rayla, she spat at his feet. Meave and her Lyrians arrived at Fulberson's lands, home of the traitor she had let live. He greeted the queen with full honors. In ceremonial garb, a platter of bread and salt held aloft. Your grace, tis an honor to welcome you to my humble abode. Please, come inside. A fattened piglet already turns on the spit. Soon, I shall fetch my best wines from the cellar. Meave, having lived on nothing but salt pork and gruel for weeks, was tempted to accept the offer. Black Rayla, however, was strongly against it. Ma'am, forgive my insolence, but to eat from a traitor's table is foolish. Don't do it. Heeding Rayla's plea, the Queen declined Fulberson's invitation. Clearly saddened, he escorted the Queen to the bounds of his estate. I thank you once more, Your Grace, he said, bending to kiss her hand. And I swear from now on, I shall support the North as best I can. Meave nodded, then went on her way. She wondered whether the old man would keep his word, or, as soon as the Lyrians disappeared over the horizon, once again don an imperial crested sash. It is a great pity your grace hasn't time to feast with us. As Meave passed the city of Harmelin, 
one of the peasants she'd saved from Nilfgaardian captivity requested an audience. Be taking leave of you here, milady. Folk from our parts lives in Armelin. We'll manage. But, milady, we, uh, we thank you for taking pity on us time and again. We've nothing, milady, or near's enough. Black-clad bastards took all's worth taking. Except in this. Amulet. Been in my family for ages. Kept us from harm. May it do the same for you. Meave wanted to say she did not believe in peasant superstitions. But when she took the ivory pendant in hand, she felt a curious warmth from it. The peasant bowed, then joined the others as they trod off towards Harmelin. The Lyrians stood within five miles of Aldersburg, when the road, which until now they had travelled alone, suddenly filled with all manner of folk. Peasants, merchants and wounded fighters in tattered uniforms. They trod solemnly in the opposite direction, their worldly possessions on their backs. Oldesburg's fallen, my lady, sighed one of the refugees with a forlorn shrug. Outer walls breached. King still defends the old town, but black-clad goats are winning. You'd best turn back before it's too late. We've nowhere to turn to, good man, the queen said, then spurred on her horse. Follow me! The queen galloped so fast the wind squeezed tears from her eyes, the Lyrian cavalry close at her heels. Hoofbeats thundered down the high road, and the crowd of refugees parted, making a path for the charging riders. Faster! Faster! Soon they set eye on Aldersburg. A red glow filled the horizon, the wind carried screams and the clanking of steel. The once proud city was quickly turning to dust in the Nilfgaardian sun. The Nilfgaardian force moved to block the Lyrians' way. Without slowing, Meave cut down the infantryman who tried to drag her from her saddle with a hook. Her head in a winged helmet fell to the ground, leaving a bloody track. Lyrians! Attack! Meave shouted. Take no prisoners! Bloody hell! You shan't stop me. Not now! Your Grace, that... all that was but their rear guard. The Lyrians managed to scatter the Nilfgaardian battalion, one of many besieging Aldersburg. Their scouts brought before the Queen a prisoner freed from the invaders. Meave inquired about the situation in the city. Turn the right slaughterhouse in us. The Imperials, they... King had the city cleared, my lady, but didn't budge himself. Holding out with his guard in Old Town, walls still standing there. Said he'd fight to the end. Come with me. Meave weighed her options. The situation looked dire. Demovend, to whom she had come for help, needed help himself. Nilfgaard enjoyed an overwhelming advantage. The small Lyrian detachment stood no chance of breaking the siege. But to retreat, surrender, that was not something Meave did. The Nilfgaardians do not expect a relief force. Hmm. Rayla. You know Aldersburg. Can you lead us by side streets to the Old Town, that we may avoid the largest part of the Nilfgaardian army? The warrior nodded, and without waiting for any further orders, strode out in front of the party. Reynard followed her with his gaze, clearly troubled. And... and what then, Your Majesty? We burst into the lion's den and... And we pray the lion chokes. Follow me! Your mother was a hamster, and your father smelled of elderberries! Gods have mercy. And demons take it all! Taking advantage of the confusion, Meave maneuvered her troops to the very walls of the Old Town. Spying Lyrian banners, the defenders suspected a trap. But when they noticed Black Railer among them, they immediately lowered the drawbridge. The old town was a maze of brothels and shady taverns. In normal times, students and other pleasure seekers prowled its dark alleys. Now, tired soldiers slumped in every corner, though the Lyrians' arrival clearly buoyed their spirits. 
the Fraternal Realm's warriors clasped each other's hands and swapped tales. Even Eden's King Demoven made no secret of his pleasure at seeing these unexpected arrivals. Me! Of all the besieged cities in all the world, you walk into mine. Come to the rescue, have you? To be quite frank, I've come to be rescued. Oh, yes. I've heard much of the events in Lyria. Disgraceful! Such betrayal! However, as you might have noticed, things are none too rosy here, either. Yes. That is hard to miss. I thought we'd trade blows with the Blackclads. That it would be an even match. Two weeks. That sufficed to annihilate the army I'd spent my whole lifetime building. Your Majesty, I cannot say what fate will bring, if we shall reach this war's end alive. But I wish to say now that I admire you. Oh? You evacuated the city, yet refused to evacuate yourself. You fight to the bitter end, like a hero. But of course, a king must lead by example after all. Especially in war. Reynard, that rumbling, you hear it? Studied boots on cobblestones. The Nilf Guardians. Prepare the men for battle. Yes, Your Grace. So, now that we're alone, what's really going on? What? Did you not hear? I'm defending my capital, like a hero. Demovend, please, don't feed me that drivel. We've known each other far too long. Why did you stay? Ah, Meave. As meddling as you are beautiful. See that building? That one there? The... brothel? The crimson bodice? Precisely. So, but promise not to laugh. I'm a patron. A loyal one, in fact. One of the girls there, Demaretta. Uh, oh, she's marvelous. Makes me feel young again. A young fool, you mean. Demoven, there's a war on, and... Allow me to finish. Demaretta became, well, with child. Exactly nine months ago. Understand now? She's entered confinement, having contractions. Since yesterday. You see, I cannot leave her like this. Can't have her moved. I must stay put until she gives birth. And then what? Pray tell. Invite all of Nilfgaard to the christening? No, my dear. There is a hidden tunnel deep beneath the city, leading far beyond its walls. Once the midwives cut the cord, we flee. Demovend, you risk the lives of thousands of men for a single child. For a bastard to boot. Meave, I would kill thousands of men for my child. Born in wedlock or out, it changes nothing. It changes everything. One way the babe inherits the throne, the other... Ah, oh, you argue succession while I speak of a father's love. But I shouldn't expect you to understand. Your heart, ice through and through, always has been. No wonder, villain. Your Majesties, the Nilfgaardians are attacking. Meave, we must hold out. A few hours, that's all. I'll do what I can. Defend the King! We must stop them! Hmm. Uh. Meave! They're getting close! Devils take all! Help me! Uh. Uh. Meave! We must hold on a bit longer! No! Let's chase! Ha ha ha! It worked! Now, retreat to the tunnel! With their forces combined, the rulers managed to hold the old town long enough for Demoretta to bear the king's offspring, a healthy, hardy boy. 
when the midwife slapped the infant, his scream carried above the roar of battle. Soon afterwards, the defenders abandoned the walls and left the city through a secret tunnel. The Nilfgaardians, furious that not one but two northern sovereigns were among the escapees, raised Aldersburg to the ground. Thank you. If not for you, the devils would have devoured us. I should say it was nothing. But the truth is, I need your aid. Aid? But you see, my army is no more. I must pull back, regroup. Pull back? Where to? The golden sun flies over your entire realm. To Redania, to take shelter at the court there. And then? Will you sit and watch the fool juggle apples as Nilfgaard parcels all Eden out to its settlers? Meave, one must know when to fold and when to double down. Nilfgaard has stretched the front. Winter will soon be here. Let the costs claw away at them. A year, two, then we strike. And we shall prove the Empire is a colossus with feet of clay. You're a coward, Demavend. A common coward. Perhaps so. But mind, courage alone wins no wars. Soldiers do. A Nilfgaard simply has many more. I can't live like that. So what shall you do instead? Fight on. Until I win, or the black-clad curs tear me apart. Gods, such pity I have for your husband. The poor man must have had a rough go of it. He seemed content with his life while it lasted. Yet I'm serious, Demavend, in my request. You truly won't aid me. Provide nothing at all. I will tell my men whoever so wishes can join your party and fight on. But please, curb your excitement. They are tired. Few will choose the path of greater resistance. But, but, but... Are you familiar with the saying, When at wit's end, a dwarf's your friend? Yes, it and many others. Yet as much as I appreciate folk wisdom, I prefer facts to philosophy at the moment. Preferably facts relevant to my situation. How about this? Mahakam is but a week's ride from here. And there you'll find thousands of dwarves armed to the teeth. Enough to turn the tides of this war, I venture. Yes, they could. If not for another fact. That the dwarves have always been famously indifferent to strife between humans. They'll never come to my aid. <laughs> I doubt they'll even let me into their land. Unless you show them this. The leaden ring. A token of amity given to me by the Elder-in-Chief. That's not to say they'll welcome you with open arms. But they will hear you out. And that is something. Hmm. Dwarven infantry I'd make good use of. I shall do as you say. Or at least try. Good. And to ease your journey somewhat, I'll give you as your guide the best man, or rather woman, for the task. Rela! Yes, Your Grace? You've been to Mahakam with me many times. You know their paths. Take Queen Meave and her party there. If it be your wish, my king, I shall obey. I'll send messages ahead that the dwarfs may expect your arrival. Until then... Good luck, Meave. And may we one day waltz upon the grave of our foe, Emperor Emir. May it be so. Just as long as I get to lead. Ah, of course. Farewell, Queen. Meave left Aldersburg in ill spirits. Rather than provide the help she had hoped for, Demavend had merely sent her on to Mahakam. Her way west was lit first by the glow of a burning city, then by the smoldering remains of charred villages by the roadside. It was clear the war against Nilfgaard had taken a bitter turn. Each stranger was now treated as an enemy, and the customarily hospitable Adernians slammed their doors at anyone's approach. The party's morale was somber as well, and did not even improve with the first sight of mountains looming in the distance. Wandering among the ashes, 
Meave entered the dwarves' domain. Along perilously steep paths, Black Rayler led the Queen and company towards Mahakam, the dwarven homeland. There, among snow-capped peaks, someone awaited. Rayla, you've brought strangers. Gabor, I present to you Meave, Queen of Lyria and Rivia. Ah, a queen! Crivens! Well then! We... A large shadow swept across the sky. The dwarf swallowed the rest of his greeting as all raised their gazes to see a dragon soar swiftly toward Mount Carbon. Keltilus, don't be afeard. He is near threat to us. The dwarf had broken the silence gently, he himself quite familiar with this altogether unusual sight. And now, sit yourselves down afore the pottage grows cold. I... oh... but... flu... Drake? Stone shriveling marvel, innit? Makes you almost sad the lizards are dying out. Should you not worry more about the fate of your brethren? That creature will soon have all Mahakam aflame. Ha! Keltilus? No! He's lived here centuries! Harmless for the most part. Now, your grace, a taste. No, none. Though your offer of repast I value, good sir. Oh, oh, no need of that. Gabor, please. Enchanted to make your acquaintance. Gabor here is a true local notable, from one of Mahakam's leading clans, the Zigrins. But then he wouldn't be our guide if he wasn't. A guide for all important guests. A pleasure. And as I said, I thank you for your hospitality, but I've no time to feast now. I must speak to your ruler at once. Hmm. Don't mean no offence, but Elder and Chief Bruverhoog's a recluse of sorts, as humans go. Didn't even meet the ones that wear crowns. But I suppose I could, meaning if you drafted a letter... Her Majesty's got Demoven's signet. Given willingly. Ah. Well, that's a sheep of a different sort. We didn't let many human folk into Mahakam, and for good reason. So those who we let come through the second gate get blindfolded. Just after they've surrendered their arms at the first. But you've the leaden ring. Given one of your kind to confirm trust and amity. So, we're certain we can treat you as one of our own. Elder and Chief's in the pass visiting. Looking to his flock. Come on. No reason you two shouldn't jabber right quick. Though the Lyrian infantry rose half an ell taller than the dwarf, he moved with remarkable ease through the waist high snow, while those behind him slipped and stumbled on the ice slick rocks. Neve and Rayla trailed the party so they might speak in private. Non-humans you despised immensely, I believed. They don't bother me a bit. Long as they stay in their lands, seek fortune nowhere else. I detest only those who infest our cities, humbly insist on belonging to our guilds, holding office in our institutions, armies. Yet some find a place for themselves, blending marvellously. It's never lasting. They're different, odd. Strain's inevitable. And then they'll always stab a human in the back. The ring. However did Demavend come to possess it? Eldrin Chief himself gave it to him. Years ago. A decade. Perhaps more. Why? Oh, you must have heard the tale, Your Grace. You see, formerly, Faltus of Temeria's sovereign of Mahakam, he believed it was his right to tax any Leand lands, so he sent collectors. Well, the dwarves felt stripped, so they stripped the collectors down to their natural state. Put them in beer barrels, they then rolled down the mountainside. Ah, oh, my. That incited Faltus ire, I'm sure. Indeed, Ember Hot Ire. A punitive expedition was assembled immediately. We're about to set off when Demoven managed to dissuade Faltus. Elder in Chief gave him the ring in thanks. I see it all now. Prevented Mahakam's slaughter, Demoven did. Your Majesty, 
Demoven prevented a slaughter, true. But faultists in the Temerians, not the dwarves. Mahakaman fortifications. Well, you'll soon see. No human will take them, ever. The Elder's gratitude, then? Not certain I know where it came from. Had the dwarves crushed the Temerians? No, when they had done so, what would have happened? Why, retaliation against all non-humans in Temeria. Bruva knew this, so in fact, Demoven saved them. Exceptionally provident, the Elder-in-Chief. And shrewd as a swarm of snakes. So when you speak, beware his hiss and weigh your every word. Rayla, your aid proved an unexpected bounty. I received orders. I fulfilled them to their end. My, I see. And what will you do now? Our paths diverge, not more. I return home now, where new orders surely await. Demovent has fled to the Redanian court, where he shall cower and not show his mug until spring has sprung. You know this. Would you not prefer to remain in my ranks? Fight the Black Ones bound at the hip? No, Your Grace. You have no love for me, do you? We are not of the same stock, Your Grace, so it's hardly my place to... Stock and place be ploughed. We must speak from our hearts. Two women. No enmity. Tell me why. I did something, something you could not abide. It was what you did not do, rather. In Edurn, you are far too lenient on those elves. As you are ever, prepared to forgive, extend clemency. What would you have me do? Let you cleanse, rid the wood of all non-humans? Wickedness demands wickedness. Blood calls for blood. Very well, Rayla. Then go and drink of it if you must. Lips pursed, eyes locked, Meave and Rayla took each other's measure a last time. The warrior then bowed in a manner some might think excessively courtly, turned on her heel and rode off down a slope. Meave gazed after her until she disappeared behind a snowbank, then gave her mount a solid dose of her heels and rode on, irked as a hare in a briar patch. Yes, my lady? You choose not to follow your king, Xavier. Why? To fight in the field, with you. This was my wish, my lady. But what of your home? Rosberg must be rebuilt. Engineers are needed. I have no kin in Rosberg. No soul left for me there. All I've left is revenge. I understand. Other matters await my attention. We shall speak later. As you wish, my lady. How go things, Reynard? You and Gascon get along now, I hope. Well, you might say we've established a certain rapport, Your Grace. Tell me more, friend. I don't pry into his affairs, nor he into mine. I'd prefer it if my commanders worked together more closely. Your Grace, the man's a brigand. Oh, Reynard, he was a brigand. I must disagree, I fear. Yes, he stopped thieving for now, but only because it's convenient, so to speak. Gascon isn't a changed man. He still hasn't an ounce of honor, dignity. Yet he has a unit of armed men, without which we'd be much worse off. Might not even have survived. Agreed. The Strays are excellent fighters. I'd be the first to admit it. I only fear they might turn on us. Leap at our throats when we least expect it. It's time I attended to other matters. Hey-ho! How's my favorite queen in the north? You and Reynard, do you get along? Like a cat and a hound. <laughs> Get it? Because they call me. Yes, yes, your jests are easily understood. Far more difficult to enjoy. That's probably true, in your royal high and mightiness's case. Will you answer my question? <sighs> we get along because we must. Though it'd be far easier if he pulled the lance from his arse. Haven't heard a truer word in a long while. <laughs> what was that? Nothing. Nothing. It's time I attended to other matters. Farewell. 
Isabel? Apologies. Thoughts consume me sometimes. Is there something you need? Since we left Edurn, you've seemed unsettled. Is all in order? I've seen many wars in my time. All ugly, all repulsive. But what the Imperials did at Aldersburg was... It was unforgivable. Nilfgaard. That's what it does, Isbel. They seek here to repeat the rape of Sintra, the slaughter there. Yes, I saw that. I was there. And at Sodden. Then you know of what they're capable. After Sodden, I took an oath never to take part in another war. Such suffering, such hatred, senseless, all those deaths. Senseless deaths? Our troops sacrificed their lives in defense of their homeland, loved ones. I believe, I must believe there's a better way. Forgive me, Mum. I must gather my thoughts. Never mind about me, though. I shall perform my duties to my utmost, as ever, as always. You speak with my soldiers a good deal. Said so yourself. I'd like to know what about. Hmm. Corporal Larkin, ma'am. Do you know him? Captain Oisin, perhaps? Or Lieutenant Teagan? Of course I know them. Among my best, they've served me loyally for years. You know them? But did you know that in fleeing Lyria, the Corporal left behind a newborn daughter? His wife was in confinement when you gave the order to march. The corporal could not go to see them. And true, the captain has no wife, no child. But he's not seen his brother in five years. Never once been granted leave. Your General Odo's orders always taking precedence. Allow me to guess. You shall now tell me Tegan abandoned his sick mother to follow me. No, ma'am. Count Caldwell's men murdered the lieutenant's kin. Retaliation for his joining your rebellion. He learned of this just recently. Enough. You've made your point. Yet even were I to order them to return, they wouldn't listen. They know they've got nothing to go home to while Nilfgaard occupies our land. Duty calls. I must go. Of course. Should you need me, I'll be here. Your Grace, I need to speak with your quartermaster. Hey, excuse my elvish, but I can't drink that goat's piss he serves in the mess. Ugh, Reynard's doing no doubt. He doesn't like the men to drink too much. To be blunt, ma'am, what Reynard himself needs is to get good and bluttered for once in his stiff life. So, I have a proposal for you. A shipment of the best dwarven mead and lager. I can arrange for you to arrive. Trust me. The men's morales nae like to be a problem when they pour a bit of fire in their guts. Hmm. Good point. Very well. Oh, give my thanks, dear Queen. A few more days of that and I'd have been lapping up puddle water. I trust you'll arrange the details. Uh, of course. No worries. You didn't ken how happy a dwarf you've made me. Ah, right. And the men, too, of course. You're a Zigrin, are you not? I know the name. One of your clan slew the dragon Ockvist. Aye. You're thinking of Yarpen. Cousin of my cousin. Left my hackam when I was but a wee snot. Decent enough dwarf, but never could conform to our basic tenets and laws. Though, admittedly, we've so damned many it's hard to keep them from leaking out your ears. Is it that bad? Hmm. I'll put it this way. Among human folk, you can't steal, brawl, murder. All the basics. In Mahakam, we've got laws about how to braid our beards. But I'm no one to complain. The Zilgrins are well-to-do, one of the richer clans. Got more than enough goods to suit our needs. Though, we've got some bads as well. What do you mean? Bah! Nay worth your time. I didn't mean to bother you. Sides, 
Best to jabber of such things over a cold pint? Or keg? Your elder. I'd like to know more. Do tell me about him, please. Hmm. The one tough horsen, Ruva. Stubborn as an old goat, as you'll soon see for yourself. All in all, though, he's near as scary as some say. Been keeping the clans in check for some two centuries now. Which is near a small feat, I might add, no. No conflicts between them all this time. Are you certain? Ha! <laughs> ha! I, I can't tell if you're jesting. <laughs> At each other's throats each day they are. Breckenrigs despise the Chivis. Dalbergs would scratch out the Hoog's eyes given half the chance. As for us, we hate them arse-licking fooksies. But Brewer's got his ways, keeps each yen in line. If not for him, Mahakam would have fallen to bits ages past. Why? Round 150 years ago, when the elves were fighting that hopeless war against your folk, the Elder-in-Chief ordered the pass to Mahakam sealed tight. If it weren't for that, we'd have ended up like the pointy ears. As it was, we waited for the shite storm to abate. Didn't you open the pass and stretch your legs again till it were safe? Yes, I remember. The manufacturers in Rivia have yet to recover. With all due respect, Your Grace, your workshops forge utter crap. It's near your fault that human folk prefer dwarven goods. Basic market principles, that's all it is. I feel enlightened, Gabor. Thank you. We shall return to this conversation later. No skin off my back. We see each other, Your Grace. A hearty Mahakam welcome to you. What an honor! Even the arbalists salute us with cocked quarrels. Oh, that well. An ounce of prevention saves a slag heap of trouble. None too shabby as views go, eh? Mmm, were it not for the howling wind, I'd make a sketch. Meave rode slowly, her surroundings interesting to her, her ears keen to take in the cacophony of sounds. The sharp whistle of wind rushing past towering peaks, the squeak of wagon wheels rolling over frozen snow, and the roar of beasts. What the...? I dare not venture a guess. Hmm. Gabor scratched his chin. An ice troll. Or one of them Barbigazar pajamas. These beasts, are they tame? As the dragon? <laughs> Not in your life. Fierce horses, every last one of them. Spring cleaning year past, one year bit my arm clear off. The Queen's brow rose in a silent inquiry. All right. You don't quite ken the context. Each spring, with the melting of the snows, a good bit of that filth comes out the ground. That's when Bruver Hoog summons all dwarves for spring cleaning. We cut down as much of the filth as we can, and that means... Relative calm the rest of the year. Out of the corner of her eye, Meave noted a dark shape darting between rock formations. Calmly, she drew her sword and brandished it a time or two to warm up her stiff arms. Seems it is our lot to assist you with this cleaning. Lyrians, arms at the ready. Prepare to fight. Stop standing around like corns on a toe. Get to work. All right. You got some splaining to do. As the wails of speared Shalemars died down, the crowd of Mahakaman infantry parted. A dwarf stepped forth, grey as a snow fox, wrinkled as a prune. He walked with difficulty, supporting himself on a battle-axe, its two heads dripping blood. This... It'd be our Elder-in-Chief, Bruver Hoog. And who might your guests be, Gabor? Meave, Queen of Lyria and Rivia, and her associates in court. My regards, Elder. I come... You come for something. Coins my first wager, fighting bodies my second. Well, what is it you want? I'm on in the years, I, but I'm not gone dotty. Tiaa, you menfolk. You got to fall on hard times to remember us dwarves. 
I've come with a design in mind, I cannot deny. But hear me out and you shall see. She's armed! Gabor! Why the devil did you let her in here like that? Armed without a sack or a heat! She has the leaden ring, Elder. A gift from a king. From Demavand, lassie, I ken that already. Trust a man, give him something of value, and he'll go and give it away as easy as a street whore gives away nubs. It's a good thing he didn't pawn it. <sniffs> Sons of humans. I've travelled far to see you. Hear me out, I beg you. Yeah, let it be my loss. Go on, heave her away. Nilfgaard has overrun my realms. It has overrun Edurn. The Blackclads are at the foot of Mahakam. They will seek to overrun your land sooner or later as well. We must act. We must react together, while there is still time. Time? What do you care a time, lass? Got how many summers to you? Forty, maybe? Had you grown up amongst dwarven folk, at your age you'd be learning to crochet dolls. No more than that. I've seen four hundred summers come and go. And I've been elder for two hundred. And you know what I've learned in that time? That meddling in your idiot scraps doesn't ever bring any good. Now, on a normal day, I'd have you all thrown clear out of this land I love. But you've the leaden ring, and that grants you the right to hospitality. And here, in Mahakam, laws and rights are sacred. You may stay in the pass as long as you wish. Young Zigrin will serve as your guide. And once you've tired of the mountains, well, you can the way down into the valleys. I bid you farewell. My lord Elder, with all due respect, we came to your aid. We smote the beasts with you, yet... And who the demons is the son? Count Reynard Odo. Ho ho, Odo, Lodo, Bodo! <laughs> now, you listen and listen well. We didn't ask for aid, and you know why? Cause I've my dignity. Not like some. Mates and wenches! Spring cleaning's done, beast cullen's over. Mount Carbon beckons us home. Follow me! Your Grace, be not dismayed. We will find a way. Manage we shall, true. Though damned if I know how. We have none other to whom we can turn, no other land where we can flee. Let us convene in council, Your Grace. Consider together what's to be done. We've yet Redania, Temeria. Your Grace, might I draw you aside a wee moment for a jabber? Reynard, please excuse me. Well, what is it you want? I ken the Elder in Chief didn't make a good first impression. <laughs> and the second? Is it any better? Mm, to be quite frank, no. I'll try elsewise. Not all's lost, trust me. Brewer's a stubborn goat, no doubt about it, but a goat to be persuaded. And I happen to ken how. The selfless impulse to help? I don't believe it exists. So before you describe how you aim to aid me, be kind enough to explain why you wish to do so. Unsolicited, mind you, and clearly against your elders' wishes. A query of my own to answer yours. Do you ken when Brewerhoog last strode down the mountains into your lowlands? I know not. While King Sambuk sat on the throne? Point of fact, never. Hoog was born here and he'll die here, like most Mahakaman dwarves. Whereas I'm a frequent visitor in your human lands. Been an emissary to royal courts, trade guilds, mummers, troops, and I've eyes. I can see all the rubbish goes on between yous. Nilfgaard's insatiable. The black clads will not stop till they've put the whole continent neath their boot. From Ophir in the south to the Dragon Mountains in the north. Gods forbid they grip all the Nordlings' realms in their vice. Cause then we'll have their hordes all round. 
controlling all the trade routes, supply lines, diversions even. And then they'll control terms and prices. Ooh. We dwarves have never been on a lead, let alone a short one. So, in short, we'll all be better off with the black clads back across the Yaruga. And I've seen your grace. Seen you in battle. You've brawn and bite, and with the right support, you can drive them back. I ken that well. Very well, I'm all ears. What must we do to spur Bruverhoog to aid us? Hmm. I might start with the thorn in our side that are beasts. A bigger thorn than most expect. See, in our never-ending search for gold, we dug deep. Too deep and reached abysses where monsters are born, or however they come to be. Soon as it turns a bit warmer, they crawl out to feed. And there's more every year. What you saw there, the spring cleaning, that's just light yearly upkeep. It didn't go at the source of the blight. Every spring we cull enough so we can live and trade and mine normal-like. But there are corridors in the upper valleys midst the peaks, where more lie waiting to pounce. So many, there's settlements that have done been abandoned. I still fail to see how this relates to myself and Bruva. Your Majesty, slay the beasts down to their last, and you'll win the hearts of the clans. All of them. And with the clans behind you, why? The Elder will have no choice. He'll bend an ear, treat you serious. You've got two sites through which beasts swarm in great numbers. There's Daver's Abyss and an abandoned underground settlement called Burra's Rump. Destroy those, collapse the corridors, problem solved. Hmm. You colour the solution as simple and known. Why has Bruva Hoog not gone at the matter? Ha! <laughs> you must learn one thing about us dwarves of Mahakam. Customs, traditions, why, we're obsessed. Goes thrice for Bruva. The Elder deliberates weeks on end. And that's in considering if we shouldn't wear suspenders, because they might be through its side and should thus be forbidden. We've a set of laws, the Four Dwarves Codex. One of its tenets says, Dare ye not close a corridor once oped? So, no self-respecting dwarf can nor will do it. But you, you're free out with. The laws didn't apply. You've a free hand in sealing the corridors from which the beasts come. Collapse them, flood them, I didn't ken, but solve the grief once and for all. And this, t'would suffice? I believe it would. Uh, but, but, but find your other ways to win the heart of a clan or Bruver himself. Do so. Can he bring no harm? Hmm. All this sounds rather toilsome, yet... I do favour this to losing another moon seeking out a court where we would at first be welcomed, only later to hear another rebuke. You've my gratitude, Gabor. You've shown me a way. Very well. Let us think on these beasts. See what's to be done. I've come to the conclusion your Elder-in-Chief is not fond of guests. Fond? That's near the quarter of it. He hates them, with seething passion. But you're damned lucky. Why's that? Let you in, didn't he? Mahakam was cordoned off completely through the outside world for many a long year. Clans finally forced Bruver to at least let in peddlers and emissaries. <laughs> Though he dragged his feet as long as he could. Meave noted a crowd of dwarves. There were several dozen, many holding baskets brimming with dried sausages, soft, puffy pretzels and jugs of frothy beer. What is this gathering? She asked Gabor. These folk? They're the parents of youngsters who are to return today from their drek thang. Gabor proceeded to explain that the drek thag was a trek upon which the local dwarves would embark when they reached maturity. During this year-long voyage, young folk would taste of life beyond their home. Yet if they failed to return on time, they would be stripped of all rights and privileges accorded to Mahakam's natives. See, in recent years, young folk's blood's been boiling on account of the strict laws in force here. Gabor added. 
So, we send them out. Let them taste life in the lowlands. Once they've learned for themselves what it's like to live among humans, they come back and ain't likely to complain. Customarily, only a few dwarves ever decided to remain in the valleys for good. That year, however, was different. Deadlines the Mora. And forty Drekthagers still have no return. Their parents now worried if some misfortune had not befallen them. The Mahakaman Guard had sent out patrols to the near reaches of the valleys. They returned not having seen anything distressing, while the humans living at the foot of the massif had been largely unwilling to talk. The guard captain, a dwarf with a fiery red beard, removed his helmet, wiped the sweat from his brow, and addressed Meave. Your Majesty, we need to find our youth. Perhaps you'd be willing to go out and search. Human folk are more like to tell you if they saw anything out of the ordinary of late. Naturally, there'd be something in it for you too. One could say I myself have lost a son. Meave gripped the captain's hand firmly. And I know well the pain that comes. I shall do all in my might to spare you at least that. Meave set off, the hopeful gazes of the dwarven parents bidding her farewell. The queen sent a scout ahead. Sometime later she heard his horn. Three blasts, two short, one long. An ambush! Meave expected to combat beasts or robbers. Yet upon her force descended warriors with squirrel tails attached to their helms. Scoyatel. Scoyatel! Don't let them escape! They are so young. No wonder they were easily manipulated. As soon as the battle had come to an end, the prisoners were brought before the Queen. All, without exception, were dwarves, and all looked to be youthful dwarves. Mystery solved, muttered Meave. In fact, these were the missing Drekthagas. Instead of returning home, they had enlisted with guerrillas fighting for non-human rights. But what had prompted so drastic a decision? I was impatient. Wanted badly to turn 50. I couldn't wait to see human cities, Vitsima, Tretigor, Novigrad, said one of the dwarven prisoners while pressing a bandage to a bleeding wound. And you know the welcome that awaited me there? I was spit upon and called names. I saw ghettos, massacres. And how was I to go back to the mines after that? We must fight while we still can, before the humans come to cut us down. We must tell the rest of ours the same. Pull all Mahakam into the fight! Meave's soldiers stood waiting for her to protest, to accuse the dwarf of lying. But the queen could not pretend she did not understand why the dwarf had taken up arms. Without entering into a discussion, she ordered the prisoners taken to be tried and judged by their kin and elders. The dwarven parents thus got their offspring returned to them albeit wounded and in chains. Bruva Hoog, who had limitless disdain for the Scoyatel, demanded the Dwarven youth be severely punished for succumbing to the rebels' seductive ideals. In the end, the Drekthagas were sentenced to 50 years' hard labor in the quarries. The Elder-in-Chief believed a half-century of swinging a pickaxe would sufficiently cool the hot heads of these would-be guerrilla fighters. They came back alive. That's the key part, the red-headed captain said, handing Meave a pouch as a reward. And perchance by the time they're freed, the war twixt the races will be over, eh? What do you think, Queen? Meave shrugged in response. Perhaps she had no opinion in the matter, or perhaps she simply did not wish to state it aloud. <laughs> Might be in jail, but at least they're back. That's most important. The Queen noted a building with unusually lavish ornamentation, including shining bronze roof tiles and glistening rock crystal window panes. An important clan dwelled there, Gabor explained. The Brecon Riggs. Could you introduce me? Meave asked. Perhaps I can convince them to intercede with Bruver on my behalf. The clan head, Ivor, invited Meave to an exquisite feast. 
but when she broached the subject of the war raging just outside Mahakam's borders, the dwarf changed the subject at once. Looking around the interior, Meave quickly understood why. The walls were ordained with Nilfgaardian tapestries and rugs. Gifts from friendly imperial envoys, no doubt. Meave prepared to leave, convinced she had wasted her time, when someone clasped her shoulder and pulled her into a darkened room. Her kidnapper turned out to be a young dwarf, female, it seemed, dressed in her nightshirt. She introduced herself as Ivor's daughter, Eudora Breckenridge, and openly admitted she had eavesdropped on Meave's dinner conversation. Listen, me dad's stubborner than an old goat, but I'll convince him to help ye, for a wee favour, that is. Mm-hmm. What? I want ye to steal something from the clan archive. Historiae Mahakamorum, tis called. See, me dad won't let me betroth me sweetikin Zoltan. Says the Codex forbids marrying a dwarf who's left the mountains. But there's precedent. Just such a case described in that document. If I can show it to Da, he'll have to change his mind. Me felt sympathy for Eudora and wanted to help her, especially considering the favor Eudora could do her in return. But she fully realized if her attempt to break into the archive ended badly, it would result in a tremendous scandal Bruva Hoog would not soon forget. Hmm. The pot's worth the play, I believe. Fine. I accept your offer. They then shook hands, sealing the deal. Meave had to bite her tongue to stop from crying out, for the young she-dwarf had the grip of a brawny blacksmith. Meave returned to her company and, massaging her sore hand, presented Eudora's offer. Gascon volunteered for the task at once. Thievery's my forte. The dwarves won't notice a single mothball in a place. Gascon snuck into the archive under the cover of darkness. Just as he was tucking Eudora's desired document into his cloak, he heard dwarven boots clanking down the stairs. Damn it! Gascon swore. I can't let them catch me. Luckily, Gascon managed to do the deed quietly, so the dwarves never found out who had broken in. As agreed, Meave handed Eudora the stolen document. The dwarf shouted, raising the parchment in a triumphant gesture. Da, can he do nothing to stop our making vows now? <laughs> I've got to write Zoltan right quick. Thanks. Thanks a million times over. And Eudora did her part too. Soon after, the Queen learned there'd been a gathering of the clans, and Ivor had indeed spoken on her behalf. She could only hope the elder Breckenrigs had swayed Bruva Hoog as well. Eudora Brickenrigs Chuve. <laughs> oh, I truly like the sound of that. Ah, you thundering dope! I told you to hold your horses or you'll shake the hitch loose. Oh, now you're a bleeding expert, are you? You overloaded the damn cart, that's why it's busted. A wagon lay strewn across the middle of the road. Behind it stood others. Some loaded with gold, jewels and other valuables, others groaning under barrels of pickled meat. Each dwarf had his own theory about how the accident had come about and thundered it out to all and sundry, peppered with choice invectives. An odd caravan, Meave said. They don't look like merchants. Nay, they ain't, Gabor answered. Dwarves of the Ferens Club, carrying gifts for the Drake. Remember Keltilus? When he took Roost here, Ferences fought him for near a century. Then the dragon got weary of fighting, and they realized he weren't going nowheres, so they cut a deal. He didn't bother them. They give him what he needs. Well, well. And these offerings they send often? Every week. Excuse me, got to separate them lads, for they tear out each other's beards. Hey there! Cool your idiot heads! Gabor managed to douse his brethren's fiery tempers. But the wagon still lay across the road, blocking all traffic. Queen, said Xavier. It is an easy repair. I have the tools, the parts. Need but your permission. Of course. Go see what can be done. Xavier did indeed make quick work of the problem. Within moments, the wagon was rolling smoothly down the road, good as new. Well, shaft me, your highness, said one of the dwarves. Your engineers got a pate like stewed meat. 
but he kens his trade. That's for certain. I'll convey your words to him. Or at least part of them. Uh, me and the lads will be on our way now, but, but first, take this. Bit of gold by way of thanks. Thank you, Meave said, accepting the surprisingly heavy pouch. In wartime, every copper counts. The dwarf bowed in parting, shook the snow off his beard, then rejoined his caravan. Within a few moments, the wagons had disappeared around the bend. A pillar of smoke rose above the mountains, and a sooty aroma filled the air. Fire, Gabor said, then took a deep sniff. Perhaps a bolt struck some barren trees. No, Meave said curtly. I know that scent too well. All Edurn reeked of it. It's the smell of burning homes. The Lyrians quickened their gait. Soon they saw a town fully aflame, and a roaring, furious dragon above it. That's... Your Keltalus? Gascon asked, shielding his eyes from the sharp glare emanating from the city. You were right. Perfectly harmless. Then a Ken was get his knickers in a bunch, the dwarf said, grabbing his axe from his belt. Queen, we got to make haste to the rescue. Reynard! Meave called out. Have our men wet their cloaks for a modicum of fire protection. We move as soon as they're done. Your Grace, they are but common soldiers to fight a dragon. I know. But we must help them, or at least try. While Reynard went to pass on the order, Meave turned to Gabor. This dragon, has it any weakness? Fear not, said the somber dwarf. Except a fondness for raw meat. Meave nodded and swallowed dryly. Despite the cold, she felt sweat pour down her scalp. Stifling her fear, Meave gave the order to attack, and her soldiers rode into the flaming city. From up close, Keltalus looked even more terrifying. Though enormous, he moved with shocking agility, like a lizard scurrying over sand. With one swing of his paw, he snapped the necks of three dwarves, then bisected a fort with a powerful bite. After that, he turned his attention to the Lyrians. More of you! <laughs> he said, twisting his bloody moor into a horrifying smile. God! Behind me! Stay together! Ah, shite! He's raging now! Watch out! Your Grace, we're taking losses! That day, many Lyrians perished, either to the dragon's all-consuming fire or to its flesh-rending claws. Yet their sacrifice was not in vain. Together with the dwarves, they were able to grievously wound Keltalus, forcing him to flee. The howls of the wounded monster rang throughout the valley. That's right, howl, you scurvy snake! Shouldn't they have attacked us, eh? Damn fuel lizard! Meave! That's Vavrenik, elder of the town and all the Ferences. My regards and condolences. Eh, tain't so bad. If nay for ye, wouldn't it be a stone left unrubbled? To be honest, when I caught when some human queen come to Mahakam looking for aid, I said a crocus would sprout twixt my cheeks afore I'd vote aye on that. Gonna be a fear to look in my breeches after, but... Changed my mind. After what I saw today, what ye did for us, ye have the support and undying gratitude of all Ferences. Thank you. Faced with the Nilfgaardian peril, that means a great deal. Uh, forgive me for interrupting this tear tugging Sino interracial reconciliation, but I can't hold back any longer. Favrenik! Double chase! What happened? Why'd Keltless attack? I can as much as ye. Meaning, squat diddly. Just flew up, started spewing flames, half the tune lit up in a flash. Sheepshank. Three hundred years I've been a good neighbour. What's done's done. Got to think about the future. The Drake's just taking a breather. Got to finish him off for his regained form. Meaning, we have no much time. He heals like an alchemist's pup. 
and the nearest guards are miles away. He'll be up flying again before they get here. Aye, that's what I thought. Ahem. <clears throat> Perhaps your grace, you'd... Uh... What? Jest you must. I ken you're tired through the fight, didn't want to risk casualties, etc. But remember, the beast's sleeping on a bed of gold and rubies. All belonging by right to Bruder, of course. But if a uh, quibbling son wandered off, he'd nae notice. I admit that does alter my calculations. Besides, the dragon was badly wounded. Putting it featherly, blood poured out of him like a leaky bladder. Just needs a coup de gras. Fine. I'll do the deed. Can you see the light? Oi, Vavranek, Vavranek. This lady's gonna make your rump a regular crocus garden. Aye, Queen's doing us a great service. One that'll profit us both. So, where is Keltalus's lair? North of here. It's a vast cavern. Ye canna miss it. Meave bid farewell to Vavranek and set out on her way. Did her way lead to the dragon's lair, you ask? Shh. Let's not spoil the surprise. Keltalis' lair was indeed impossible to miss, as would stand to reason, for any space capable of containing a dragon must be enormous. The lair's moor, a black triangle cut out of a vast plain of snow, loomed from afar. Confirming the dragon's presence was the powerful odor emanating from it, one of sulfur and blood. Well then, Gascon said, ready to become a legendary dragon slayer? My father oft said, never should you count pelts till the hunt is through. Meave said, dismounting her horse. It's all the more true when you hunt dragons. He's wounded, yes, but one puff of flame, and we shall be not legends but corpses. Leave all thoughts of foolhardy bravery behind. The Lyrians crept across the dragon's threshold. They walked single file, shields raised, watched by bats hanging from the ceiling. Keltalis lay curled up on a bed of diamonds and gold coins turned red from his blood. Seeing how he strained merely to lift his massive head, Meave knew the dragon no longer posed any threat. Come to finish what your poison began? The monster croaked hoarsely. Fine. Do it then. Keltalis turned over, exposing his vulnerable underbelly, and waited calmly for the fatal blow. Wait, Meave said, dropping her sword. What poison? <laughs> Keltalis laughed while squeezing his bleeding side in pain. So they didn't tell you? Lousy munchkins. Hey! Watch your tongue! Gabor yelled. Sides! I didn't care anything about it. Keltalis looked the Lyrians over mistrustfully with his snake-like eyes, then began to tell his tale. The caravan Meave had met on the road was different to the others. This time, Keltalis's meat had been pickled in a special brine, one spiked with poison. As the dragon lay curled up in pain, Ferenc dwarves entered his lair and smashed his eggs. So if I understand correctly... Meave interrupted. You're female. Correct. Same as you. As if on command, all Lyrian eyes turned to Gabor. Can you look at me? We didn't peek under his, eh, uh, heart, eh, uh, itch, tail. If I may, Reynard interjected. These revelations about Keltalus's sex are undeniably fascinating. But I'm more curious why the Ferences has stooped to such a dishonorable deed. That's easy enough to guess, Meave said. They were afraid the dragon would soon demand more tribute to feed its young. So they decided to strike preemptively. To the Ferences' misfortune, they delivered too small a dose of poison. Infuriated at the sight of the broken eggs, the dragon gathered its strength and flew to the nearest town. 
Meave saw for herself what happened then. And now it was up to her to decide how this story would end. The dragon had killed dozens, perhaps even hundreds, but had been provoked first by the dwarves' heartless cruelty. Did it thus deserve death or mercy? When judging my subjects, I would sometimes not know who bore the greater guilt, said Meave. But as ruler, I had to reach a verdict, often a harsh one. The queen returned her sword to its sheath. This is not my land, Meave said. Nor are these my subjects. I don't have to choose the lesser evil. Meave! Gabor hissed. Prover will be fury. Let him. And you, dragon, swear me this. When you heal, you shall leave Mahakam and never return. You've my word. And my gratitude. Meave was about to leave the cavern when the dragon blocked her way with its tail, then gathered a smattering of valuables at the queen's feet. Each would be the prize of the Lyrian crown jewels. News that Meave had spared the dragon which had killed dozens of dwarves did indeed enrage the inhabitants of Mahakam the Ferences in particular. But when the clans considered driving the Lyrians from the pass, Elder Vavrinek opposed it. No matter what happened after, he had sworn Meave his undying gratitude. The blizzard's blowing in. Your Grace, perhaps we'd best pitch camp and wait for clear weather. Tain't a bad idea. Said we might be waiting a week. Then we march on. We've no time to waste. While we ride to and fro begging aid, Nilfgaard grows in power. We must obtain reinforcements as quickly as possible and liberate our home. Meave rode on in silence, endeavoring to work out the length of her exile thus far. A scout's call tore her from her reverie. Your Grace! You must see this! With a grave mien, the soldier indicated a track in the snow. The hobnail bootprint was all too familiar. Meave had seen it before upon Lyria's sandy tracks, and midst the ashes to which Edern had been turned. Nilfgaardian footmen. Seethed Meave. Marched through of late. Interrupted Gascon. A day, perhaps two days, passed. The scouts had learned a Nilfgaardian caravan with an armed escort had recently arrived in Mahakar. The invaders had brought with them chests brimming with gold and jewels, then exchanged these for the finest Mahakaman forged swords and spears. A scout gave me one of the coins the black clads had used for payment. Upon the coin's back, the Lyrian eagle. They pay with gold from my vault, the queen said through gritted teeth. For arms that will cut down my fighting men and subjects. We might yet pursue and hunt them down, said Reynard, a spark in his eye. And make certain Ed Dahi never lays hands on those weapons. You might, I can, piped up Gabor, who had been listening to their exchange. But you might also recall, we Mahakamans are neutrals who assure all guests within our borders safety. True? Formally speaking, the Nilfgaardians have passed outside them, but attack him a stone's throw from our gates, and you'll see Bruver's rage come out his ears as steam, and out his arse as fire. Gabor, forgive me, said the Queen. This caravan we must attack. I must stop the Nilfgaardians. And entirely apart, I should be quite content to watch Bruver spew fire. Gabor's mouth gaped as he tried to protest. But the Lyrian soldier's laughter drowned out his grunts. Meave gave the signal to depart. Soon after, Queen and company descended upon the foe's caravan and a battle ensued. Crushed by their defeat, the Nilfgaardians tossed the chests into the snow lining the road and rode off to the cracking of their whips. One chest burst open, revealing a weapon wrapped in greased leather. Gascon removed the leather and held aloft a sihil that shone with newly forged luster. He examined it from all sides, then put his thumb to its blade. Blood immediately squirted out. Ooh! Sharp bastard! He said, clearly impressed. Hearing these words, Gabor unexpectedly burst out laughing. What's got you so tickled, if you don't mind my asking? <laughs> Custom holds the first words out a warrior's mouth upon seeing a sill become the blade's name. So, <laughs> congrats. 
You've dubbed it. <laughs> Gascon stood there awkwardly as Meave took the weapon from him. I'd have chosen a different name personally, one with a bit more dignity, but Sharp Bastard has an undeniable charm. And I cannot wait to try it out on Nilfgaardian plate. Aye, but perhaps nay in Mahakam, Gabor interjected. You've made a fine enough mess for yourselves, as is. Gonna need to mend for it somehow. And that'll nae be easy. Tidings of Meave's deeds soon reached Bruva Hoog's meaty ears. And though there was no fire, despite Gabor's insistence to the contrary, there was also no doubt the Elder-in-Chief was livid. Only the Zigrin's intercession on their behalf kept the Lyrians from being thrown out of the mountains. Meave squinted and gazed off into the distance. It seemed to her that hundreds of black patches covered the peaks on the horizon. Once she had ridden up closer, she realized these were the windows of homes carved out of solid rock. Our pride this was, sighed Gabor. Burra's rump. A city carved out of mountain rock. Hundreds of miles of tunnels, dozens of steelworks, smithies and forges. Now... It's a vast lair to monsters. They ooze from underground, weave their nests, hatch their young, and when hunger hits them in the gut, they prowl down into the pass. Meave stood at the entrance to the underground city. The monumental gate, cast in bronze, lay on the ground, folded multiple times as a scroll of paper. Out of blackened windows oozed a stench of rotting meat and mold. The queen bent an ear to hear water dripping, and, in the distance, a metallic scraping, a sound akin to chitinous scales rubbing against rock. The soldiers await your order, your grace, said Reynard quietly, as if he feared he would wake the beasts asleep in the caverns. Do you recall my words as we fled Lyria? Said Neve, turning to Reynard. You swore you would retake your crown. Even if you had to penetrate hell to do so. Time to follow that oath. The queen inhaled deeply and stepped forward, her sword raised and prepared to strike or parry. Moments later, it was swinging, biting, as the current tenants of Borrow's Rump came out to meet her. Oh, this stench is foul. Ah, damn it! They're hatching! Place is about to swarm with creepers! This way! Follow me! Though wounded, Meave approached the Shailmar, which lay writhing on the ground. She then ran her sword through its heart, finishing it. Yet so spent was she that she lacked the strength to pull her blade from between the plates of the chitinous armor. The beast near took me, she whispered. It was very close. The Lyrians reached a vast hall that had once served the clans as their meeting room. The stone benches were covered in sticky slime and insectoid eggs, while bats of varying size hung from the crystal chandeliers. Gascon rummaged through old, weathered bones, surely hoping to find something of value. Gabor, in turn, was at a shut and locked door, grappling with it as if it were a deadly beast. The door finally gave way with a sigh, and the dwarf raised his arms in a triumphant gesture. It's a storeroom. Should hold miners' tools aplenty, he said, enthused. Some barrels of alchemical brews in here, too. Lucky there's no sign of moisture. They haven't any soaked through. All's we've got to do is roll them out into the corridor and set a bit of fire to them. And woof! We'll have sealed the beasts off from the pass once and for all. Meave treated the dwarves' instructions as hallowed. Soon after, the mountains trembled from a powerful explosion. Rubble came down and blocked the tunnels. They say the plumes of smoke escaping the window openings in the rock could be seen as far as Aldersburg. Dark clouds hovered over the horizon and a strong gale snapped their banners. Damn it, a storm's coming. Gabor! 
Take us to the nearest settlement. We must seek shelter. Soon the Lyrians arrived in Stulkamp. The town square proved full of folk. Several dozen dwarves laden with large sacks and satchels stood about in smaller groups. When a thick snow began to fall, the dwarves cheered. Tears streamed down the cheeks of several, but Meave could not tell if they issued from some fortuitous occurrence or if the strong wind had wrung moisture from their eyes. What is it we witness? Why do they rejoice at a snowstorm? Asked Meave, pulling her hood over her head. Well, the blizzard's good cause to postpone their expedition by another day, Gabor responded. See, they've been conscripted by drawn lots to be settlers, found homes in a village in Blackbrook Vale. Seven expeditions have gone that way already. And none survived longer than a year. Valley's cursed. No two ways about it. Intrigued, Meave proceeded to speak with the settler's leader. He confirmed Gabor's claim. He had buried many a previous colonist. All had been abnormally thin, pale, prematurely greyed, as if some wraith had drawn the lifeblood out of them. Once the dwarf had finished his tale, he gripped the queen's hand firmly and promising a generous reward, begged that she and her Lyrians accompany the expedition to Blackbrook Valley. Taint far, mere few leagues north along the main road. We'll make the march much easier to came with the whole army, in case of any danger. I know not how useful our swords can be against curses and spectres, said Meave. But leave you bereft and in need I will not. We shall march with you into Blackbrook Vale and see to it that you are safely arrived. Then we will march on. The dwarf sped off to announce the good tidings to his settler brethren. By the time the blizzard had abated, they were ready to march. Blackbrook Vale. The name itself embodied infamy. Neve arrived expecting misty ravines, decrepit trees bound in spiders' webs and swarms of bats. What she saw was a warmly gurgling stream and the valley's gentle slopes blanketed in crocus blooms. Only a village of abandoned, ruined huts and a cemetery stretching to the horizon behind it attested to the valley's grim past. The village seems shrouded in a guise. Be not deceived, said the queen. Reynard, some men to search the environs for any sign of life. The blood-curdling roar that came from the ruins a moment later proved the Queen's caution warranted beyond any doubt. Protect the settlers! Right through the last, that one! Should be safe now! Following the victory, the settlers' hopes seemed renewed. Could the beasts they felled have killed the previous lot of colonists? Perhaps the curse that had long hung over Blackbrook Vale was at last broken. We thank you, your majesty, the settler's leader said, slipping the satchel from his shoulder. You have granted us new hope and a new home. The dwarves rolled up their sleeves at once and set about repairing the cottages. Sounds of hammering, sawing and chopping filled the valley, accompanied by a steady stream of dwarven song. Meave left Blackbrook Vale, her spirits soaring. How great was her subsequent shock when the elders summoned dwarves for another expedition to the valley. It seemed the settlers Meave had escorted had met the same fate as the colonists who had preceded them. Yet what had killed either group would never be known. Meave had stopped and was removing packed ice from her mare's fetlocks when Gabor Zigrin approached. The dwarf squatted at the queen's side, glanced about quickly, then started speaking in a barely audible whisper. Your Majesty, I overheard some folk talking in the smithy. Birdies claim there's treasure, true riches, in the hills near Blackbrook Vale, south of here. Stowed away there. And nobody dares go looking for it on account of beasts that have made their lairs there. But you've got a wee army behind you. I reckon you can try. Might be worth the risk, eh? The queen brushed the snow from her knees and raising her hand against the glaring sunlight peered towards the mountains. Though tempted, she had doubts. To start, the rocky scree at their feet warned clearly of avalanches. I shall think on it, she answered, 
before vaulting into her saddle. The rumors Gabor had overheard were true. Scouts returned with news of a cavern at whose mouth lay rotted logs, an indication that something of great weight may have been rolled inside. Chests full of gold, for instance. Then again, poor tracks clearly showed some beasts had made the cave their home. Right. Decision time. Enter, or scramble back down, said Gascon, rubbing his hands together for warmth. Please, hurry. This frost is downright biting. We've scaled this high. Foolish we'd be to descend empty-handed. Fall in behind me! The queen took the four, sword in one hand, torch in the other. The flickering flame's glow illuminated the cave's interior, casting long shadows. Meave was certain some horror would leap at her at any moment. And she was not at all wrong. As soon as the last beast had fallen, the Lyrians took to seeking out the treasure. Soldiers dispersed throughout the caverns in a rush, penetrating every last corner. Finally, one called out. Got it! Got the treasure! Right here! Treasure! Shiny stuff! A number of steel-reinforced chests lay up against the cavern wall. Meave blew the dust from the lid of one and lifted it with some difficulty. She had hoped for gold and jewels, bars of Mahakaman steel at the least. Instead, she saw thousands of time-tarnished copper coins with a hole through their centre. What's this bloody crap? Tokens of some sort? Uh, aye, that's right. Holy Goldens, we call them. They're, uh, currency in Mahakam. Get our wages in them. Use them to cop victuals and hooch. What of arms, armour, tools? Nah, all oh, that's given to us. Clan provides it. Is that what you need? Weapons, or... Oh, feel the agent, no. Brought you here for no reason. Yet these tokens, they can be exchanged for other coin, can they not? Temerian Orans or Novigrad crowns? Aye. They're doable in theory, but not at all clever. Rates are crap. See, the elders keep them low to make life difficult for dwarven folk. Discourage them from leaving Mahakam. What's this? Common dwarves use no gold. You cannot be serious. Yet I am. What good's gold to them? Clan gives them all they need. And victuals and hooch beyond need, they get for tokens. Yet you trade with humans. Gold coin you take for your goods, the coin must serve a purpose. What is it? We hoard it all. In vaults. Great piles. Down bottom lie ducats dating from the reign of that dozy ham shanker, King Dagrid. And you do not put it to use? Acquire anything for it? Then it's true what folks say, that you love gold too much to part with it. Hoard it for pleasure, as dragons do. Point of fact, that there's pure drivel. Gold's a metal like any other, just yellow. We hoard it for our safety. Your safety? I fear again, I simply don't follow. Couldn't it be simpler? Soon as human folk get it in their heads we's a thorn in their side, we'll spend it. All of it, in a jiffy. Excess coin supply, that's called. Matter of days, gold will be worth less than sawdust. And you're tossing banks and economies, bam, on their arses. There'll be nothing left of them. They'll cave in faster than a mine shaft with rotten props. Why are you all ogling me? With human folk for neighbours, we dwarves got to be damn vigilant, as sheep round wolves. So how can these tokens serve me? We must trade them. Even should we get a pittance, it will be something. The soldiers demand their pay. Ah, oh, your bums out there, Wendy. Fighting men want full dixies and tankards a hooch. Coins but a means to that end. What do you suggest, then? As I've been saying, the tokens we use to purchase nourishment and mead and what you've got in those chests, why... That'll do to fund a feast the likes of which Mahakam's not seen since Brewer was sworn in as Elder-in-Chief. The fighting men'll eat and drink their fill, carouse about and forget their due and pay right quick, and invite the local dwarves to feast with you, and the clans'll look kinder on you too. Caution be damned. Your Grace, 
I feel obliged to remind you we are at war with Nilfgaard, and every copper... Should go to building our army, I know. But we live but once, Reynard. Sir Gabor, take the tokens and arrange me a feast so grand that Ebdahi himself shall hear us revel. As Meeve's force could not possibly fit in a tavern, the feast was laid out in a storehouse. Crates arranged in rows served as tables and benches, while the windows were festooned with lion's foot and pasque flower. Great barrels of mead, cognac and vodka were rolled in, and when the soldiers saw this, they broke out in cheers and laughter that lasted till dawn. Pour us another round, you lovable Lyrian bastards! <laughs> For he's a jolly good fair, uh, sorry, a jolly good dwarf. There was food and drink enough for the dwarves of the pass, who, with Meave's men, raised tankards in hand and voices in song the night through. To see them sharing tales and playing cards, one would not believe that anywhere down the mountains, through woods and across plains, humans and dwarves might, for the softest slight, leap at each other, murder in their eyes. I'd get up. I would, Your Majesty. But my arse is frozen to the ground. Four Dwarves Codex states it clear. If you're in a mine and something knocks, you'd do best not to knock back, ever. Riding past a mine, Meave noticed a group of miners gathered around the entrance to a shaft. Frost had settled on their moustaches and beards, suggesting they had been there for some time. The Queen summoned Gabor and asked him to determine the reason for this sit-in. He returned after a few minutes and announced the most curious thing. They're waiting for the knocking to stop. Meave's frown prompted Gabor to explain in greater detail. According to our laws, dwarves can't go into a mine if there's knocking coming from inside. We're obliged to wait for the ruckus to quiet down. Ah, yes. Our own miners share this superstition, Reynard interjected. They say the knocking is that of a treasurer gnome, a kind of mine ghost. With all due respect, your miners are dimwits, Gabor said, patting Reynard on the shoulder. Knocking means an imminent and abrupt discharge of the potential pliable energy of rock formations. In other words, you can, a rock burst. Except usually it's all done in a day or two, whereas these lads have been waiting going on two weeks. Foreman's grown impatient. He'd like to send someone down the shaft, have him see what's at issue, but... Well, the code forbids us from doing anything of the sort. If in this manner I can gain favour among your brethren... Sighed the Queen, dismounting. So be it. I shall descend and see what the problem is. The shaft was too narrow to fit an entire army. So Meave and a small unit of men entered the mine, miners' lamps in hand and hearts in their mouths. The rhythmic knocking coming from the bowels of the mountains, distorted and multiplied, was unnerving. Soon the company arrived at the place that seemed the source of the knocking. Gabor put his ear to the rock and listened for several moments in silence, then struck the wall with all his might. The wall crumbled with a crash, opening a passage into another corridor from which sprang numerous foes. Did you hear something? What was that? Stop! Stop, we surrender! Both sides were surprised. Both fought in the weak light of torches, nearly down on hands and knees. In the end, the Queen emerged victorious, and as soon as she had returned her sword to its sheath, she asked the new prisoners a question that was on everyone's mind. Who the devils are you? The captives looked at each other in disbelief, as if before them stood a ghost. Finally, one of them managed to choke out a response. Your Highness, we're... We're your subjects. Meave recognized the accent at once. The men came from Rivia. But what were they doing so far from home? According to the prisoner's account, after the Nilfgaardians' invasion of their kingdom, terrible poverty gripped the land. Seeking bread, some desperate inhabitants had gone to the mountains of Mahakam, engaging in wildcat mining in search of precious ores. 
Without asking the dwarves what they thought of this. You know yourself, my queen, explained one captured Riv. They guard their treasure real jealous-like, don't care a whit about the suffering of others. They see us starving down in Valley and don't lift a stubby finger. Sadly, the Rivians had dug close to existing corridors. When Gabor destroyed the wall that stood between them and the dwarves, they were convinced they were being attacked by monsters, so they raised arms in self-defense. Meave! Tis a tough nut to again, said Gabor. But let's nae kid ourselves. These men are thieves, and we must hand them over to the Mahakaman Guard. So they may do what? Sentence them to hard labor, or hang them at once, said Reynard, his usual calm shaken and his voice raised. These are your subjects, Queen. They coveted their neighbor's goods, true, but only because they had knelt themselves. The foreman wished for the knocking to stop, said the queen, and so it shall. As for you, go back to Rivia, and tell all their queen shall soon return, leading an army. The grateful Rivs quickly packed up their tools and left the mountains. Meave had no doubt Bruva Hoog would soon learn of the affair and would certainly not approve of her decision. Yet she preferred to face the Elder's wrath than send her subjects to a dwarven prison, or possibly to their death. Well, boys, we swig and we get back to work. The sound of approaching hoofbeats made Meave turn to see Reynard spurring on his panting horse, galloping at a breakneck speed towards her. Ill tidings I bring you, Grace. Clearly. Glad tidings never arrive with such urgency. Our scouts captured a Nilfgaardian messenger. He was travelling in disguise and by night. When he realised his capture was imminent, he strove to destroy the letters he carried. We were able to salvage some in parts. Anything of interest? Yes, there is, I fear. Your Majesty, you must listen. Consider your offer accepted. Direct Meave and her force to the agreed site. We await their arrival. Your reward shall be as agreed. Hail Keritzer. A traitor. We might have expected as much. Nilfgaard has shown amply that it abides only by the rules it sets. Since they have not proved able to defeat me in the field, in open battle, they seek other means. I suppose the scroll bears no name. It does not, Your Grace. The messenger. Have you questioned him? Naturally, Your Grace. Alas, he knows not to whom the letter is directed. He was to leave it in an agreed spot. I take it tidings of the whole affair have spread throughout the force? Yes, Your Majesty. The witnesses were too many to keep this fact a secret. We must thus assume the traitor in our ranks knows it as well, and will make no attempt to retrieve the scroll. A dead end. Have we any other leads or clues? None I fear, Your Majesty. We must be alert. Keep a keen eye on events as they unfold, and exercise great caution in forging new acquaintances. Very well. Eyes wide open, all senses attuned. Yours in particular, Reynard. Of course, my liege. Meave's force neared Davor's abyss. Signs of beastly feasting were not hard to find. Countless paw and claw tracks were impressed in the blood-stained snow. Among the boulders, bones picked clean were strewn about. Gascon lifted one from the ground. Empty inside, he said. Something sucked out the marrow. Meave's soldiers feigned indifference to the grisly sight. They marched on their stepped rhythm unwavering, a song on their lips. Yet hearing a slight tremolo in their voices, Meave knew they merely sought to drown out their fear. A moment later, a commander's horn sounded, the signal to halt. The queen galloped to the fore of the column and found herself at the edge of a vast, round hole in the ground. She could not see the bottom. Meave drew her reins tight to prevent her mount from taking even one step forward. What is this? A crater? A desiccated lake? A mine of the strip variety, Gabor explained. Treasures we picked and shoveled for here. Diamonds. 
Till we happened on the beasts, that is. What now? Orion's a dam. Holds back a lake. If we can break it, water'll rush in, fill the abyss and the tunnels from which the beasts emerge. Just need to get around the mine first. Way down's on the other side. Meave squinted and gazed into the distance. Indeed, there was the dam. And at its foot, a swarm of beasts roiled about. Her soldiers gazed at their queen expectantly, their arms at the ready. She knew well they would rush into battle, in spite of their fear. Gabor! Meave cried out over the whirling wind. Have you barred here in Mahakam? Of course, Your Grace! Then we shall give them good reason to compose this day, on the themes of courage, of heroism, of Lyria! Gee up! And with that cry, the queen spurred her mount, grabbed a banner, and raising it high over her head, rushed headlong at the horrid swarm. Here's the way down! We need to break through and destroy the dam! And indeed, Bard sang of this battle soon after. For no claws or fangs could break through the wall of shields the Lyrians raised that day. And no scales could protect the beasts from the Lyrian stinging arrows and blades. Fight! Do not relent! Let us show these beasts! It is they who should fear us! The Queen shouted. In the end, the beasts turned to flee, yet Meave's force cut off any chance of escape. A solid wall of men began to push the monsters ever closer to the edge of Davil's abyss. Pressed from all sides, the horrors began slipping over the precipice, screeching terribly as they fell. Silence came at last. The queen stood at the edge of the precipice, breathing heavily, leaning on her sword. From the depths of the mine came muted growls and groans. Let's flood the damn hole, hissed Gabor, before any other shite crawls out of it. A rush of icy water suddenly rose, then just as abruptly plunged into the mine, flooding the pit. And where once lay Davor's abyss, now lay Davor's pond. Meave descended back into the pass, exhausted and covered in beastly blood, yet also exceedingly pleased. She was one step closer to Dwarven support in the war against Nilfgaard. Once the Lyrians had put some distance between themselves and the now destroyed monster lair, Meave ordered her men to pitch camp. Then she sent the quartermaster off for food and drink. The soldiers lit campfires, then set aside their weapons. Soon after, lively music and song could be heard throughout the camp. Your Majesty, Reynard said from behind Meave's back. A messenger from the Elder-in-Chief. The Queen turned to see a dwarf in a richly adorned jerkin and a shako with golden seams. She stifled her laugh into a smile and lifted her chin proudly, expecting praise and a pledge of aid in the war against Nilfgaard. My lady... Your daring deeds have come to the Elder's attention, said the Dwarf in a measured voice. He's positively irate and demands an explanation. Irate? But why? I and my men, we've aided you greatly. Elder Hoog awaits at the Long Bridge. You'd be wise not to keep him there any length of time. And with that, all the Queen's enthusiasm for a celebration was instantly gone. She waited until the fires expired and the songs died down, then gave the order to march. Frozen. All. Only the banner moves. Blown by the wind. Downright poetic. Prime material for a ballad. Perhaps even a whole saga. Gazing towards the horizon, Meave noticed a dark shape outlined against the mantle of snow that lay on the ground. It proved a tower, toppled and broken in pieces. Around it lay the ruins of other buildings, blocks hewn out of basalt rock protruding from the permafrost. That'd be the Clan Vidmar ruins, said Gabor, hollering over the wind. Rich ones had their clan seat here till earth tremors turned all into dust. Hundreds of dwarves lived here once, and now, not a living soul. Ah! Uh, help! Save me! On the contrary, there was someone midst the ruins, and said someone was clearly in trouble. Meave ordered her men to find the unfortunate soul. They returned moments later, leading a dwarf whose teeth chattered. They had found him in a ruined building where he'd sought shelter from ghouls. Judging by his appearance, the dwarf had spent the better part of a week there. 
Marco Widmar, they call me, he said, patting down unkempt hair that seemed to reach in all directions. I came here seeking a family heirloom, lost in the tremors and the chaos they caused. I ken the chamber where it ought to be, but, well, beasts made the lair there. I cannot drive them off on my own, but bold warriors like you ought to cut them down in a jiffy. So, will you help? I too have lost my home, estate, said the Queen, so I understand well what you feel. I shall help you recover your heirloom. Call it a whim. Mirko Vidmar's face lit up. Though he'd spent a week besieged and eating stale biscuits, and though there was a hoarfrost in his beard, he quickly trotted to the front of the column and led the Lyrian soldiers to the underground chamber. As promised, beasts awaited there. The ruins! From there they come! Drive them back! Let's get a move on before any others show up! As soon as the fight was done, Mirko Vidmar ran towards a crate that stood on a pedestal, slipping on the now bloody floor. When the dwarf lifted the lid, precious stones spilled out. Your heirloom? This? Asked the queen, rather puzzled. I thought a pipe that belonged to your grandfather more likely. Seems to me Brother Mirko was not wholly candid with us. This here's no heirloom, no family souvenir. It's the treasure trove of Clan Vidmar. We thought it gone for good. Pressed for the truth, Mirko admitted no family sentiment had prompted this expedition. The dwarf had planned to leave Mahakam and start a new life among humans. Yet he did not wish to do so without sizable capital. I can't stand to stay here a moment longer. The days, all of them, they're identical. Rise with the first cockscrow, march in double file to the latrine, crap on command, twelve hours down the shaft and home to sleep. Mirko complained. Want a wifey? Put on an application? In triplicate? Care to snip your beard? Elders got to approve it. You want to add buttermilk, not cream to your mushroom soup? Clan council's got to debate it. How's a dwarf not to get balmy? I understand the lad, no two ways about it, Gabor sighed. But I feel it's my duty to remind you that what Mirko's going and doing here, well, there are laws. Treasure's due the Elder in Chief, not to Mirko, that's one. Second, any dwarf that wants to leave Mahakam can't take nothing but his breeches, his Dixie, and his coat. So, brief like, consider well afore you make your decision, Your Grace. I sympathize, Mirko, said Meave. But I'm a crowned head. I must decline. National interest requires I show the greatest possible care for my relations with Elder-in-Chief Hoog. Yet in aiding you, I could sour those greatly. I shall return the treasure to him. I must. While you do what you will. Mirko Vidmar swore under his breath, then jostled his way through the Lyrian infantry and into the mountains, towards human lands. The Lyrians rode a narrow, winding path along the rocky ridge. To one side were ice-covered boulders, to the other, a chasm hundreds of feet deep. They could have at least erected some barriers, complained Gascon, knocking snow from his cap. Got plans for that, Gabor said. Just need to decide how high to make them. What? Think, should they be the height of your average dwarf or a human? The debate's gone on for 20 years. On the one hand, you've got... Gabor did not finish his discursion. He was interrupted by the Barbagazi that jumped down from the rocks. Archers! Shoot! Aim for underbelly! Meave's soldiers made quick work of the lone monster. But the sound of battle spooked the horses harnessed to one of her wagons. Whoa there! Whoa! Damn it! The driver tried to rein in the animals, but could not. They dragged him into the chasm along with his cart and the soldiers riding in it. They landed a few dozen feet below on a rocky outcropping. A moment later, Barber Ghazis swarmed everywhere. Did you see how they fared? Anyone left alive? Asked Meave, leaning over the cliff edge. Worry more about their cargo, Gascon replied. They were also carrying chests of gold. Blast! We can't get down there. Too steep and the snow keeps falling. We can lower ourselves down a line. But 
Without armor, shields, or heavy weapons, otherwise it will snap. And the Barbagazis? The Queen said, brow raised. We shan't kill them with daggers. They're too thick of armor. We'll have to try. Or continue on our way. You only live once. Meave sighed. Gascon, round up some volunteers and let us move out. Moments later, the Queen was lowering herself down a line straight towards the gaping maw of a Barbagazi. Her only armor, a woolen shirt. Careful! No one try to be a hero! Bereft of sword and shield, Meave could not withstand a single blow. She thus danced atop the frozen snow, deftly dodging the Barbagazi's lightning-fast strikes, while delivering but a few well-aimed hits of her own to their eyes, ears, and gaping jaws. When the last monster fell lifeless to the ground, Meave walked up to the shattered wagon. The soldiers it had carried were bruised, frostbitten, but alive. Your Grace, we were sure you'd leave us. A good ruler never abandons her folk. Nor her gold, Gascon interjected, while securing a rope to a chest. Soon enough, all were safely back on the path. The admiration Meave saw in her soldiers' eyes was in itself sufficient reward for her difficult battle. Meave now witnessed a sorry sight. A mass funeral for miners killed due to a tragic convergence of events. Their lead caskets lay upon the snow, wreaths of hop cones laid upon them in turn. The mourners waited for the diggers to finish. The digging was tough, for the ground was frozen. As the crunch and thud of picks and shovels continued, the dead miners' foreman scrambled onto a boulder to make a speech. Angry shouts and loud booing stopped him. You knew it! You knew they'd smell vapors, but you ordered them to keep digging till it blew up in their faces! Make the daily quota whatever the cost, eh? You have blood on your mitts, whore son! A mourner then picked up a chunk of frozen ground and threw it at the foreman. Blood spurted from the gash that appeared on his forehead. The first dirt chunk was followed by another, then by a rock, a brick. Meave realized that if she did not intervene, the foreman stood to be stoned to death. Something had to be done quickly. Meave saw this clearly. She spurred her mount and rode into the cemetery, pushing through the throng, then stopping before the foreman, the horse shielding him from further blows. Calm yourselves! Silence! His guilt cannot be decided here. It must! Before Meave could finish her plea, a large rock thrown from the crowd struck her bosom, nearly knocking her from her saddle. Upon seeing this, her Lyrian escort lowered spears and drew swords and rushed at the angry mourners. Kinokren! Isbel cried out. Her hands began to radiate a fierce light that blinded both dwarves and Lyrians alike. Have you lost your minds, all of you, together? Not had your fill of misfortune yet? Lower your arms at once. Whether the power of Isbel's magic or the force of her appeal had the greater effect is difficult to say for certain. Either way, both sides suddenly lost the desire to fight. Meave breathed a sigh of relief, aware that if not for Isbel's intervention, a great amount of blood would have been spilled at that cemetery. Knew there'd be a stink cause of this. The Lyrians ascended the highest section of the Mahakam range. Snow crunched under their boots, cold air stung their lungs, and the wind snapped at their cloaks. <sighs> Meave wiped sweat from her brow and turned to Raynard. There! By the rocks! We shall... The rest of her words were drowned out by a powerful blast. The entire mountain rumbled with a low, vibrating roar. The sound grew louder, echoing off the rocks, splitting their ears. The Lyrians looked around, disoriented. Few heard Gabor's warning. Did I just stand there? Get behind the rock! Quick! Hurry! Meave followed the dwarf's gaze and cried out in terror. The snow stuck to the mountainside had started to slide down the slope, sending up mists of icy dust. Before she could react, the white torrent knocked her to her knees, crushing her and smothering her into the ground. 
All she felt after that was all-encompassing cold and fear. Meave survived. The dwarves who ran to the Lyrian's rescue dug her out of the snow in time. Some of her soldiers were not so lucky. The queen looked at their bodies, blue, frozen. Next to them lay dead horses, demolished wagons. The losses were enormous. Meave wiped her cheek. Her tears burned her frozen skin. Gabor spoke a while with the leader of the Mahakam Guard Patrol that had come to their rescue. His face was dour. What? What have you learned? Uh, I'll tell you all in good time. First, you need a warm drink, good victuals. No, Gabor. I need to find out what in blazes happened here. Well, it was an avalanche. Of course it was an avalanche. I'm no fool. But what caused it? What was that noise? Um, <clears throat> Signal horns. Ours. So you brought this snow down on us. Dwarves! Well, I, but, uh, unawares. I'm extremely curious how one sounds a horn without being aware of it. That must be quite a sight. Meave, let me explain. I will. And the explanation better not sound like a clumsy excuse. See, we clean our mount regularly. The, the, the way men folk shovel snow off their roofs. Otherwise, the whole shebang would come tumbling down in our heads. When snow's gathered deep enough, we'd blast our horns to cause a controlled avalanche. Then we need to, but, sweep up a wee bit and the road's safe. All well and good, but why did you decide to clean up right as I was passing through? I'm wondering that myself. Schedule says next cleaning should have been a week from now, but someone has the route to be cleared earlier. Who? Meave, I'll tell you. But first, promise you'll... Who? Hey. Ovin Ip Klenvok, the Nilfgaardian emissary. Think it were meant as revenge for attacking their caravan. The bastard. Reynard. Reynard! Wait! Wait! I understand you're a wee bit upset. You've every right. But you'll never prove Ovain meant you harm. The sly weasel will make sure he didn't dirty his own paws. I've no such scruples. I'll find him and kill him. And then? How'd you tell that tale to Bruva? Meave, you're justly taught, but for the love, just this once, let it go. Or you'll leave Mahakam with near a scrap to show for it. Moments later, scouts reported Ovain was camped to the north of the accident site. Meave had to decide how much she was willing to risk to get her revenge on the Imperial Emissary. By the Elder Sideburns, I had no notion anyone was in the Vale. There, my lady, whispered one of the scouts. Left of the path. Meave squinted. The Nilfgaardians had taken shelter from the falling snow under a rocky outcropping. The smell of roasting meat wafted from their campfire, and echoes of laughter could be heard. The black-clad soldiers had reason to celebrate. They had just decimated Meave's company without even drawing their weapons. Meave's gaze caught something else. A metal container into which the Nilfgaardians tossed bones once they'd been gnawed clean. It looked strangely familiar. Only after a moment did the Queen understand it was an overturned Lyrian helmet dug out of the snowy grave of one of her men. The Horsons! Meave hissed. They'll pay for this. Meave! Asking your last time keep a cool heat! Whispered Gabor. You want vengeance? I get it. But think of the cost. If so much as a hair gets plucked from Ovain's head, Bruver will never forgive you. And you can kiss any hope of aid goodbye. Silence followed. Finally to be broken by one of the scouts. Milady, what's the order? Do we attack? No, said the Queen after long deliberation. But Milady, they... I know what they did, and that I shall never forget nor forgive, said Meave. 
placing a hand on her scout's shoulder. But breaking Dwarven law only plays into the North Guardian's hand, causing us to lose allies and our chance for victory. Meave brushed the snow from her trousers and straightened her spine. Avenge our comrades we shall. Not here, but in the fields of Lyria and Rivia. The Lyrians resumed their march with heavy, beleaguered steps. Their path still piled high with the snow brought down by the Nilf Guardians. While passing the mining settlement of Kolstok, Meave heard the sounds of battle. Hey ho! Into the fray, lads! Expecting she would see monsters swarming dwarves, the Queen set off at a gallop to the rescue. Her braid blew about in the wind like a banner, showing her men in which direction to attack. The dwarves she saw, however, were not engaged in a battle against Shalemars and Barbigazis. No, they were going at one another. Luckily, no weapons had yet been drawn, but given the dwarves have hands the size of bread loaves, this did not necessarily mean there would be no deaths. Oi, lads! roared Gabor Zigrin. What's this foolishness? Calm the hell down, damn it! Gabor's intervention proved successful. The dwarves limited themselves to verbal jousting. Meave, who was no stranger to barrack room talk, nonetheless turned crimson at the dwarves' cursing. Piecing together the obscenities, Meave concluded they were debating an old quarrel about the height of a certain mountain, or rather of the twin peaks atop it. One of them lay in the territory of Clan Dahlberg, while the other in the Hoog's land. Each family felt their peak was the highest, all measurements indicating the contrary being total fabrications. Queen! started Gabor, nervously chewing his moustache. They're asking if you... As yin impartial and a fair-minded wench to boot, wouldn't he wish to settle their idiot squabble once and for all? Meave knew well that this type of age-old quarrel could easily end in bloodshed, so she resolved to help. Representatives of the two clans gave her a strange mechanism she was to use to measure elevation. All that was left was for the queen to button her coat up to the neck and scale the Twin Peaks. When she and her force had travelled half the way to the first, she heard a long roar that made snow shelves detach and descend. Without waiting for her scouts to return with reports, Meave drew her sword. The Lyrians managed to repel the monsters and reach both peaks. Upon each, Meave ordered her men to take the measurements. While waiting, she admired the breathtaking view of the Mahakaman Massif. The dwarven contraption left no room for doubt. The peak within the Dahlberg clan territory was two feet higher than that within Hoog territory. Gabor was clearly displeased with the results. Oh, damn it all! I'd hope you'd prove Bruver's clan was in the right. He'd have been content to see the Dahlbergs knock down a peg or two, and possibly he'd have been more inclined to help you, said the dwarf in frustration. Then, after a pause, he added, only you saw what the device showed, Queen. Perhaps you could, uh, recalibrate the results a wee bit? To lie would be simple, true, said Meave. Yet to forget the matter would be so much harder. No, Gabor, I shall tell the truth. The Queen's tone made it clear the discussion was over. Gabor let the matter lie, and Meave's force began its descent down the mountainside. The dwarves of both clans had been waiting with bated breath for the expedition's return and report. As soon as Meave announced the results, the Dahlbergs rolled barrels of beer out into the square and began to celebrate. Naturally, the Hoogs were disappointed, yet they accepted Meave's results as final. At last, they had come to trust her. Dahlbergs are the dwarves we need! Hooks are thunder heat. As Meave neared Langbridge, she ordered her bugler to announce her arrival, then retired to her tent to freshen up. Gascon was already inside, awaiting her. I do not seem to recall summoning you. In that case, I must tell you to fret not. Nothing wrong with your memory. I've come with no agenda. Spontaneously, call it, to chat. Hmm. Then I propose you leave. Just as spontaneously call it. 
I must don fresh clothes. I'm to see the elder soon, and I'd prefer to not smell of horse sweat. Doubt it'd make much difference to him. And be assured, I know what I speak of. When last we met, I found myself standing downwind of him. A pungent experience. Well, Hugh was saved the experience of his breath. So pungent I thought I might faint. Well, to revive you, pinch you awake, I'm sure would be quite a pleasure. Gascon, I beg your pardon. Ugh, I shall have nightmares now. Not tonight, for I fear you might not sleep at all. You see, there's something you ought to know, and decidedly before you meet with Bruva. The sights we cleared of beasts, I ferreted a bit, noted something peculiar. Any notion what it was? None. The monumental dwarven architecture, perhaps? Bones, my dear Meave. Dwarven bones. Now, guess what I found on them? Wait, don't dare give me any hints. Bite marks. Of course. After all, they'd been gnawed clean of all flesh by monsters, incidentally making it quite easy to spot other markings. Ones made by axes and swords. To be certain, I showed the bones to our medics, and they confirmed my conclusion. Meaning what? That the entire clan, the Fuchses... ...did not perish due to an invasion of beasts from the depths. The monsters merely ate the bodies and occupied empty homes. Now, I shared my discovery with Gabor, and guess what he did? He panicked. He started to squirm, babble nonsense. I wager my right arm, he's hiding something. Blast. Overly eager to aid us from the start he was. I might have sent something. I shall have him summoned at once. And I thank you, Gascon. I won't forget this. Minutes later, Gabor stood before the Queen. At first, he tried to mislead her with evasive answers, but as her pointed questions demolished one clumsy excuse after another, he had to give in. Oi. As King Desmond said after a hefty squirt in his hose, we can't sweep this under the rug. If you think I welcome jests in this moment, you err. My fingers itch to summon the hangman. Right. So... <sighs> It is true. I misled you. But on our clan elder's orders, supposed to make sure you destroyed Burr's rump and Davor's abyss thoroughly enough to leave nay a trace. What? Why? What did they wish to hide? They was home to the Fuchses, our mortal enemies. They'd been a boil in our hineys for ages, thumbing their noses, taking what they want when they want, and the elder in chief didn't give a ploughing wit. So to stop them, our clan, we did the unpardonable. The Zigrin elders saw their chance and they... Gods. So you were responsible for the deaths of all those dwarves? Me? I, I, I didn't raise a finger. Tried to stop them, in fact. No witnesses survived. Meaning you must have murdered the entire clan. How? Queen, you sure you... I am. And you should be sure to answer in full, omitting no detail. A few years back, we got pummeled by a horrendous winter. Stone-breaking frosts, white-out storms, avalanches. Made travelling a painful form of suicide. Hunger drove beasts out of their dens. Pass was covered in the filth. Got to where they paced right outside the walls. Fuchses fought a hard, bloody fight to keep the critters out of Davar's abyss. Lost near every axe-wielding dwarf they had. Only survivors had to winter at Burr's Rump. Her elders felt such an opportunity wouldn't they knock again. After killing the town's meagre guard, they... They set fire to it and barricaded the gates. They... They didn't stand a chance. Bastards. 
How in the world did the truth go undiscovered? Once it were over, our dwarves opened the gates. Before they'd let their pipes, starving beasts came crawling out of the pass. The stank of dead flesh were strong. Zigrins who came back from that never were the same. If you'd only gandered their gaze when they had us all take a vow of silence. And then... You invented that blarney about primeval monstrosities the Fuchses had awoken by mining too deep. A riveting tale, and one with a moral to boot. Aye. But the Elders worried Bruver would suspect something all the same. That's why they wanted you to destroy all the evidence. Repugnant. You claim not to have taken part, but neither did you do anything to stop the massacre. What was I to do, exactly? The Elders had decided. Nay, a dwarf would listen to me. You might have informed the Elder-in-Chief. The guilty would have been punished. The guilty? You didn't ken Bruva. He'd punish the whole clan. Women, children. Nay exceptions. Maeve. Queen. I'm begging you. He canna ever learn of this. Aye, I want a hack flame too when I think what the Elder's done. But t'other way it'd bring but more pain and death. You've got a lot of nerve, making requests after lying to me. Trying to ensure you ken the stakes. But... You'll do as you see fit. Like always. I need to consider what's right. Meanwhile, Gascon, make sure Gabor remains our guest. Of course. I'll let you know if he so much as rolls his eyes towards an escape route. Bruva stood by the bridge like a statue, arms crossed, eyes squinting. Meave sighed inside. She stood little chance of having a pleasant chat. Elder-in-Chief, sir. No Saren and Grayson here, lass. Ploughed humans. Always out to fix things, always end up cocking them up. You think you're due glory, do you? Monster Slayer Meave? Patroness of Dwarves? Blast it. What do you think? Why didn't I exterminate those beasts myself, eh? Go on, tell me. For you. For I didn't want to. For something didn't fit, damn it. So I resolved to not destroy their nests and evidence till I learned the truth of who done it. Postponed it all those years expressly. Though your subjects were dying. I didn't need no lectures from the likes of you. Justice must be served. That's worth any price. And I was close. Had leads. And now it's all gone to hell. You flooded Devore's abyss. You brought Boros rump down on itself. And I'll never ken who killed the Fuchses. Understand? Never! I would not be so sure. Sure of bloody what? That you shall never learn the truth. For I learnt it just moments ago. Twas the Zigrins who killed the Fuchses. The si Zigrins? But, hold, hold. I would explain a lot, that. Ah, the snakes, worms, rogues. Why, I'll show them. All right. Got to admit you've more in that pretty heat of yours than I expected. But dinner you start thinking we'll be toasting a new friendship. You want our aid? You'll have to answer our questions. My questions. Lots of them. And they're all hard, so dinner you go smiling at me yet. Why, I wouldn't dare. Better not. Right. Time we moved on. Bruva set off at a brisk pace, paying Meave nor anyone else heed. The Elder's bodyguards rushed after him, then came the Lyrian force, and at its end trudged Gabor Zigrin, hands and feet in shackles. Dwarves demonstrate innovative thinking in many domains. Metallurgy, engineering, architecture. Yet there is one in which they could not be bothered. Naming. For this reason, the bridge that linked the Mahakam Pass with Mount Carbon 
was simply named Langbridge. Meave learned it was a thoroughly fitting name. Having stopped for a breath halfway across the road suspended over a deep chasm, the Queen could see neither end of the bridge, both concealed by thick clouds. Amazing, whispered the Queen. I feel as though we traverse the very sky. The Queen and her retinue were nearing Mount Carbon when Meave heard a cry. It was Xavier. Hold! Hold! Meave drew in her reins abruptly. Her mare neighed and reared, lifting the Queen above her formation of men. From that height, she saw the last pier of the bridge crumbling. The dwarves at the head of the procession were unable to stop in time and plummeted, screaming into the abyss. What's the meaning of this, God damn it? Bruva roared. Face the engineers, now! The queen was striving to calm her spooked mount when she sent something swish past her ear. Out of nowhere, a Scoia'tael band had appeared at the rear of the column. Before anyone could react, elven archers had felled the rear guard. The soldiers lay on the bridge's stone surface with arrows in their backs. Espa en reina! Meave was trapped. In one direction lay the chasm, in the other, a fierce foe. She had no choice but to stand and fight. At last, Rena! You are mine! We're trapped, Your Grace, but we can try and fight our way through. Ah, think you poor bags can do whatever the devils you please? This is Mahakam! No! Let her in! She must die! Their strength combined, the Lyrians and Dwarves managed to defeat the Scoia'tael. The gorillas had weakened the last span of the bridge, turning the crossing into a deadly trap. Had Xavier, who noticed the weakened structure at the last instant, not called out, all would have fallen into the chasm. The Lyrians managed to capture the unit commander. She stood, her head raised high, and when Meave glared at her, she did not avert her eyes. What is your name, Elf? Abayat me parst one. She said, uh... Thank you, Reynard. I know well what she said. Kiss my ass. Is that truly the best you can muster? I'd rather show you exactly what I can muster. Tell them to unbind me. You got your opportunity. On the battlefield. Will you not tell me what they call you? Fine. It's all the same to me. I'm more interested to know how you came to be here. Who sent you? No one. It was my decision to kill you, and thus avenge Eldane. Do you remember him? The elf whom you denied a burial, whom you left in an open field to rot? You've elven blood on your hands, the blood of the elves of the Mulderwood. I regret the events of the Mulderwood. I did not wish those elves deaths. Yet they left me no choice. What choice would you give a murderer who invaded your home? <sighs> you know I envy you. To see the world solely as black or white, it must simplify things so. Enough. I've heard all I wish to hear. But I haven't. Did you fall on your heed, elf, eh? If you want to fight humans, go on and do it. You cannot talk sense to Egypts and nay here, damn it. Mahakam is and will be neutral. You cannot be neutral. To Dwan, you are either their foe or their dog. Mahakam has stood aside sleeping long enough. That is why we struck it in its very heart. As a call to battle. A call to brethren whom you, Elder, have kept from the world too long. I have kept him away. I've been bloody right to do so. You want to play at war, you numpties? You want to force the Pontar to flow upstream? Gang right ahead! Good riddance, I say! Gun kill, gun die if you fancy! But God damn it, leave us alone! Yeah, I should kill you! With my own hands! I should cut your throat, put you out of your misery! That's what you want, in it? To die? To die a stupid death? Well, I'll not grant you that. Nay, nay, I'll lock you in a tower. Sit there three centuries, and you just might grow a brain. 
Bruva Hoog gazed after the shackled elf as she was led away. Neve expected him to continue fuming, cursing her. But the dwarf stood silent. And his old eyes, half concealed by brows bushy as a forest floor, showed not anger, but the deepest sadness. Dwarven engineers made quick work of repairing the crumbled bridge span. Look, Mount Carbon. Damn, and I thought Novograd was big. The Lyrians stepped inside Mount Carbon's bowels. Neve rode while looking upwards, admiring the intricately carved ceiling, gilded walls, monumental bas-reliefs carved from basalt. Yet this was no time to admire the sights. Bruva Hoog had summoned her to speak. I thank you for your invitation, Elder. My invitation? Choice term, lass. You wangled your way in here. Long I've lived. But ne'er have I seen a wench so stubborn. With all due respect, do you not feel like a pot conversing with a kettle? Ha! <laughs> True enough. Changes of mind didn't come easy to me. But they do come at times. Human wars concern me not at all. For so many they are, who could count them? Ne a year goes by without one wanking king invading another's realm. A dog with scabies is less restless. That's why this morning I aimed to send you off with nothing. Mattered not what the clans were saying. Revia, Shmevia, who gives a sheep's fart? But that was this morn, before that daft wench and her pups attacked. Nilfgaard supports the Scoyatel, it's common knowledge. Nilfgaard uses them. Well, I'm nay worse, and I choose to use Queen Meave. I shall be no one's tool, Bruva. I fight for my land and my land alone. Lyria and Rivia. Ah, keep your heat. You can fight for a free war field, far as I'm concerned. Doesn't matter. My aid does not come with conditions. Like to give Nilfgaard a warning, you can. If you're going to rile my dwarves, throw them into the Scoyatel ranks. You'll regret it, eh? But I'd like to issue the warning without declaring war. All clear to you so far. So, when you march out of Mahakam, you'll find a company of our foot dwarves waiting out with the gate. Officially, volunteers enlisting with you against my will. And you're to put them at the fore next time you face Nilfgaard. Want the black lads to break their teeth on our bucklers, get a taste of our axe blades. After that, dare say they'll think twice before they send more Scoyatel into these hells. I do not. Thank you, Elder. You restore my hope that I shall have my home back in the end. Faith can move mountains, I. But it can't do much about borders. I've watched you close, and must admit you're a plucky lass. That enough of Nilfgaard? Can I be sure? We will see. We shall know soon. I would like to march at once. So by your leave? Nay, <laughs> not granted. At once? What's that mean? Our laws are clear. Guests are to be sent off with a thundering feast, even the humans. Bruva, as was Bruva's wont, insisted. So the Queen accepted the invitation, but as was her wont, set a condition. The feast was to last but one night and not, as was the wont of local custom, an entire week. All clans were to be represented at the feast, save one, of course, the Zigrins. For they had already learned their punishment. The entire clan was banished from Mahakam. An exception was made for one of their number, for Gabor, who was beheaded before the day was done. When the sun had retired behind the peaks, the underground city came alive with the sound of bugles, bagpipes and horns. The dwarves emerged out into the central square and danced exuberantly, sparks kicking up from their hobnail boots. 
the usually crabby Elder-in-Chief Hoog proved a cordial host that evening. Let's drink! Lest our neck shafts grow cobwebs! Suddenly a messenger arrived. Bruver lifted his copper horn to his ear and listened with furrowed brow. What's that? Speak up! When she saw a sour grin on his face, Meave knew the tidings were not good. Yet she did not suspect they pertained to her directly. Meave, you expecting anyone? How's that? Runner says a delegation's arrived at Carbon, Freluria and Rivia. Got a Nilf Guardian escort. How dare they? Traitors. Who leads it? Uh, you'd best sit. Who leads the delegation? It's your son, Willem, I fear. Willem? Markham remains neutral as regards all your squabbles. I trust I needn't remind you. So I'll have no scrambling nor shoving, and certainly no bloodshed. Point of fact, I'd prefer it if you... I wish to speak to him. I'd forbid you, but, as I said, never seen a more stubborn wench. All righty then, jabber away with him. Just remember, hands to yourself. Meave spotted banners, a Lyrian eagle upon one surrounded by Nilfgaard's black rags. Her hands became fists, showing how helpless she felt. Then her son and rival, Willem, emerged from behind a row of Imperial footmen. My, my. I should apologize. It seems I missed the coronation. Congratulations, my son. Who was it who placed the crown? General Epdahi? Count Caldwell. Ah, yes. Our elder statesman. Why have you come here, of all places? To acquire arms for Nilfgaard? As my official mission, yes. Yet unofficially, I wish to speak with you. I trust you've had tidings from the field. Edern turned to ash and dust. Vizimir murdered Redania in chaos. Faltus forced to strike a pact by his vassals betrayed. Hensult the same. This limerick, will it come to a point? Why, yes. To the same as this war. Mother, I beg you, you must see it. N Nilfgaard's victory is inevitable. Surrender now, and I shall show you mercy. For later... Later, it'll be too late. There will be no later. We shall repel them, drive them south at the points of our pikes. This we, Mother, who precisely do you mean? You stand alone. An impression many might have indeed. Yet I've allies. Those long loyal, and those new. Where, Mother? In Zeracania? For here, in the north, why? There are none. The fight is done. Your friends from Nilfgaard will learn that is simply not true, when their ignorance bites them in the arse. So you aim to persist? Whatever for? For our freedom. For independence. Curious. I could have sworn it was for your ambition, to soothe your wounded pride. When I was crowned, a fact you deride, though that makes it no less true, I swore the good of my subjects would guide me. And a war we are doomed to lose cannot in any way benefit them. And slavery can. You know well the Blacklads put peasants in chains, like cattle. Reprehensible, I agree, but... And resettlement? Forced labour? Cruel laws that make death the punishment for the slightest offences? Are those benefits? Well, answer me! I see I will not sway you, Mother. A shame, though I take comfort in the fact I tried. And now, adieu. Oh no, I, not you, will decide when this conversation is over. Oh, have we anything else to discuss? Are you perhaps aware that the Nilfgaardians tried to kill me? What? No, I... I... I heard only about an avalanche. Which tumbled down through no small effort of an Imperial envoy. Never would I have agreed to such a heinous act. I believe you. I'm heartened that despite all we... I believe you, because I believe the Nilfgaardians wouldn't ever have asked your opinion. 
Think on it, son. Are you their ally or their tool? Can you ever be sure? I am the king of Lyria and Rivia. To serve my subjects' best interests, I am prepared to make even the most painful concessions. Might I leave now? Or is there more? Naturally. How did you know you would find me here? I... I received Nilfgaardian reports to the effect that you've been seen in the pass. Oh, roses are red and so are your cheeks, my son. As ever when you're caught in a lie. Lyria is two weeks' travel hence. Had you received word only once I was here, we'd have been long gone from Mahakam by the time you assembled a force and completed the march. No. You were forewarned of our intended route. It means I've a traitor in my ranks. Another one. Get out of my sight, villain. And pray we only ever face one another on neutral ground. Meave struggled inside not to turn and gaze once more at her son. He'd changed since they'd last faced each other, grown manlier, and he wore the crown well. The Queen returned to the banquet hall. Her advisers shot her questioning glances, curious what she had discussed with Bruva. But Meave decided to keep the details to herself. One of them wore a Nilfgaardian lead around his neck. Until she knew who, she would have to remain vigilant. Feasting's done, Reynard. We must consider our next move. I've thought on it, Your Grace. We've strength enough to hit the foe, but still not the numbers to face him in open battle. So what do you propose? This war we cannot win alone, nor even with the dwarves at our side. But if we secure a victory, small yet symbolic, we shall show the other realms of the North all is not yet lost. Thus, I propose we attack behind the front lines. Somewhere well clear of any major Imperial force. Where would you suggest? I'm considering Angren. To begin with, a thickly wooded marshy land, always helpful in clandestine operations. Secondly, the land strategically important, as it's the chief source of building material for Nilfgaard's fleets. All too little, I fear. Since we require a victory that would be symbolic, we must strike where it shall hurt, and Angren... Just recently welcomed a new regent in the person of Count Coldwell, my third argument. Naturally, if your majesty wishes, I'm prepared to present alternatives to this. No need. We march at dawn. Meave had toiled, cajoled, persuaded, and gained the dwarves' support. She left Mahakam strengthened, markedly. Even so, the Queen was in a foul mood, for it was clear a traitor, a viper, nested among the Lyrians. Someone who had conveyed the Queen's plans to her foe. From this moment on, Meave would need to weigh every word she uttered, even in the presence of her closest associates. Your Grace, we must plot our course forward. Shall we take the Western Passage into Angren, or...? Not now. When, then? Dawn approaches, yet we know nothing of where... I will not repeat myself. The Queen knew she would learn the traitor's identity in the end. If need be, she would tear the name from the throat of another turncoat, Count Caldwell. Meave drooled at the prospect of seeing Caldwell in chains, then passing him to the hangman. Saddle the horses. I shall take the four. The time for diplomacy, for preparations and negotiations had gone. Meave was to attack her foe at last, and she could not wait to do so. At long last, Meave's force reached Angren's marshy woods. Ever been? No. Count yourselves lucky. Are you certain we haven't lost our way? Alas, here there is no way. We continue south, that's all. South meaning the bottom. Should you ever venture there, I offer you this advice. Do your utmost to make no noise. Poor soul. His comrades cried out, reached out. But alas, amidst frothing waters, they heard bones cracking, the moan of metal bent and crushed. 
What the bloody hell, what was that? Rather not know, personally. Hold your positions. Arms at the ready. It was a glusty walk. One of many the Lyrians would encounter along their path. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. At last, Meave and her force stood upon the Yaruga's bank. To find and punish the traitor Caldwell, they would have to cross the river. Yet the sole bridge nearby was in Nilfgaard's hands. Reynard, you fought in the first war against Nilfgaard, did you not? Yes, Your Grace. Though, as a mere captain then. Were they equally cruel? Did they scorch fields? Turn peasants into slaves? No, Your Grace. They fought with honor in those days. So, what's happened? Why the change? It said Emperor Emir Va Emrys's heart hardened over the years. He's grown crueler, more ruthless. His soldiers' zeal for violence has followed suit. But you don't say that. No, Your Grace. To your mind, why do they now despise us as they war against us? It is ever easier to loathe those you know. Before the first war, they knew nothing about us. Then they saw they'd the better weapons, larger cities, superior craft. But in our towns, waste flowed through the streets in open gutters. And they concluded we weren't their equals. It's far easier to kill when one holds such a belief. Hey ho, how's my favorite queen in the north? Ever have regrets? Feel remorse? For what? Oh, I don't know. Killing innocents, perhaps? Murdering travelers, pilgrims? I've always warned them. Won't touch a hair on your heads, provided you don't resist. So, see? Gave them a choice. Besides, innocents? Please, Meave. We both know those to be mythical creatures. Everyone's got something on their conscience. So there's always call for murder? That's right. Dead right. You need but answer it. Yes, milady. I haven't had the opportunity to thank you. Had you not been so alert, we'd have fallen to our deaths in Mahakam. I merely did my duty, Your Majesty. <laughs> Modest as ever. Yet once the war is over, I shall make certain you're properly rewarded. My lady, the one reward I desire is victory. Your victory. Other matters await my attention. We shall speak later. As you wish, my lady. Hidden among brambles, Meave watched the Nilfgaardian sentries atop the palisade. In full gear, alert in stance, they looked sharp and ready to defend the stronghold. Blast! Meave hissed, for she now knew Red Lobindon would not fall by surprise. A siege would be needed, and it would slow her advance. Yet there was naught she could do, as this was her one road to Angren and to Caldwell. Reynard wiped the sweat from his brow, donned his helmet, and dropped his visor with a tap. On your command, Your Majesty. Very well. We mustn't delay. Reynard, our plan of attack. Armoured infantry to lead and take the first salvo upon their breast, scaling ladders to follow. Afterwards... Masterful. Truly masterful. Interrupted Gascon. Yet, despite the mastery, fit to be improved. How namely? Hold back your force. Lie in waiting. I'll take ten good men and open the gates for you. Wide. And how do you aim to achieve this? Asked Reynard. Knock, and claim to be a trinket peddler, I suppose. Or perhaps one of Lebioda's devout disciples. Must you know every last detail? Where's the fun in that, sir? There's none in warfare. Never. Seethed Reynard. For war is no farce. Your Majesty, he stands no chance. Not the slightest. None at all, I concur. Yet his eagerness intrigues. Let's see what he can do. Reynard did not approve of Meave's decision, this was clear. Yet he dared not undermine it. The Queen's blessing now his, Gascon assembled a small force and set off straight for the stronghold gate. Lambs to the slaughter, muttered Reynard, shaking his head. My Queen, it's not too late. We can always... Shh! Look. 
Already at the gate, Gascon lifted his arm in a gesture of peace, then merrily bantered a bit with the guards. A moment later, the gates jerked into motion. But how? No matter. The gate stands open. We must attack. Meave raced off towards the fortress without even glancing back. She knew well her soldiers would follow. The strays have come to play! One red lobindon for you, milady. Compliments of the house. Gascon seemed a fiend as he fought his way to the keep, then single-handedly killed the commander. Suddenly leaderless, the Nilfgaardians laid down their arms. My, my, Gascon. Colour me surprised. Pleasantly so, I trust. Don't fish for compliments, it doesn't suit you. Besides, you know you deserve both medal and title. Ha ha ha! I shall hold you to it, my queen. In due course. But I must know how. What ruse persuaded the North Guardians to open the gate? Come, come, my delightful charms, no ruse. Oh, I see. Not one to share secrets. Unremarkable, as I see it. I'd hold my tongue too, were my conscience thus burdened. I've done now to hide my shameful past, friend. I was a brigand, indeed, yet... Do not dare take me for a fool. You know of what I speak. Yet I don't. Reynard, what is this? What the devils is with you? Your Grace, in Mahakam, the Nilfgaardian letter we managed to intercept. Consider your offer accepted. Direct Meave and her force to the agreed site. We await their arrival. Your reward shall be as agreed. It was Gascon who told us Caldwell had received Angren to rule. It was Gascon who suggested we ride for Lobindon. Here, the Blackclads willingly opened the gate, for they expected him to deliver a prisoner. You! I don't... I don't believe this. No, it, it cannot be. Deny it, Gascon. Go on. Tell me I'm wrong. Do you require any more proof, Your Grace? What do they promise you? Amnesty? Coin in heaps? Ah, both. I knew Nilfgaard wouldn't parley with me as a matter of course. To be treated seriously, I needed something they valued. A stroke of luck, it was, the chance to free you from Coldwell's grip. It was in Edurn that we first spoke, then came to an understanding after Rosberg's fall. Why do I still live then? Why not snatch me under Knight's mantle, drag me to Red Lobindon in chains? Meave, I sought to sell you out, I did, and aimed to gain by it. Yet in Edurn, you earned my respect. In Mahakam, my admiration. I swore then. I wouldn't follow the terms of the accord I'd made. Instead, I'd let you into the fort and make damn sure the Commandant couldn't reveal the truth. Alas, seems I underestimated Reynard. Flattery will get you nout. You, sir, are a traitor. Oh, please, friend. You appear to me a pot that calls the kettle black. Reynard? What does he mean? I've no notion, Your Grace. Not the slightest. Truly? <laughs> and I had you pegged for a man of honor. Come now, Reynard. Who sent secret missives to Willem? Go on, you really should tell your queen. What? Reynard? His Highness guest chambers in Mahakam. One of my lads snuck in. Found a letter bearing the signature of one Reynard Odo. Reynard, I beg you. Say it's not so. Tell me it's a filthy lie. Uh, I, uh, Your Grace. I'd hoped His Highness and you would reconcile. To see son stand against mother rent my heart. I, 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 I wish to help. Behind my back. Your Majesty. I sought merely to push the youth to see reason. To open his eyes. 
So say you now. Yet I can't know what was in the letters. I can't know what pacts you made. And alas, I can no longer take you at your word. I'm not alone in having deceived. Yet I am in repairing my wrong. Me felt a tempest rise inside her. Yet she could not release it lest it cloud her view. She would solve the problem, strike it from her mind, and resume her journey at once. Drawn and quartered I should have you both. Yet in truth, I cannot do without your aid. Now more than ever. Tis the one reason I show mercy and forgive. Your Grace, perhaps made with doubt, but tis the right decision. I shall prove it. Thank you. Reynard and I rarely see eye to eye. But under the circumstances, I second his every word. Oh, shut your damn traps. And I believe you're needed in the wagon train. Now! The Queen's wish was clear and fierce. Gascon and Reynard slid off, leaving Meave to her thoughts. From the Palisades rampart, Meave gazed out over the marshlands across the Aruga. The Queen sighed deeply. She expected great challenges in Angren. She had also expected, even hoped, to find the one traitor in her midst. But two, and both her close aides de camp. She felt a weight upon her heart now. Blasted all, she muttered. Not the first dagger I've taken in the back. Likely not the last either. Yet to pity my lot will help not at all. From the captive Nilfgaardians, Meave learned Caldwell was a Tuzla castle, in Angren's very heart. A small detachment would remain at Red Lobindon, while the Queen, with the rest of her force, set off to face the treacherous Count. Your Grace, I wished once more to express my gratitude for your show of mercy. I showed mercy, true, but felt much more. Anger, pain, now resentment. You hurt me, Reynard, wounded me to the bloody core. I don't know what else to say on the matter, so let's not speak of it. As you wish, Your Grace. It's time I attended to other matters. Uh, Maeve, I must say it again, I'm sorry. And I thank you for forgiving me. No need to say any more, Gascon. But you've got to know. Every time you bring it up, I'm tempted to change my mind. Now let's turn to the task at hand. I'm pleased to see you again, ma'am. You need something? You wish to speak with me? In private? Yes, ma'am. I've given thought to certain matters. The time's come to explain and reveal my decisions. I've not been entirely honest, but I've seen you very much deserve the truth. You're brave, wise, and above all, You've a good heart, and thus you're unlike any other ruler I've ever met, had dealings with. Isabel, what is it you wish to say? You're starting to worry me. I told you of Sintra and Sodden. Do you recall? It's true, I took part in that war. Yet, I fought for the Empire. What? I'm not certain I understand. My name is Isbel Ep Muirmos, of Nilfgaard. I wish I could say I am from a conquered province. I wish I had that luxury. But no, I hail from the city of the Golden Towers itself. My, I'd certainly not expected that. Please, tell me more. I went straight from the academy to the army as Majors do in Nilfgaard. Yet I truly believed our aim to be to build a better world. With our help, the Majors, the Emperor conquered realm after realm, right up to the Amal Mountains. Yet he was not sated and turned his greedy eyes to the North. But the North stood and faced him. I'll never forget the bloodbath he wrought in Sintra it was 
Unspeakable. He sought to intimidate us. He united us instead. Indeed. At Sodden, when chaos engulfed the Imperial Army, I saw my chance to flee the madness and begin life anew. And I did just that. I never sought thereafter to rejoin my countrymen or return to my home. Instead, I stayed in the north and swore never again to use my magic to harm others. Yet I cannot stand idle as the Emperor perpetrates atrocity after atrocity. I wish to fight at your side. All deserve a second chance. Yet from now on, there are to be no more secrets between us. Certainly. I thank you. You've no idea what this means to me. Good. Oh, and Isbel. This must stay between us alone. For your own sake. I appreciate the concern, ma'am. But you needn't worry about me. I've lived for some time in the North. And dare say I know how to get by. The City of the Golden Towers. Don't think I know any soul who's seen it with her own eyes. Did you know many common folk believe they're made of real gold, the towers? Yet they're named for how the southern sun dances off their rooftops. My family lived in the capital long before Nilfgaard was ever an empire. The city is of great beauty, was always a source of pride, turned arrogance in time. When I was but a lass, my father would take me to the grand amphitheater to watch the gladiators fight. A daughter of Nilfgaard should grow accustomed to the sight of blood, he said, for to conquer the world was our destiny. Dreadful. You must have hated it. At the time, I saw nothing wrong in it. I admired the gladiators for their bravery, skill, finesse. Though now it shames me to admit it. Duty calls. I must go. Of course. Should you need me, I'll be here. No two ways to it. Charming this county the Blacklads granted Coldwell to rape. Yes, a gift so lovely Caldwell could not refuse. At Dahi, it seems, wished to be rid of the Count, so as to rule Lyria alone. I do wonder why they quarrelled. Caldwell wished to rule by Willem's hand, and by his claim. Of little benefit to Nilfgaard, so the General disapproved. As do I, by all means. The Lyrians came to a crossroads. As Meave and her scouts conferred about the proper path to take, a footman, of a sudden, collapsed upon the muddy ground. His comrades strove to rouse him. Alas, to no avail. Meave called for a medic. One arrived, post-haste. He checked for wounds, a heartbeat, all else for which a medic checks. Then he peered down the soldier's throat. In a flash, he was on his feet, his hand over his mouth, backing away. What's with him? What's wrong? The Queen asked, her eyes darting between the medic and his patient. Typhus exanthematicus, your grace. Replied the physician, wiping his hands with a spirit-soaked cloth. Typhus fever. Contagious? Extremely, I fear. Though not yet at this stage. The spots are but in his mouth for now. Tomorrow he'll be blotched all over. It's then the disease turns infectious. I see. What about a cure? Is one known? The medic looked at Meave, shook his head and shrugged. Alas, there was precisely naught he could do. But where medicine fails, magic may at times stand in. Without giving it two thoughts, Meave called for Isbel. It's Typhus, I've no doubt. The healer confirmed. I know a spell that could be helpful. Vigil's cleansing, we call it. It takes time to prepare and many ingredients. Rather costly, or... Coins no object, said Meave. Get to work at once. Isbel returned from the local herbalist with herbs valuable and rare. 
fern blossoms, mandrake root, comfrey seeds and more. She then pulled from her bundle a variety of vessels, funnels, retorts, alembics, carafes. Coloured concoctions she then brewed, steam and strange odours rising from them. Hours later, after much effort, she had a few drops of a thick substance in a flask. Isbel whispered an incantation, then gave the remedy to the dying man. His tremors and fever subsided at once, the other symptoms fading within hours. At last, Meave could breathe a deep sigh of relief. For no visible reason, the Lyrian column came to a halt. Meave stood in her stirrups in a bid to see the cause. Something had blocked the way, it seemed, something large. A tree felled by a storm, or an abandoned wagon, the Queen thought. Neither was true. A boulder huge as a barn lay in their path. Footmen had slung ropes around it, planted their feet, and now sought to pull it aside. It did not budge an inch. Perhaps I could assist you. Meave turned in her saddle on hearing the voice. Several travellers in faded robes warily crept from the trees. A young woman with long, light-coloured hair led the way. You don't much resemble a rock troll, said the Queen, eyeing the slender stranger sceptically. But go on, do try. The fair-haired lass crouched beside the stone, closed her eyes, and began to whisper. Horses wheeled and tugged at their reins. A hound howled in the distance. And then the boulder rolled to the side like an apple crossed the deck of a boat rocked by seas. Who are you? Do tell. A druid. Came her calm response. This stone. It stood in our circle. The woman silently turned toward the wood. Me followed her gaze, and among the trees saw other large stones, cracked and scorched. What happened here? We refused the Nilfgaardians' aid. Answered the druid. So they raised our shrines. Though, perhaps it's a blessing. A blessing? How so? A darkness fell upon Angren a time past. And it grows. The forest turns savage, its creatures drunk on blood. Folk have come to worship other cruel gods. It's time we abandoned this land forsaken and went south to Kedmerkvid. Our path leads south too, though not as far, said the Queen. Do join us. Given the times, there's safety in numbers. The druids agreed and were grateful. They walked at the rear of the column, muttering prayers, their faces concealed beneath hoods. Angren lies thousands of leagues from the sea. Yet the Imperial fleet looked chiefly to this land for wood, its ashes and oaks ideal for shipbuilding. The lumber was driven down the Yoruga to shipyards in Sintra and Atra. There, day and night, Nilfgaard's fleet grew and grew. So when Meave heard axes steadily hacking, the continual grind of saws, she halted her force and quickly dispatched scouts. Indeed, they found a lumber camp, banners overhead, the great sun blazing upon them. Though not critical to her mission, Meave was nonetheless tempted to disrupt the invader however she could. The Emperor awaits a mass flow of logs, called the Queen, drawing her sword. But we shall send him corpses! Formation! Follow me! When the Lyrians rushed forth with a cry on their lips, the lumberjacks dropped their axes. Their black-clad guards, though likewise surprised, formed up and stood ready for battle. Larvan! Essaytou Navin! Lyrian! Nilfgaard's ranks folded. Soldiers fled in fright, stumbling over felled trees and corpses. The air was heavy with the scent of resin and blood. As she caught her breath, the Queen looked about. Hundreds of trees lay cut down in rows. Oak and ash enough to keep the shipyards working till winter. Neve ordered the lumber requisitioned, yet one of the loggers approached her. A man with a face like old leather, sawdust in his hair. Good lady, I know you war hard against Nilfgaard. I know you'd keep timber out of their hands, but then see, we won't get paid. 
we'll see no coin till Sintra's shipyard see lumber. It's what the black lads said. I beg you, have mercy. We're simple folk. Been slaving since spring, got families to feed. And hunger looms ever close in wartime. Meave looked at the logger's hands. Thick scars, crisscrossed fingers twisted by years of axe work. This wood I cannot allow to reach Nilfgaardian shipyards, she said. Yet neither can I let you go hungry. I shall take the wood and pay you from my own purse. You've a big heart, my lady. Not many folk like you, especially not in Angren. <laughs> the land be deviled in many ways. Got blisters on me hands from all this work. Weren't enough the cones on me feet, ye gods. In the distance, Meave spotted a spindle-like shape, which soon proved an enormous, dark obelisk. It stood in the middle of a wetland clearing. Dozens of iron rings dangled from its shaft, clinking and rattling in gusts of wind. Cows, donkeys and dogs were gathered round the stone, all tied to the rings by ropes. Their hides showed many shallow cuts, seeping blood, festering, drawing mosquitoes in swarms. A number of the animals struggled against their cords, while others, near dead, lay still in the wet, tall grass. Across the clearing, folk emerged from the woods, a handful of peasants with a mule in tow. The beast resisted, stomped and planted its hooves, perhaps sensing its gruesome fate. The queen decided to question the peasants, and soon learned the animals were their sacrifice to the swamp gods. They're all about, dearie, very close. Oh, very, very close. The toothless old woman whispered. They hide neath murky waters, can't feed when they hear the drip drip of blood. The gods look kindly on those what make an offering. I know nothing of your gods, began the queen, her nose crinkled in disgust. But any that demand such grisly tribute are not at all worthy of reverence. What you do to these creatures is savagery. Savagery I can't allow. Run us off, you can, replied the old shrew. But as soon as you're gone, we'll come back. As ever, we'll come back. This I know. So I must take care to leave you now to come back to. Over the peasants' howls and pleas, Meave ordered the obelisk brought down. Her soldiers gripped the ropes that hung from it and toppled the shaft. As it hit the ground, it shattered into many smaller pieces. You say you know naught of our guts? The old woman's eyes narrowed, her voice grew darker still. Well, don't you worry your head, sweetie. You'll meet him soon enough. They'll tangle your parts. So a pox among you drive it to madness. Every last one. I curse you. All of you. In Gernacora's name. Undisturbed by the Haridan's scream threats, Meave rode on. But her men whispered long of the curse. It weighed on their minds, poisoned their hearts. Each misstep, misfortune, they saw as punishment for their sacrilege. Meave stood waiting while her scouts cut through the tangled branches and roots that had overgrown the trail through the swamp. Suddenly, a soldier doubled over and began to retch blood. The same symptoms soon afflicted others in her ranks. A potent poison, was the medic's verdict. It seemed all those who'd fallen ill had shared a tent. One night, they'd chatted about an obelisk they'd destroyed and the group of incensed peasants who'd cursed them for it. Fearing for their lives, the footman had gone to a local herbalist. She'd brewed them a potion to ward off black magic. Alas, the concoction had proved poisonous, while the herbalist had vanished without a trace. Happily, Isbel concocted an antidote in time to deliver the soldiers from a certain and agonizing death. The mage explained their misfortune had not issued from a dark, corrupt force, but from simple human wickedness. Her calming voice and gentle smile lifted the soldiers' spirits. Trusting in her care, they soon wholly forgot the so-called curse. 
In Angren, all decomposes, be it dead or very much alive. Rot blights trees, seeping sores torment beasts, and the whole swamp emits the acrid, stifling stench of decay. So when, in the swamp's distant corner, the Lyrians caught whiffs of smoke and roasted meat, they stopped dead in their tracks. The scouts followed their noses to a clearing framed by a palisade. Through the gaps in the posts, they spotted a small fort. Any banners upon it? Whose do you see? Asked the queen. There aren't none, your grace. Not one golden sun, not one silver lily. Meave gave the gate a few solid knocks with her shield. Moments later, a dozen armed men appeared atop the rampart. The one who led them wore a beard. Who are you? Why are you here? I'm Meave, Queen of Lyria and Rivia. At war with Nilfgaard, I ventured into these swamps. <laughs> Is there a war on? <laughs> hey, that's news. Certainly, but little concern to me. The name's Gimpy Gerwin, and I rule these lands. Is that so? As conferred upon you by whom? By me! <laughs> Angren's a good bit larger than folk think. And no duke's or emperor's finger stand to reach its every corner. Thus I just up and took this particular nook. Made it mine. So let's parley, Meave, one ruler to another. At the risk of being blunt, I don't care who wins this war, but I want to be in good standing with whoever does. So, I offer you a fire at which to warm your limbs. Also, a place at my table and beds for you to rest. On condition, you pledge to me one very small thing to respect the sacred laws of hospitality. So be it. I do solemnly swear before the gods and my ancestors that we shall honor all the laws of hospitality. <laughs> then you're most welcome inside. The fort was simple, built of logs, covered with thatch. Oh, but inside was warm, dry. Hot, steaming dishes were piled upon platters, the tables beneath them bent from their weight. Smiles appeared on her soldiers' drained faces, and Meave's spirits were lifted at last. Gerwin proved a cordial host, and eagerly shared both food and tales. He'd led a mercenary band, and they'd stumbled into Angren, discovered a land unclaimed by any feudal lord. He directed the fort, then united the surrounding villages under his very own rule. The folk here are savage, defiant, he said, sipping wine. I keep them on a tight lead for their own good. Elsewise they'd slit your throat first chance they got. Late that night, Meave went to see if her mare had been dressed. In the stable, she happened on a farmhand. Recognizing the queen, the man fell to his knees and averted his eyes. Meave noticed a strange object dangling from a rope around his neck. A human hand half rotted to the bone. What? What is that? My wife's hand, your grace, stammered the peasant. Lord Gerwin caught a sneak in some grub. Scraps, really. Took her and told me to wear it. So I'd remember what happens when... When... Meave left the stable without uttering another word. She went straight to the servants' barracks. In the pale glow of her torch, she looked over the peasants, all terrified, all with fresh, bleeding wounds. The queen felt rage rise inside her. The queen blew her horn. Lyrian soldiers filled the yard. They hastily donned their armor, strapped on their swords. Unsure of Meave's intentions, Gerwin's men likewise stood at the ready, weapons in hand. Gerwin! roared Meave. Get out here at once! The stout mercenary stood at his window, glaring from beneath his furrowed brow. I don't know what you think you're doing, he called. But I kindly remind you of your oath and the laws. I've seen your laws. You're strict and they're cruel. 
So your rule will end now. Attack! I didn't think a queen would so easily break her word. Ah! Remove this pile of manure from my sight. Lame as he was, Gerwin had been a mercenary. He fought hard, he fought well, yet still proved no match for Meave. She knocked his axe from his hand, he fell to his knees, then she cleaved his head clear off. It rolled like a gourd and came to rest at the peasant's feet. You've your freedom back, growled Meave as she wiped her sword. Yet do not take it for granted. Nilfgaard is in Angren. The Blacklads will come here too. As long as the golden sun flies over the marsh, you must hide in the woods. Meave's force left the fort before dawn. She rode at the fore, lips pursed, jaw clenched. A stain on her honour. She'd broken her word. Apart from all else, it stung on the inside. <coughs> Your Majesty, are you well? Yes. <coughs> yes, but the stench. Me rode at the front, her eyes fixed on the ground, and thus spotted the pit masked by leaves and branches. She tugged hard on her reins and steered her mount to the side. Alas, the cavalryman behind her did not follow her lead. Leaves rustled, boughs snapped, and the horseman crashed to the pit's bottom, snapping his neck. Moments later, it was clear who'd set the trap when the forest came alive and a cry rang out. It's a trap! Rally to me! Caught between Lyrian hammer and Skelligan stone, Nilfgaard was shattered, destroyed. The victors now stood eyeing each other. These islanders were not like those Meave had met before. They wore no armor and carried no shields. At their fore stood a man as stout as an ox and bald as an ancient ghoul. His men called him Arnjolf, the patricide. I thank you for your aid, Arnjolf, said Meave, extending a hand. Aid, she says. Aid? Do you hear that, mates? <laughs> the Skelligers exchanged glances, then erupted in roaring laughter. Not here to help you, not at all. We're after killing. Join me and you shall have your fill. Join you since? <laughs> Just who the hell are you? Meave, Queen of Rivia and Lyria. Meave, Arnjolf said, his tone sobering. I know the name. Lippy Goodman called ye bold. Praise your courage to the high heaven. So be it. We'll follow you into fire, wench. Just let us taste of blood. Grant us a death worthy of heroes. Meave couldn't help but smile, then nodded to accept. The Lyrians stepped aside as tattooed warriors joined their ranks. The scouts rode at the fore, with Meave right behind them. Their task, to find safe passage for the rest of the force. One among them probed for the quagmire's depth, a pole of five ells in hand. Suddenly, all heard a loud clang. The scouts dismounted, then heaved a bronze statue from the mire. Once it was cleaned of slime and muck, Meave instantly recognized its elven handiwork. The sculpture was exceedingly well preserved, save one detail. Someone had removed its face, leaving a black hole in its stead. Search the environs, ordered Meave. Amongst some brambles, they discovered the entrance to a vast tomb. Its doors had been torn open. On the ground before them lay scattered bones, some yellowed with age, others fresh, cracked and tattered from having been gnawed. Meave stood silent and contemplating at the tomb's threshold. Then, torch in hand, she entered and waded into fetid waters. Her soldiers followed close, arms at the ready, a nervous sweat on their brows. Frescoes on the tomb walls depicted Angren swamps and the beasts that prowled them. Two words were inscribed over the largest of the horrors, Gvern Iker. 
Suddenly, a roar thundered from deeper inside the tomb. Meave turned from the frescoes to see monstrous eyes blazing in the dark. I think that's the last of them, but keep your weapons at the ready. In her torch's feeble glow, the queen examined the beast's corpse. She could not help but to shudder in disgust. Perhaps it's better, she thought, that we faced it in the dark. At the corridor's end, they found a closed door. Before any could draw near, it opened with a crash. Beyond lay a circular room. Light shone through a hole in the chamber's ceiling, illuminating a stone pedestal and the sword that lay upon it. The air in here, it crackles with magic, whispered Isbel. Meave gripped the blade's hilt. A soothing warmth filled her arms and spread across her shoulders. Her tired muscles ceased trembling. Her fingers, stiff as sticks, relaxed. She brandished her prize, the air hissing as the blade sliced through it. She then nodded approvingly. The reward had been worth the risk. Meave and the horseman beside her exchanged a perplexed glance. They'd heard the song clearly, both its tune and its verse. Whoever had hollowed it had to be close, and given their diction rather well oiled. Moments later, a hamlet appeared to the Lyrian's tired eyes. A great bonfire blazed at its center. Around it danced peasants, barefoot, giggling, hooting, joyful and carefree. One by one, they noticed the queen. Soon, all were silent, huddled together, children peering from behind their backs. Fear not, said Meave. We mean you no harm. What do you celebrate? A lad's grooming? Nuptials? Nay, my lady. Hell yes. The gods have been kind. Filled us nets and snares with game. Come time, we thank them. Yes. You've things to be thankful for. We do, my lady. And we's poor folk. So a queen. Well, you must as well. Your Majesty, stay tonight, feast with us. There'll be music and plenty of room by the fire. <sighs> Why not? Began me, daintily dismounting. We all deserve some respite, I suppose. The Lyrians needed no convincing. With astonishing haste, they removed mail and helmets then eagerly joined in the fating and dance. Amidst the trilling of flutes, fifes and fiddles, all those gathered reveled until dawn. They could rest at last, forget about Nilfgaard and the many beasts that prowled among the reeds. They'd long remember that night, the carefree laughter, peasant maids whirling in dance, the ale cold as a mountain spring, and the bread they crisped over the fire. One exchange in particular etched itself into the Queen's mind, an exchange she overheard. Not a little, not even a teeny tiny bit. I'll say it again, it's not your concern. Of course it's not. Wouldn't be so damn curious if it were. So be it. Keep your silence. But um, those eyes like the summer sky. That hair like waves of grain. I see the way you gape. What do you two speak of? Uh, your majesty. <laughs> Couldn't have answered that better myself. Who does Reynard gape at? Bah, the new ballista, what else? Ah, oh, what a piece of work. Pure art, I say. Can't tear your eyes away for an instant. Haven't you two held enough from me already? Don't play me for a fool. What's this about? Me, honestly, you do better to... It's a private matter, Your Grace. One of the heart, you might say. 
If you'd allow it, I'd rather not share the details of our conversation. All right. I'll leave you to discuss whatever men discuss. Consider me gone. Meade turned and walked back to the fire, sat down on an old stump. Ha! That was close. I... Shh! And the faintest of smiles crossed her lips. Meave expected the villagers to request recompense for their welcome. Yet the peasants made not the slightest mention of coin, and the queen was much moved by their kindness. Once again, those with the least had proved the most willing to share. The Lyrians did not assemble come the morn. The force marched off in the afternoon, unshaven, unbathed, disheveled. Not normally one to overlook contempt for discipline, that day Meave understood even soldiers needed to let their guard down, at times. Admire, admire, ample harvest yield, for our mistress all need be kneeled. O oh, clay pad, o oh, clay pad, play us more, you pros. Sing again, we'll dance a bit, and then we'll fix your nose. <laughs> Sensing a limp in her mount's gait, Meave ordered the column to halt. There was a thorn in her mare's hoof, burrowing deeper with every step. The horse whinnied and pulled her leg away, but Meave knew how to calm her. She stroked the mare's cheek, whispered slow words in her ear, she then extracted the thorn without difficulty. I'm sorry to interrupt, said the druid from behind Meave's back. Yet this is where our paths diverge. We've a modest gift to thank you for the road shared, and for your aid at the obelisk to the marsh gods. Meave wished to respond, but the druids had turned toward the woods, their satchels slung over their shoulders. The queen waited till they were out of sight to open the bundle. Their gift was by no means modest. The trees no longer wish us here. They call for someone else. In Angren swamps, one can easily lose one's way. Thick fog fills the air, paths end without warning, dense thickets obscure the distance. The sole way to determine one's position is to climb a tree and peer out over the canopy. This duty fell to Meave's scouts while the force halted below. During one such delay, Meave caught the words she'd longed to hear. Majesty! Tuzla Castle! Its tower! I see it! To her soldier's astonishment, Meave cast off her gauntlets and started up the nearest trunk. She longed to see the castle for herself, but then she would know sweet vengeance was at hand. The climb proved tricky as the trunk was slippery and the branches, run through with rot, were frail. Yet Meave showed herself to be skillful and spry. As a child, she had loved to scale trees, much to her governess' dismay. Meave looked out to see a mighty stone tower outlined against the horizon. Legend holds Tuzla Castle was to have had three such bastions. Yet King Ragbard, the fort's benefactor, had forsaken the effort when yet another stone transport simply sank into Angren's boggy roads. It was a moment of respite for Meave. A moment of quiet joy. She breathed and tasted air free of the bog stench. She took in silence undisturbed by the hum of mosquito swarms. And she relished her prospects. The coming battle against Caldwell. The soldiers stood exhausted and filthy, many with raspy coughs, all sick of the meager gruel. But with the command to advance, a new strength sparked within them. Their step was lively, a fire burned in their eyes, each hoping to spill Caldwell's entrails, then dash them upon the fort walls. Yet as they drew near the stronghold, perched atop a stone aisle, their verve dwindled, enthusiasm waned. They had taken fortresses with thicker walls, taller towers, and manned by more men, Yet they'd never seen nor laid siege to a fort standing on land so ill-suited. To rush the bulwarks through waist-deep mud. Was this even possible? 
Prove I was no fool to keep you at my side, said Meave, turning to Gascon and Reynard. A slaughter I must avoid. How will I do it? Your Grace, began Reynard. Set our machines to sling boulders. At the west wall, its weakest. Tis our best chance at a breach. Our men'll need cover, added Gascon. Reeds we must harvest and burn. Smoke will cloak us. Conceal us from the castle's defenders. Good, agreed the Queen. Now get to work. Amidst billowing blue smoke, Lyrian footmen rushed through the breach wrought by Reynard's catapults. Though she had yet to forgive her companions, Meave had to admit they'd given her sound advice. Coldwell, I've come for your head! I knew you'd come. Your lofty pride presages another dramatic fall. No one touch him! The count is mine! Many of Meave's victories have been immortalized in poetry and song, but not the fall of Tuzla. Lyrians fought Lyrians, brothers killed brothers, in rain and mud midst a cursed swamp. Certainly nothing to inspire a bard. Near the battle's end, Meave stormed the great stone tower to which Caldwell had fled. The queen ascended the stairs, dealing blow after blow, blood cascading down in her wake. She reached the top floor to find the Count waiting, with no intention to defend himself. If it's mercy you expect, you'll be sorely disappointed. Mercy? I know you all too well for that, Meave. Ever vindictive and cruel. All this from a paragon of knightly virtues. You stabbed me in the back, Caldwell, and used Willem to do so. My son! Who agreed without a moment's hesitation? Forsaken by your own son, your flesh and blood. What's that say about you? Oh, you tread on thin ice. Choose your next words carefully. Spare me your threats. You'll kill me all the same. Death can come in many ways, Count. Some quick, some slow. My, my. How you strut and vaunt. Terribly sure of yourself. Perhaps too sure. Your castle is mine. I've crushed your force. I dare say no, I'm not. Precisely my point. Don't you see? The Empire's not one army, it's dozens, hundreds. It's what I strove to knock into that thick dome of yours. Alas, you're too much a dullard. Soon as I'd learned you'd crossed into Angren, I sent for reinforcements. They'll be here soon. Three regiments, armed to their teeth. <laughs> Nilfgaardians seem ever to have the upper hand, yet I find the means to defeat them. Not this time, Meave. Nilfgaard comes in numbers, ten Imperial footmen to each and every one of yours. You'll not win, nor can you flee. Do you know why? Enlighten me. I dare you. But one bridge leads to Tuzla. As it happens, I ordered it raised as you laid siege. The swamps around the castle are too deep to cross. Try to rebuild the bridge, the Imperial troops will arrive before you can finish. Your men, they'll slay as you watch, and then they'll wring your neck. I wouldn't be so pleased were I you. You won't live to see this outcome. I know that, but I take heart in the truth. Though the castle you've seized and will likely kill me, I've won. Outsmarted you, Meave twice now. And you know what? It wasn't even that hard. With those words, with his arrogance and contempt, Caldwell had gone too far. The Queen gripped his shoulders, pushed. Caldwell stumbled backwards, then tripped out the window. A blood-chilling shriek filled the courtyard, then broke off abruptly. Now fool me thrice. Try. Meave slapped the dust from her hands. The traitor had met a deserving end at last. Yet this was no time to revel in the Count's demise. If Caldwell had spoken the truth, the Queen and her army were in grave danger. Meave scouts quickly confirmed the traitor's claim. 
The bridge was indeed in flames, and Nilfgaardian regiments were advancing from the south. Now to confirm if there was truly no other route by which they could flee, the Queen ordered her men to ask the local peasants. One of their number, a stable hand who'd lived near Tuzla all his life, claimed a secret path led out the back of the stronghold. King Ragbard himself ordered it built. Adam dropped great stones into its swamp, one after another, like beads on a string. Bitter water covers them, so you can't see nought at start. You can make them out if you go proper slow, though. Oh. What is it? The stones. They lead to Isgith. And there, my lady, lurks an evil worse nor any black-clad army. What? A beast of some sort? Some say beast, others god. Gernikora, they call her. And you'll yet see, my lady. Isgith shines red with your blood. A silly tale to frighten children, Meave thought at first. Then paused. For something about the man's voice made his every word believable. None too encouraging. Yet preferable to certain death. Tell me, from Isgith, will we reach the banks of the Yoruga, near Red Lomondon, perchance? Aye, Your Majesty. You need but head north. And pray all along the way. Soon, Meave stood where the stable hand had said she should, at the edge of a vast marsh. Carefully, she dipped a foot into the broth and probed for solid ground. Sure enough, she found stone. One cautious step, then another. Meave slowly strode off towards Isgith. With the path to Isgith hidden from view, Meave proceeded like one blind, moving solely by touch. With each step, she could not know if she would find rock or plunge beneath the black water's surface. The Queen's soldiers followed single file, carefully mirroring her every move. The Lyrians, near the end of their strength, got lucky when a light breeze dispersed the fog to reveal dry land. The Queen let out a sigh of relief. Oh, at last. Meave kicked off her boots to empty them of water and mud, then promptly screamed. Ah! Her legs were in leeches, slimy, bloated leeches. Ignoring the pain and trickling blood, she frantically tore them from her legs, wishing to be rid of them. Having plucked the last parasite from her calf, Meave grabbed her boot to crush the bloodsucker beneath her heel. Yet it had already slithered off. She spotted it on the trunk of a birch where, like a very fast snail, it was climbing. What the devils? But Meave's words caught in her throat. Leeches and ticks in the dozens dangled from the tree's branches. Some were so gorged on blood that their skin was translucent and on the point of bursting. Meave had some difficulty muting the urge to wretch. The Queen stepped back, finding it hard to believe what hung before her eyes, confused as to what it all meant. The Lyrians marched in silence, too tired to keep in step with the drums. Suddenly, the wind rose to a howl and there was a loud crash of thunder. Blast! Meave leapt from her saddle. We camp here. Pitch the tents, quickly, quickly! As the soldiers rushed to unload the wagons, a wall of water came down, soaking them to the bone. Later, they sat in their leaky tents, huddled, teeth chattering, violent coughs rocking their frames. The storm raged the night through, then finally passed before dawn. Meave emerged from her tent to wring out her coat. Raynard approached, his gait heavy, his face grim. Your Majesty, several men of the 11th, a dozen or so, sought to flee last night. Sentries stopped and bound them. Now they await your judgment. Meave fastened her still wet coat. She knew well why the men had tried to desert. They longed for their kin, had lost sight of victory. Perhaps even no longer believed. Yet the marching and fighting seemed destined to go on forever. The Queen sympathized. She too was spent, and many doubts plagued her. Yet she knew the deserters had to be punished. The question was, to what extent? Meave entered the tent where the prisoners stood. Some of the men looked away, ashamed at their deed. 
Others raised their gazes to meet hers, their eyes red, tearful, pleading. You all know the penalty for desertion. Meave said to the soldiers bound at wrist and foot. I ought to have every last one of you hanged. Yet, we've come far along a treacherous road. Endured hardships extreme. This I considered against your crime. You shall lose rank and receive no pay for one year. Now get out of my sight. Immediately! The deserters mumbled their gratitude and rushed out of the tent, fearing the Queen might yet change her mind. Meave then left for her quarters, anger and bitterness eating her up from the inside. Gods, have we passed the very threshold into hell? Close ranks. None is to step off the path without clear orders to do so. While accustomed to life mid swamp monsters and black magic, Angren's denizens never dared enter Isgith. The Lyrians only once saw signs of a human presence there when they spotted a group of thatched roof huts amongst alders. That settlement, is it inhabited? Meave asked, turning to her scouts. Impossible to say from this distance, Your Grace. The Lyrians entered the village, swords in hand, prepared to fight. But not a soul nor a beast came forth. Some homes had collapsed from rot, while tall grass concealed the paths between them. Yet, someone had been there not long past, for fresh ghoul cadavers lay by the well. Meave knelt beside the corpse of one cut clear in half. The beast's killer had been exceptionally strong, and wielded a razor-sharp sword. More likely to come around. Meave leapt to her feet. A man in thick leather armor had emerged from one of the huts. Transfixed by his cat eyes, the Queen nonetheless sensed he was rather badly hurt. Were that true, my scouts would have blown their horns. The man pulled out a pendant shaped like a bear's head. It hummed and twitched as if striving to free itself of its chain. Far as monsters go, he said, lips curling into an unpleasant smile. Witchers aren't usually wrong. A moment later, a scream pierced the air. Quickly, instinctively, Meave drew her sword and lunged forth. They approach! Seems you were right. That'd be the last of them. Should be quiet for a bit. The Lyrians emerged victorious, due in no small part to the Witcher. Thanks for the help. Name's Ivo, Witcher, School of the Bear. Meave, Queen of Lyria and Rivia. Well, well. Didn't expect to see anyone out here. And certainly not a queen with an army in tow. We're not here by choice. I bet not. No one plans to pass through Isgith. And you? What's brought you here? A contract, perchance? That's right. Hunting a monster. I know your services to be rather dear. Who could afford a witcher's bounty in these wretched swamps? Nilf Guardians. Blast, of course. Preparing the land for settlement. Call the monsters, drain the swamp, then bring in slaves. Doubtless from the north. Maybe. I got paid in advance. I didn't see the need to ask any questions. But did you have to take the coin? Don't you see what they're doing? Forgive me, your majesty, but seems to me you're confusing witchers with knights errant. We don't fight oppression, right wrongs, or avenge orphans. We slay monsters for coin. And it don't matter whose head's on the front or whose coffers it's from. This beast you're out to slay, what is it? Hang on. You mean to tell me you've led your force into Isgith and don't even know what lives here? I believe I was clear. We're not here by choice. Yeah, but now that you are here, it'll take a minor miracle to get you out. Isgith's swamps? Realm of a truly dangerous being. Elves call it Gvern Iker, the Bloody Mistress. Over generations, locals twisted the name until it became Gvernikora. Indeed. I've heard it. So you've also probably seen her beloved fruit. 
leeches, and ticks. You'd all be wise to stay away from them. This Gurnacora, what is she exactly? Depends who you ask. Elves saw a fallen goddess in her. Never managed to cut her down while they lived here, but they did stem her growth, kept her from growing stronger. As for the local humans, spirit of a cursed princess, that's their take. Deep belief, actually. Care to elaborate? Stories that she was riding north to marry a Temerian duke. Whole retinue and caravan got lost, wagons got stuck, everybody drowned in the bog, quicksand got him, that sort of thing. Gurnikora grabbed a root before the quagmire swallowed her whole, hollered for hours, but there wasn't a soul around to hear her. Leeches, hundreds covered her, settled in for a royal feast, sucked her dry, drained her to pretty much the last drop. Fear and revulsion so completely overcame her spirit, she couldn't pass into the afterlife. So she came back, revived by Isgith's magic. Ugh. Oh, a chilling tale. Yeah. Sep made up, probably. Don't believe the elven legends, either. Gurnikor is a monster, plain and simple. Extremely dangerous, sure. But just a monster. The leeches and ticks. You called them her fruit. It's kind of complicated. We've time enough. Hmm. Gurnikor is a little like a vampire. They're kindred creatures. Except, instead of feasting on the blood of others, she feeds them her own. I'm not certain I understand. They're parasites, right? She puts them on her body, feeds them her own blood. Then hangs them on shrubs and trees. Ugh. To what end? To other monsters, their delicacies. Sweet, juicy, full of Gurnikora's blood. Irresistible. Any beast that tastes that loses its mind, turns into Gurnikora's slave. So, if your paths cross and push comes to shove, she's not going to be alone. Find yourself fighting the whole damn swamp. Hmm. How are we to fight her? How might she be killed? Sorry, sharing secrets. Just not something we do. Not even with those who saved your life just moments past. We gotta wait till she starts feeding the parasites. She's weakest then. Stand a chance to hurt her. Right. So we attack only once she puts the leeches to her skin. Yeah. And when you kill her, if you kill her, any beasts under her spell will weaken considerably. And then, you gotta burn her corpse. I mean it, understand? Burn it. And you? Will you not hunt her any longer? No, oh, I will. Just need to prepare. Realize that today. Gotta brew some potions, blade oils. Come back in a few days. I don't even have that much time. Nilfgaard's hordes pursue us. I must march on. In that case, wish you luck. Lots of it. I suppose there's no argument that would persuade you to ride with us. Your grace, mutations strip us of emotion, not reason. The Witcher vanished midst the trees. And Meave... Meave simply hoped her soldiers had not overheard any part of their conversation. Caldwell had summoned Nilfgaardian support. Meave assumed they were not far behind. Yet, in the unforgiving terrain, a full Nilfgaardian division could not hope to close the gap. Small detachments, however, light cavalry or footmen, could very well do just that. So when black-clad men emerged from the mist, the Queen was not surprised. She ordered her troops to fall in, form up, and brace to defend the line. Yet the attack never came. The invaders stood silent, motionless. And Meave got a closer look. They were slouched, ashen-faced, unsure of step, and covered in sores. Isgith had treated them as cruelly as any. Teetering in his saddle, the commander broke formation. He rode forth and addressed the queen in fluent common tongue. Half my men are wounded, the others sick. Your force does not fare much better. 
True. Yet we outnumber you soundly. Indeed. If it comes to combat, you are certain to win. But in this damn swamp, all wounds fester. Flesh is quick to rot. You will lose many more apart from those who fall. <sighs> what do you mean precisely? Asked the Queen, her eyes narrowing, her head tilted to the side. We should part ways in peace. There's a war on, there'll be another chance to fight. Perhaps even face one another. But not here. And not like this. Suddenly unsure, the Queen weighed the officer's words. Their logic was sound, though they could also prove a ruse. Your Grace. Xavier's voice came from behind Meave's back. We can't let them pass. They've done only harm. And they'll not stop and go home. So be it. I accept. Meave answered after thinking a while. We shall cross swords some other day. Beneath a clear sky, on solid ground. I will hold you to your word, Majesty, replied the Nilfgaardian, then raised his arm in salute. The retreating Imperials marched past the Lyrians. Along the slim path, their shoulders nearly touched. Meave soldiers glared from beneath their brows, their eyes locked on the foe till the last vanished in the woods. Then, collectively, they let out a sigh of relief. The Lyrian force had reached the very heart of Isgith. From every branch, vine and shrub hung leeches and ticks by the dozen. Swollen with blood, their abdomens glistened, glowing red in the misty air. Air so putrid it set Meave's head to spinning. She paused at a moss-covered boulder, pressed her flushed forehead against its cool surface. Her soldiers passed by, pallid, filthy, drained. She wished to say something, lift their spirits, but instead a cough rattled her breast. Suddenly, splashes all around Meave in the water, as if a rain of fist-sized drops had begun to fall. The queen lifted her heavy gaze, Seemingly on command, ticks and leeches dropped into the warm, soupy waters, then clumsily wriggled off toward a dead alder grove. Meave knew at once what skulked behind the trees. Gernicora, Isgith's mistress, Isgith's queen. Weapons at the ready! The queen roared. Close ranks! The Lyrians quickly converged, formed a wall of shields and crouched behind them. Terrified. They stared as a multitude of eyes flashed open midst the branches while revolting, muck-covered beasts rose from the gurgling waters around. Meave silently uttered a prayer. Hail, Melitali, great mother, maiden and crone, ever have us in your care. Majesty, these parasites, they feed on her blood! The Queen! How quickly the scales tip. These ghastly beasts can be slain. They can be overcome. Remember that unwarranted arrogance kills slowly and insidiously. I believe it's dead. Of the battle in Isgith, Meave remembered very little. It seemed a nightmare, its details a haze, the sensations very real. Midst a thick fog, she fought in a frenzy, desperately hacking at the scourge that advanced from all sides. In the end, silence fell over the swamp. Its boiling waters lay calmed. The ticks and leeches were gone, 
while Gernicora lay among rotting leaves, covered in blood, unmoving. But still a fearsome sight. Burn the corpse, rasped the Queen. And we move on. The soldier's eyes darted about in a series of silent glances. It took me a moment to realize the difficulty. They still feared it. Though the monster's lifeless body lay on the ground, they dared not go near. Were she to repeat the order, they would carry it out. Yet she did not wish to force that on them. Swallowing her own revulsion, she walked up to Gernicora's corpse and set it alight. The air soon filled with the suffocating stench of burning hair and flesh. Sparks belched out as melting fat fell on flame. Until finally, nothing was left of the bloody mistress but scorched bone. The Lyrians resumed their march towards the banks of the Yeruga. They forced their weary legs to maintain a swift pace and stole no second glance at what they'd left behind. One day, the quartermaster approached with news to report. Alas, bad news. Your Grace, our food stocks have near run out, and about villages, folk have naught to spare, not even to trade. The Queen dispatched small groups of scouts. They were to scour the countryside for hunting camps, beekeepers, charcoal burners, any souls willing to trade food for coin or goods. The first scouts came back around dusk. The last three detachments returned not at all. At first, Meef suspected they'd fallen prey to monsters, the beastly or Nilfgaardian kind. Later, she learned the men had left naught of their belongings behind. She'd been soft-hearted toward deserters. This lot decided they, too, would give it a try. That night, Meave lay still but sleepless. Beneath thin covers, she was cold, hungry, irate. Towering alders grow thick in Isgith, their crowns weaving an expansive canopy that obscures the sky. Any sunbeams to slip through this twisted thicket scatter in the milky mist below. Thus, the marsh abides in a state of perpetual twilight wherein a sense of time and direction are easily lost. As the force moved along, a glow appeared in the trees. The Lyrians squinted, their mouths agape in wonder. An orb hung over the water, pulsating, humming. It circled the soldiers, darted off a distance, then hovered as if waiting. A will of the wisp, that is, whispered one of the footmen. I believe it's keen to show us something. Meave knew the Wisp could prove treacherous, lead them into a trap. Nonetheless, she followed, though not entirely certain why. Her soldiers seemed eager, she sensed they approved. Yet she was also simply curious. We follow it. Carefully. Weapons at the ready. As the Wisp led the Lyrians down a narrow, winding path, Meave surveyed her surroundings warily. Beads of sweat emerged upon her brow, but her fears, in the end, proved unfounded. For at the path's end, the troops found what appeared to be a caravan's remains. Its wagons, rot-eaten, half buried in the bog, had sat there for decades, perhaps longer. Despite this, gilded panels and scraps of silver-threaded fabric showed they'd once been rather ornate. Inside the wagons, the soldiers discovered many steel crates. Rust-covered but intact, they contained truly dazzling treasures. Sacks bulging with gold coin, pearl-encrusted goblets, exotic velvets and silks in beads. Blimey, the sheer amount. And here of all places. A footman muttered under his breath. Meave quickly pieced it all together. She too had once ridden in such a caravan, splendid and laden with gold, when she'd left her home to marry. The rest of the story was not difficult to divine. This was a maiden's dowry. She and her retinue lost their way. Isgith proved their grave, unbeknownst to any other. The wisp circled Meave's party, blinked several times, then faded into thin air. The troops resumed their march, and all seemed in order. Seemed, 
For soon, several footmen were discovered to be gone. Greed had been their ruin. They grabbed too much. The loot had weighed them down, and the marsh had embraced them. In evading Nilfgaard's banners, Meave led her force into Angren's wildest reaches. The foe could not attack the Lyrians there, yet hazards of another sort befell them. One day, they reached a quagmire too vast and deep to ford. So the queen summoned her engineer, Xavier, and called on him to build a makeshift bridge. By nightfall, he had drawn up plans. We shall start by laying abutments, then drive piles into the mire. Hmm. The depth? We dropped plumb lines. Four L's. Consumed by the plans, Meave did not see as Xavier slipped a line off his shoulder. By the time she felt it on her throat, she feared it might be too late. <coughs> I long awaited this moment, when we would be alone. <coughs> you die now, Majesty, and with you dies Lyrias, Lyrias, the whole North will to resist. Hail, Ketzer, hail! What died was the Nilfgaardian rallying cry in Xavier's throat. At the last instant, Gascon and Reynard rushed in to save the warrior queen, and thus proved their loyalty beyond any doubt. Your Grace! Your Grace! There was no answer, but Reynard could hear her breathe. Meave would live. It was several hours later when Meave finally came to. She opened her eyes, then Gascon and Reynard helped her to her feet. Careful, Your Majesty. I should have been more careful earlier. Damn it. If you two hadn't... No need for words. You needn't mention it. I couldn't disagree more. We're due for a long conversation. First of all... I owe you thanks. Second, my trust in you both has been heavily tarnished. I believe that goes without saying. Yet today you proved beyond all doubt that I can rely on you. So I thank you. To serve under your banner, Majesty, it is an honor. Likely I'd have put it differently, but Reynard seems to have the right idea. Very well. We've reassured ourselves of admiration for one another enough. We've matters to which we must attend. I trust as I lay there dead to the world you did not sit about with your thumbs up your bums. Have you at least learned why Xavier betrayed us, sided with the Empire? In a manner of speaking, yes. Your Grace, the rogue who lunged at you in truth was one Gwalt et Luinoch, a Nilfgaardian spy. Just a moment, that makes no sense. He saved my life in Mahakam, on the bridge. He did, for he had to. In one of the letters we found, Et Dahi orders Gwalta to watch over Elderin-Chief Hoog. The Skoyatel in the mountains was sent there by Nilfgaard to recruit dwarves, but their commander, the Vixen, they feared she'd attack Bruva himself, something Et Dahi wished to avoid. Naturally. For someone else could seize power, someone not so neutrally inclined. Someone more likely to aid me, gods forbid. This discovery you made how? We found in his toolbox a concealed compartment, letters inside. Though encrypted, we managed to decipher them. They were the Grey Rider for you to read. A swine. An Imperial spy in my ranks this whole time. But to wait so long to strike, why? He'd only just received the order. Another letter in the box signed by General Eb Dahi stated, To Gwalta Eb Luinoch, eliminate M at first opportunity. Honourless bastards. They'll stop at nout. Now, Meave, you'll gain nout by getting riled. No sense to it. This is good news, in fact. Is that so? Think. Eb Dahi had a spy in our midst. He knew our movements, 
had his eye on us, his finger on the pulse. He knew our plans, who we parlayed with, and yet he didn't order your assassination. For you posed no threat. Well, clearly so much changed. Congratulations. Nilfgaard fears you now. And rightly so. But we found him in the rubble at Rosberg, midst the ashes. Precisely what placed him beyond suspicion. We suspect Walter enlisted with the Adanians some years past, infiltrated that army. He had a hand in Rosberg's defense. Then when the time was right, he lent that same hand to its demise. It caused an explosion that tore a hole through its walls. It worked, but at a price. He suffered severe burns. If not for our medics, he'd have... Stop. So it was not elves who brought about the fort's fall as he claimed. A filthy lie to stoke the fires of racial hatred. To stir conflict and chaos and rage that would make the realm of Edurn waver and fall. If we're to judge by Rayla's actions, he was rather successful. Bastard. Yet even so badly hurt in such pain, not for a moment did he drop his mama's act. I've heard much of Nilfgaardian spies, Your Grace. They're trained from childhood, face constant indoctrination. They do anything for the Emperor, anything and everything. As soon as Gwalta spotted a chance to join our ranks, to be at your side, he took it, exploited it ably. To be brief, I've traitors all about me. Your Grace, you resent our actions, I understand, but... You, Willem, the Cad Coldwell, Gascon, Gabor, finally Xavier. Tell me how. How am I to trust anyone? You can't. Amongst all the realms in the north, you're Nilfgaard's sole rival. One remaining threat. All of the rulers, either soundly defeated and enchained, or tails tween their legs, they've donned Nilfgaard's leash. The Black Clads will do all to destroy you, if not upon the field, then in secret, with an assassin and a quick, sharp blade. What's left? Prayer. Melitale too is sure to turn and take Nilfgaardian gold sooner or later. Ugh. We've talked enough. We must form up. Move on. Majesty, you ought to rest. Your stand's swaying. Your step can't be too sure. Only my horse needs step true. Maeve, you've just about had the life chopped out of you. No time to play the hero. I'm not, Gascon. Quite the opposite, actually. These damn swamps, they terrify me. I wish to get the hell out and never, ever look back. The Aruga lies near. I sent scouts ahead. They've secured a barge. We can sail to Red Lobindon. Splendid. Sound the horns. We march. Sandflies and mosquitoes blanketed Meave's face and neck. She did not bother to brush them away. She'd been in Angren long enough to know more would come in their place. Your Majesty. Raynard called from behind. Our scouts have returned. We've a large force of blacklads on our tail. Infantry and horsemen. And they draw nearer. Blast! Meave wiped away the sweaty hair stuck to her brow. What say you, Raynard? Shall we give them a fight? We're but a few miles from the river where a barge awaits. It makes no sense to battle now. Though near her strength's end, Meave stepped up her pace. She could not wait to stand upon a barge deck and leave Angren's infernal bogs behind. Alas, in place of the promised vessel, they found only severed moorings. No! No, it can't be! Suddenly, Meave drove her fist into the trunk of the nearest tree. Fortunately, a soft and rotted one. This isn't so! Your Grace, I... have mercy. I stepped away, but for a spell... Croaked a scout. Pale as a ghost. And thieves jumped out the underbrush. Fell upon it. Whole band of them. A white hair warrior. A minstrel. And alas, what had a bore. <laughs> well, is that all? Interrupted Gascon. No vampire sat upon an ass with no saddle. You cocked up, man, damn it. Meave, what now? The queen turned back towards the swamp. Between the trees, she glimpsed a golden sun glimmering upon a banner. We shall discuss that later, said the queen, 
drawing her sword. Provided we survive. Near the battle's end, Meave faced a black-clad officer. Nimbly dodging his strike, she countered. The Queen's sword sank deep, the hilt rattling his breastplate. A rush of hot blood covered Meave's hands. The winged helmet toppled from the officer's head, exposing a sweaty face, gasping for breath. Nin! Uh, when? Before the Queen stood a ruddy-haired boy with long eyelashes. He was Willem's age, perhaps a bit older. His body slumped, then disappeared beneath the malodorous foam atop the murky waters. Meave cast away her sword as if it had burned her hand. Majesty, what is it? Are you hurt? Reynard said, rushing to her side. No, I'm not. It's fine. Give the order to march. With no barge, we must walk to Red Lobindon along the riverbank. Your Majesty, we must tend to the wounded. Use the rest of the day, I wager. We ain't time enough for that, interjected Gascon. That was but the vanguard sent in pursuit to slow us down. And even so, they outnumbered us two to one. What happens when the main force arrives? We must flee. Now. And abandon the injured, to bleed to death in the mud. Alas, Reynard, yes. Unless you'd rather we stayed and died with them. Gascon is right. Should Nilfgaard close the distance between us, we'll stand little chance. Whew. At least you've the sense to... But I would sooner perish than let my men rot in this accursed swamp. The medics will tend to all the wounded. Then... What will be, will be. I tell you what'll be, snarled Gascon. Ep die, he'll take a butcher's hook and gut you. Then hang you from Lyria Capital's walls. Yet, yeah, if this be your wish. Meave waited for the medics to sew the last stitch, tie off the last bandage. Only then did she order her force to move out. At the column's end, upon stretchers, lay those without the strength to walk, consumed by fever, dazed or unconscious, dying. Fatigued and laden with the wounded, the Lyrians moved slow as molasses. Soon Nilfgaard's forward elements had caught up. The black-clads nipped at the Lyrians' tail with arrow volleys from the cover of trees and occasional forays by cavalry. They were in no hurry. They could torment their foes, weaken their spirit before the final clash. At long last, Meave spotted a dark form spanning the river's course, Red Lobindon's Bridge. Just a brief stretch more and the Lyrians would find themselves beyond the invader's grasp, free and clear of bogs, and the beasts that prowled them. Yet joy at this sight soon gave way to despair. The bridge was dark, black, from the horde of Nilfgaardians that held it. Clearly the Blackclads had divined the path of Meave's flight, and had cut off her last means of escape. That's it. We're dead men. All! They'll cut us down to the last! Meave shut her eyes, felt them sting with fatigue. She knew when she turned she could not show her men one ounce of fear, one pinch of doubt. She gripped her reins tightly. The leather dug into her skin, helping her hold back her tears. And when the queen finally spoke, her voice was strong and boomed over the river's roar. I know what you wish to hear. The queen began. That the gods watch over us. That we'll come through the fray unharmed. That a friendly force is but moments away. Those would be lies. The truth is as bitter as it is undeniable. We stand cornered. Cannot win this fight. Cannot flee it. We can but choose how to die. Hanged from the boughs like common criminals, or weapons in hand like the fighters we are. I've made my choice. Time you made yours! With that cry, Meave broke for the bridge toward a forest of spears into a deluge of arrows. She let the tears fall from her eyes. Tears of rage, fear, fatigue. It was not until she'd almost reached the enemy line that she dared glance backward and she saw she was not alone. Defend the Queen! Valyria! 
We may die here today, but not on our hands and knees! <laughs> Don't shoot! Don't shoot! We're friend, not foe! Damn it, just gets better and better. To the bridge! Cut the way back to the bridge! Bolster the defense! Fall back! Blow it! Meave was victorious on the banks of the Yuruga, but paid dearly for it. She lost a host of men and suffered harm herself. Yet she'd have been doomed if not for a certain white-haired witcher. Meave longed to meet her mysterious savior and set off in search of him as soon as the battle dust had settled. She found him with the field surgeon and learned he was none other than the witcher Geralt. Yes, incredible as it may seem, I've heard the tale from several and can vouch for its truth. At any rate, making naught of the fact that Geralt's ears were ringing from a blow with a mace, Meave began immediately to interrogate him. You for Fabe Woodbridge? Asked Meave, prodding him insistently. For a spell, Geralt worried his hearing was shot, but then realized the Queen had a lisp. Worked out that way, I guess. You guess? <laughs> Meave gagged on the blood in her mouth. Someone hold me! The Queen felt Geralt merited the highest honor, a knighthood. Another monarch might have delayed until a more opportune time, but not Meave. Meave delayed nothing. Count Odo. You, sir, do the honors. Alas, I cannot because of my tooth. For valor shown in battle, I, Meave, by the gods' grace, Queen of Lyria and Rivia, hereby do knight thee. Geralt of praise unknown, the bridge you felled with men from Rivia. Or so you guess. <laughs> I guess it falls to me to dub thee Geralt of Rivia. Meave had come home, though by a circuitous route, through Edern's smoking embers, Angren's beast-infested quagmires, cross Mahakam's snow-capped ridges. But she had returned, cloaked in legend, a mighty army in tow. The moment was weighty and not to be tainted even by Geralt of Rivia's disappearance, or dare we say desertion. The hero of the battle for the bridge was now a sought man. Yet Meave was determined to take back her realm, with or without the Witcher's aid. Beleriand's daring escapade behind enemy lines, and the triumphant victory at the battle for the bridge that crowned it, breathed new life into the North's war effort. Bands of resistance fighters now swarmed the conquered lands, while Kedwin and Redania, on the verge of swearing fealty to the Emperor, suddenly broke off talks with the invader. The Nilfgaardian war machine suddenly screeched to a halt, and the tide of war turned. Facing a united north, the invader had to withdraw the bulk of its forces from Lyria and Rivia. The way was cleared for Meave to retake her lost lands, defeat General Epdahi, and depose Willem. Or perhaps mother and son would not have to fight after all. Milady, I come at King Willem's bidding. Prince Willems. <clears throat> His Majesty proposes a meeting. No arms, no escorts. His Majesty? Welp's barely tall enough to reach his mother's bosom. For shame! Silence. Let him say his piece. His Majesty, Willem I, wishes to discuss the possibility of a truce. He wishes to surrender. Is that his aim? Your words, not mine, Your Grace. I have a few more on the tip of my tongue. But save them I shall for later. <clears throat> Willem I's chosen the site for the parley. In... Willem I will choose Nout. If he wishes to speak, let him meet me midst the ruins of Devil's Tower. Understood, Your Grace. I'll relay your terms. Willem's emissary rode off, serenaded by hisses and jeers. Frightened by the clamor, his horse reared and kicked. The rider forced his mount to obey with cracks of his crop, striking many more times than was necessary. 
the fool. Nag will toss him off first chance it gets. Soon as he loosens the reins. No great loss, I wager. But tell me, your thoughts on this reunion? Sounds a ruse to me. But I know that won't stop you. Whence this certainty? Come now, Maeve. At the end of it all, he's your son. You still care about him, it's obvious. Yes, I care dearly, Gascon. I care to capture him and try him for treason. Maeve, the boy was manipulated. It took no great push. Let's go. They await us. Meave rode out clad in golden plate, her banners waving proudly overhead. She no longer led a band of ragtag partisans, but an army able to fend off an empire and drive its soldiers from her lands. Arnjolf, find a place at one of the tables, have a drink, meet my men. <laughs> Think there's been a failure to communicate, lass? I didn't join your army to meet men, but to meet death. A good, honorable death. Quicker you lead me to that, the better. I can't help but wonder, what does it signify? The tattoo on your head? Ain't a tattoo. Carve these runes with a knife. The method makes little difference. What do they mean? Aim here. Message for enemy archers. Alas, don't seem they can read it. At least not from a distance. And when they get close, it's already too late for them. I wish not to pry, but why do you long for death? For only death can cleanse me of shame. You must have heard what they call me. Arnulf the Patricide. A moniker I earned. Oh, I did. To die by one's child's hand. A terrible fate. And it shall be mine as well if I lose this war. But did you earn it, this fate? What? I... <sighs> Not always have I been just with Willem. I dismissed him. Neglected him, but... <laughs> neglected? Listen, lass. My da. He beat me. Till my skin turned blue and I chucked red bile. He'd drink and beat, drink and beat. My brother? Oof. Da clobbered him to death. My ma? She took her own life. Never met this son of yours. But I know you's a bit now, and I can say this. No kind of yours needs slaying. So long, Arnulf. Rivia. And here I feared I would see it no more. I believed you would. I believed you could succeed. Be victorious, Your Grace. We've not arrived just yet, Reynard. Look. Black flags still flutter over the cities. We've yet much work before us. More battles to fight, more blood to spill. As the Lyrians passed a cemetery marching along its ivy-covered wall, they heard mourners wailing pitifully to a priestess's moving song. The soldiers dutifully lowered their heads. Their minds sought out fallen comrades and kin, and they wondered whom else the war would yet claim. <coughs> Listen, said Gascon, stirring me from her own meditation. I think I'll veer off for a bit. What for? To offer your condolences? In a manner of speaking. But just go on. I'll rejoin you soon. Meave nodded in agreement, then made as if to ride on. Yet Gascon had hardly entered the cemetery when the Queen turned and followed. Gascon quickly realized he was not alone. Ah, oh, Meave. Had I been plotting to do you no good, I'd not have announced I was sneaking off to do it. What do you mean? Come now, Meave, don't play the fool. You don't trust me, so you followed. Probably thought I'd commune with Epdahi in some crypt. Nay, better, the conclave of mages. Well, rest assured then. 
For if I truly had something I wanted to conceal, I dare say you'd not have noticed me slip off. If I truly suspected something nefarious, I'd have dispatched my scouts, not followed you alone. Which begs the question, why'd you follow? Why are you here? Why have you come? Because you've not been yourself. You've been acting strangely. And that gives you the right to spy on me? Gascon, I've grown used to you bending the rules of decorum, but now you overstep, sir. You overstep. Oh, will you have me flogged? Hold your tongue, sir, or I shall indeed. Splendid. Now tell me why you've come here. <sighs> if you absolutely must know, then follow me. Gascon led me through the ruins of a mausoleum, past its decapitated statues, past ancient gravestones effaced, past sarcophagi smashed to pieces. Whose is it? Could it be...? Yes, Maeve. My family's vault. The Brossards. The Brossards? Wait. The Brossards? The very same. Traitors who in 1258 revolted against King Reginald, your late husband. The earth lie lightly upon him. An error, most certainly. We paid dearly for it. Reginald had no mercy, decimated the family. As you can see, didn't even spare the dead. I was outside, away from the house. It is the only reason I survived. I was eight at the time, stripped of title and home. Well, I'm sure you can guess the rest. Frankly, do my damnedest not to think on it. But the wall, the cemetery, seeing them awoke all the old demons. Your crest, I seem to recall a pointer. Ah, <sighs> the Duke of Dogs. Now I understand. The Brossard's trial I remember well. Reginald was angry. He prodded and pushed. Too far, the sentence was cruel, spiteful. I felt it all, but said nothing. I'm so very, very sorry, Gascon. Ah, water under the bridge. And the past's a thing none of us can change. The past, no, but the present? I could rebuild your family's tomb. All deserve to rest in peace. Maeve, the war nears its end days now and you'll have more urgent expenses. So I shall pay for this now. I'm grateful, Gascon, and indebted, vastly. Let me do this. Let me pay my debt in part, at least. I thank you. Gascon remained silent the rest of the day. When the force halted for the night, he sat secluded in his tent. But by the morn, he was his witty, mirthful self again. His family's final resting place would be returned to its former glory. This he knew, and it seemed to lift a weight from his mind. He could now reconcile with his family's tragic past. No sign of villain yet, far as I can see. Unsurprising. Prompt he never was. The Queen had chosen to meet Willem at Devil's Tower, and not without purpose. The structure stood on an isle, so no foe could approach without first exposing themselves on a narrow bridge. The isle had little vegetation midst which to conceal a large force. A small unit could evade detection. Altogether, not much to fear. No escorts were your terms, began Gascon, with a hint of mischief. But better safe than sorry, I always say. What are you suggesting? Yours truly, and four chaps, behind the walls. Give a signal, any signal, and we'll leap to your side. Meave struggled with her conscience. There was no honour in Gascon's plan, but prudence, certainly. In the end, she nodded in agreement, 
though not without compunction. Willem arrived soon after, the heavily armored cavalry he had in tow clearly there to boost his courage. He left them at the foot of the bridge and rode across alone. A stiff wind from the river nearly made off with his ermine fur cloak. Willem and the mother who'd borne him stood face to face. They gazed into each other's eyes, waiting to see who would look away first. When neither did, Meave broke the silence. Time flies and I have a kingdom to liberate. No need to drag this out. What's this about? Tell me. I thought my messenger already did. Oh, he did. And how? Willem I wishes to arrange a truce. Only, Willem I is in no position to parley on an equal footing. Willem I can, at most, offer his unconditional surrender because Willem I's losing this war. Yes, Mother, I am. And I see that by losing I've at last made you content. Don't play the victim. What next? Will you say you turned cloak because Mummy showed no warmth, displayed no feelings? It would be unfair any such judgment. You did show feelings, chiefly enmity, contempt. But that's not why I betrayed you. No, I simply disagreed with your choices, assessments. I had every right to do what I considered just and good. And I had every right to voice my view, which you ever ignored. <sighs> Yet this is neither the time nor the place to discuss that. Let us parley as strangers. I'm losing, you say. And you're right. But I haven't lost yet. And I've no intention to surrender. I am ready, however, to renounce my fealty to the Empire and pledge my forces to you. As long as you fulfil my conditions. Mm-hmm. Let me hear them. First... You will not rescind the reforms I've authorised already, any of them. Second, you will guarantee both my safety and that of my advisers. Third, I shall remain your heir, and next in line for the throne. Impudent child! Insolent beyond all measure! Well, I had to try. Goodbye, Mother. And may you... Hold. I didn't say I reject them. <clears throat> it's come my turn to listen. You're impertinent, Willem. As you should be. Any future king must be certain of himself and his judgments. Rely on none but himself. I... Thank you. I never suspected... I'm not done. Time now you heard my conditions. You shall remove crown and royal cloak. You shall labor from dawn till dusk. And you shall fight at the fore in every battle. Is that clear? Yes. Yes, your majesty. It's settled then. Now the road beckons. Willem bowed, turned and walked away. Me followed, still angry though she could not stifle a smile. Soon thereafter, Meave's army set out towards Rivia Castle. It would not be long now before the decisive battle. How do you fare, my son? My advisers, have you met them? I certainly tried. But... They've no wish to speak with me. Begin to mumble when I draw near. Even the ridiculously reverent Count Reynard. Well, suspicion must still grip their minds. And for good reason, you must admit. Yes. I've got a lot of work ahead of me, that's plain to see. Hmm. And you shall get to it straight away. As soon as we've spoken. Your reforms. Tell me about them. You insist that I not repeal them. They must be a source of pride. Mother, why must you mock me? If you wish, I shall tell you of my decrees, gladly so. Yet not to hear you scoff them and ridicule me. If there's any merit to them, you've nought to fear. Now tell me. 
I began by clarifying key aspects of the rights of spoil and staple. Meave listened intently and with rising interest. With her son's every word, her skepticism waned, giving way to swelling pride. And then my decision to revoke Spala's trade privileges. You stand quiet, Mother. Awfully so. There are few things I enjoy less than admitting I was wrong. We'll go over it all again, Willem, in detail, when peace comes, at a meeting of the Council of Peers. General Dahi, you must tell me more about him. I think it wise to know one's foes. Actually, Mother, he reminds me of you, in many ways. Truly? You're serious? Mm-hmm. He's proud, confident, and positively loathes compromise. I'll take that as a compliment. But do we differ in any way? I mean, besides the beard. Contempt. He behaves as though he's seizing us a different, lower race, the way some elves do. All the North he treats as a wilderness to be tamed, to be broken. I saw this in Edurn. I know what you speak of. But I won't allow him to do anything of the sort. Mother, I know Nilfgaard has not defeated you in battle. I know you've gone from one victory to the next. But I beg you, don't underestimate him. He's prepared to do anything, literally, to win. I wanted to thank you. But... whatever for? For your courage in believing we could reconcile. For extending a hand and helping all this fall into place. I... I wouldn't have done so. Ever. I would have fought it to the bitter end. Mother, I understand. If we hadn't, well, what might have happened? I don't even want to think about it. Then don't, please. Let's just leave this all behind us. It's the past. We shall speak later, my son. Meave needed but set one foot into the Ruwode to know something was amiss. The sickening stench of rot hung in the air. Flies swarmed in thick clouds, and crows cawed in a deafening cacophony. What had caused this murder to amass? Well, Meave scouts soon found out. Your Majesty. Reported a certain Sergeant Nadamur. Not far from here, past the bend. There's a cutting and it's full of bodies. Our boys and the black clads alike. Bodies mutilated, horribly so, guts ripped up, entrails strewn about, heads locked. Somewhere. Well, uh, yes? Branches embrace him, grip him tight, as if the trees they, they strangled him. Hearing this, the Queen ordered a halt to their march. They would go no further, she thought, till they knew what had killed those men. Luckily, witnesses were soon found. A haggard band of resin burners emerged from a nearby dugout, black with dirt, covered in dried blood. Mulaney. Their eldest stammered. Blackings came and started felling the wood. Forced folk to chop away, to make way for a town, they said. They pushed hard. Right to the heart of the forest, where the old oaks grow, and awoke some foulness. The old, old camp, black clads and loggers alike. Done in one night. No time even to draw their weapons. We was lucky. Found pits to hide in. Just heard of something, oft and puffed. While talking to the trees, no less. Raynard ordered medics to tend to the tar makers, then turned to Meave. We cannot wash our hands of this, Your Grace. The Nilf Guardians awoke the monster, yes, but it kills Rivians just as readily. Meave stood at the edge of the clearing and pricked her ears. The Ruwode echoed with the cawing of crows, which seemed to perch on its every twig. She also heard the howling of wolves and a hollow rattling, as if branches whipped in the wind. 
though the day was fair and still. That Geralt. He just had to desert me. The Queen removed her cloak to avoid snags and trundled toward the heart of the wood. Her soldiers followed, clutching cocked crossbows to sweaty cheeks. Deep in the wood, it grew cool, with a thin fog filling the air. Meave pushed past a large branch of hazel and froze. Before her stood a tall figure, nearly human in form, save the moss-covered deer skull in place of its head. Empty eye sockets burning with naked flame, the monstrosity hurled itself at Meave with a roar. Rally to me! cried Meave, raising her shield. Everyone! Anyone! To me! Attacked from all sides, the monster teetered and swayed, fighting off their blows with ever greater difficulty. Finally, it fell to the ground and fell apart like an undone bundle of twigs. In disbelief, Meave towed the pile of dried branches and scraps of bark. She saw no blood, no entrails, as if no monster had ever stood there, as if it had all been a dream. We return to the road, Meave said, crushing the beast's deer-like skull under her heel. Ah, and Reynard, I've a request. Yes, Your Grace? Once we regain the realm and return to the capital, remind me to issue an edict. No one is to enter these woods, not to log nor even to gather brush. Just in case. Those dwelling near the Ruwode heaved a sigh of relief, and the Lyrians returned to fighting an invader who, after what they'd faced in those woods, no longer seemed so frightening. Meave arrived at the walls of Gradobor, famed for fine rugs and woven tapestries. The city's artisans had been at work, no doubt pressed by the Nilf guardians, for atop the tallest spire, that of the town hall, flapped a lustrous ebony flag, a sun of golden threads at its center. So vast was the banner, Gascon whistled in admiration. Got to admit, the black clads certainly have panache. And a vast and powerful army, I'd remind you, Reynard interjected. Arbalists line the walls. That stench in the air, hot tar. Victory's not likely to come cheap, I fear. No cost is too high, said Meave, a hardness in her voice. Reynard, Gascon, ready our men to attack. The Lyrians needed no more encouragement. Since arriving, they had reveled in anticipation of taking the city, then ripping the banner from its spire. <laughs> the gate! Someone's opening the gate! Forward, march! Victory, Your Grace! The city is ours! The battle for Gradobor was a hard fight, though not quite as hard as most had thought it might be. During the assault, at its critical juncture, a blow fell from the blue. The unlikely heroes, merchants and burghers brought together by the city's guilds. A wave of them, all riled, swarmed the blackclads at the gates and opened them wide to let Lyria in. Onward! Follow me! As fighting died down around the city, Meave rode for the town hall on a personal quest. Nilfgaard's vast, garish banner rippled overhead. With its halyard cut, it plunged like a great black bird, stricken. It was the last any would see of the golden sun over Gradobor. Three cheers! Hip, hip, hooray! The Lyrians were victorious, though not without aid. Meave met with the merchants who had roused the townsfolk, inspired them to rise up and fight. Many of my soldiers, dozens, perhaps hundreds, owe you their lives today, said the Queen. For that I am deeply grateful. No, deeply indebted. Should you know a way I might repay the debt, don't for a moment hesitate to ask. The merchants exchanged glances, nodded, grunted, agreed with each other without uttering a word. Then one, a cloth fuller, his moustache most robust, stepped forth, bowed low, and spoke for them all. Your Majesty, the invaders brought laws, 
Laws what don't agree with customs we've long held. Non-humans they forced us to accept. Let them join our guilds, sit on the city council. It's right ridiculous it is. These treacherous dwarves, why, they've been on their side from the start, so it's no wonder. But, well, the Nilfgaardian reforms, we'd like you to revoke them. Non-humans must know their place. An awkward silence ensued. All turned their eyes to the Queen, awaiting her response. Your city... Meave began slowly after a pause. Your rules. So be it. I hereby strike down all Nilfgaard's reforms. The townsmen grasped each other's shoulders and vigorously shook hands, toothy grins spreading upon all their faces. Yet when they asked the Queen to stay and feast, she politely but firmly declined. Her army left Gradabor that very day. She rode at its fore, angry and silent. I know. Meave finally blurted to Reynard, her eyes still facing forward. I know I granted a wicked request, but I can't hope to easily end hate, distrust, wipe away years of bloodshed. Not with one decree. To force those tradesmen to accept non-humans, allow them into their guilds, would have changed nothing. Do you understand, Reynard? Alas, she could not tell, for Reynard held his tongue. Your Grace, said Reynard, saluting and clicking his heels. Peasants from the Scala region have arrived at camp. Supplicants, wishing to deliver a plea to your person. Meave sighed. Supplicants, trials, audiences. All aspects of queendom she did not miss. Very well, bring them here, she replied. And instruct them to be brief, with no digressions. The band of commoners was led by a sturdily built beekeeper dubbed Ethelred, son of Theobald. Finding himself in the Queen's presence, he fell to his knees and waved his arms in his best impression of proper etiquette. Oh, my lady, the Queen, your gracious mightiness! Take pity on us tillers and toilers! Was all around leaving us but scraps to live off and belly that, to be honest. So we beg you, don't do it. Don't raise the levers. We can't pay more than- What? Meave interrupted. What the devils are you talking about? What? Your decree? One they nailed to our notice board? The peasant said, sheepishly pulling out a parchment and pointing to the relevant paragraph with his rough finger. We, Queen Meave, do hereby proclaim that if our throne we shall recover, the tallage, murage, and pavage we shall raise threefold. The expenses of this war for to compensate at the cost of the common folk. Meave and Reynard exchanged astonished glances. They had issued no such decree. Yet the document bore her signature and seal. Willem, did you have a hand in this? No, Mother, the prince said, shaking his head. We were at odds, true, but never would have forged your name. Then who fabricated this decree? The Nilf Guardians. The Queen replied without hesitation. They have access to my seal, to my scribes. They wish to spread fear, uncertainty and doubt, turn my folk against me. And they are liars without any honour. The Queen tore the falsified document to shreds. Knowing this would solve nothing, she had to find the printers churning out these fakeries and end their run. Oi, Meavy! cried Gascon, as usual paying no heed to courtly etiquette. Come here a minute. Would it hurt so terribly to occasionally address me by Your Grace or Your Majesty? Didn't want to be petty, but since you bring it up, you've never once addressed me as the Duke of Dogs. Oh. Meave sighed, rolling her eyes. Get on with it. My lads jumped one of the Black Clad's transports. Guess what they were hauling? Gascon handed Meave a pot filled to the brim with a thick, dark fluid. Hmm. Paint? Close. Prince's ink. Same tone used in those phony decrees. Meave spun on her heel, put a hand to her mouth, and yelled, Reynard! Send scouts to calm the area! Her soldiers returned a few hours later with good news. They were able to find a Nilfgaardian printer's workshop hidden in an abandoned barn. 
It was guarded by a division of elite infantry. Right, so? Gascon thumbed the edge of his blade. Shall we stop the presses? Time for the Nilth Guardians to publish a retraction, spoke the Queen as she drew her sword. Signed with their own blood. Follow me! The Lyrians did not need to be told twice. Their Queen's honor, her good name, that was a cause well worth fighting for. It's... it's her! Yes, you fool, her! Sound the alarm! Larum! They weren't expecting us. Seems they believe their own blarney. The Nilfgaardians fought fiercely, led by a seasoned covert agent. Seeing he would soon fall into enemy hands, he put a knife to his throat and, in a quick slash, sent blood pouring over paper and still wet ink. Reynard leapt towards him, trying to stanch the red tide. But it was too late and the spy's secrets perished with his last gargled breath. Meave picked up a freshly printed pamphlet. The document listed her many crimes and misdeeds, the true and the manufactured alike. Above the main body of the text, an etching depicted her... well, in a very unflattering manner. How about a taste of their own medicine? asked Gascon piecing blocks of type into a scathingly foul phrase. Me and the lads will scratch out a couplet about Ep Dahi, spread it around the countryside, give the folk a hearty laugh at those tossers' expense. Yes, these presses should be put to good use, the Queen said. But printing lewd jests is not it. We must spread facts. Tell what the Nilfgaardians did in Aldersburg. How they tried to murder me in Mahakam and Angren. What fate lies in store for those they conquer? Gascon grew serious and set the ink-stained type back down. Get to work. Before the sun sets, I wish to hold the first document in my hands. Soon, in every town, village and tavern, there hung a notice detailing Nilfgaard's crimes. The outraged Rivians did what they could to strengthen the Queen's army. Some by offering coin, others by joining her ranks. The traitorous Caldwell family's residence loomed into view. Against the horizon, it looked suitably sinister. Yet the manor had changed since Meave last saw it. Two new wings, ornate towers, a grand colonnade. And the windows now glistened with stained glass, the gilded hue of imperial suns. We must pay them a visit, seethed the queen. The great double doors opened with an echoing thud. Just inside them stood the heir to the estate, Dragomir, his wife and three children by his side, and Helena, the treacherous Count's widow. Sliding the cap from his head, thus giving proof of the family's hereditary baldness, Dragomir knelt down upon one knee. Your Grace, my father's betrayal stands beyond doubt and exoneration. The young Caldwell said flawlessly and in a single breath as if he'd practiced a dozen times. And his death at your hands was most well deserved. I beseech you to lay your trust in Prince Willem. He'll confirm and you nout of my father's plans. I humbly ask that you not punish me for his sins. Allow me to stay on my ancestral lands, to serve faithfully as your loyal subject. I believe not a word slithering out of his mouth, whispered Reynard. The first chance he gets to stab you in the back, he will take. Meave narrowed her eyes and gazed at Dragomir. Large drops of sweat dripped from his brow. You may stay, said the Queen, finally breaking the silence. On two conditions. Firstly, you will make a considerable donation toward the war effort. Then field an infantry regiment, fully outfitted, under my command. Naturally, Your Grace. And the other? In one swift motion, Meave snatched a crossbow from a soldier, put it to her cheek and loosed. Caldwell the Younger screamed bloody murder as he threw up his arms to shield his face. The bolt hissed by and struck the center of a golden sun, shattering one of the stained glass windows. Redecorate, said the Queen flatly. 
She then mounted up and sped off, earnestly hoping she'd not come to regret her generosity. I shall replace the glazing in the windows to bear Rivian diamonds. A glazier I've already sent for. Meave now reached Willowhain, a settlement she knew well. For it lay near Waldenrad, where in peacetime she would go to escape her queenly duties and enjoy the thrill of a hunt. Pheasant, grouse and partridge in abundance. You will see, said Meave in muted excitement, pivoting in her saddle to face Gascon. Alas, it appeared the war had ravaged even these woods. Where life had stirred and grown tall before, only resinous trunks remained. And the village itself had lost its quaint allure, surrounded now by a double stockade, a golden sun fluttering above it. Bastards couldn't even let the damn trees be, Gascon seethed. A dismal scene, her once cherished wood, and it weighed heavily on the Queen's spirits. Waldenrad had been a place removed, where she could rest and forget the weight of her crown. Reynard's voice roused me from her sad reverie. An Guardian garrison holds the village, he said. We ought to drive them out, avoid any surprise later from the rear. Give the order to attack, but none is to play the hero. We shall breach or topple the stockade together. Senseless to perish so close to home. Reynard nodded. Moments later, the Lyrians rushed forth and attacked. The time has come to purge these devils from our homes! Follow me! Rivia is ours! Ours! When the battle dust had settled, Meave instructed her soldiers to gather Willowhain's inhabitants. Upon spotting their armed liberators, the common folk cowered in terror. No longer need you fear, the queen shouted. No longer must you worry about homes and loved ones. The war's nearly done. Of a sudden, a villager dropped to his knees and raised his hands to the heavens in supplication. Drache! Guide my queen! Meave broke off oddly, baffled by the man's outburst. And then it dawned on her. The Rivians of Willowhain had been driven away. Taking their place, Nilfgaardian settlers brought in to transform the near subsistence plots of local peasants into great estates producing for the Empire. Reynard managed to grasp the essence of the Nilfgaardian peasants' frantic pleas. They wish to stay. They've come to love the land. They pledge to renounce their Emperor, swear allegiance to you as their rightful ruler. They... Meave had stopped listening. She turned to survey the hamlet. The walls of the huts freshly whitewashed, tools neatly arranged, flower beds well tended. A young girl of six or seven summers peered out from her hiding place in a sunflower patch. Your Majesty? Asked Reynard, having noted that Meave's mind had wandered. What are your orders? What shall we do? They can stay on two conditions. Tell them. For fifteen years, they'll pay double the tax. And if any of the previous inhabitants return, they're to be given their huts, lands, and any crops produced in their absence without delay. The Nilfgaardian settlers accepted the terms with relief. Meave soldiers with markedly less enthusiasm. As the force left Willowhain, the troops made a show of knocking aside any food or drink the peasants offered. Hail Rena, Maeve! Let me tell you of Ravencluft, a quarry Meave passed by. A quarry with a dark history. For years earlier, its wall had collapsed, burying dozens alive. Scholars summoned from Oxenfurt were unanimous in their findings. The rock was fragile, further digging would likely cause slides. Meave had heeded the scholars' advice and closed the quarry by royal decree. Yet now, as she neared it, Meave could hear the even tap of pickaxes. She dispatched scouts to investigate. They returned promptly, their faces sullen, their cloaks blanched with a fine limestone dust. Quarries open and you, Your Grace. Nilf guardians. They've got folk in the pit working it. Appear to be from the surrounding villages. Interesting. Their engineers have found a way to render it safe. 
Secure the walls. I'd say that's right unlikely, Majesty. Judging by the fresh graves we saw. My son, I trust now you see the superior culture Nilfgaard has brought. Said Meave, turning towards Willem. In answer, the prince merely dropped his head. The queen then turned to Reynard, as ever at her side. Reynard, what do you advise? As a soldier, my queen, I'd advise against any kind of assault. The terrain's hard, unsuitable for a fight, and we've little to gain from a victory. As a man, however... Yes? ...to leave our folk in chains, in that death trap. It wouldn't be right. If I were to calculate in heart and mind, keep note of gains and losses... ...began Meave. ...I'd bend the knee to the Imperials, just as Willem did. But bloody arithmetic won't dictate my course, for I do what's just. I do what's right. Follow me! Her troops followed without hesitation, swords in hand, their hearts afire. Those horses, forcing my own subjects to fight us! Your Grace, if we begin killing the Overseers, the laborers will turn against them! The Overseers are dead, Your Grace. The Lyrians handily dispatched the Nilfgaardian Overseers, more trained in the ways of the whip than the sword. Those who survived now found themselves shackled in the very chains they'd forced the peasants to wear. Peasants. Oh, unfortunate souls. The cruel labor in the quarry had taken its toll. They stood before the queen, shrunken to skin and bone, clothed in tattered rags, their eyes reddened by dust. But in those eyes burned a brilliant fire. Your Grace, them black clads treated us like dogs, stripped us of dignity. So we beg you, give us arms, let us march neath your banner. Tis a chance at revenge we seek, we want! Reynard leaned towards Meave and spoke in a scarcely audible whisper. Majesty, they've knelt. Not boots, not even foot wraps. To equip the lot, train them, would cost a small fortune. Tis true, they've knelt to their names, said the Queen. Have few skills to offer and little strength. But to look in their eyes is to know they'll never flee, never throw down their arms. Such recruits are worth coin in any amount. Emaciated, downtrodden, the peasants met the Queen's offer with gratitude. They relished the thought of facing their tormentors in a fight. Meave's force reached Cavaldon, a small, rundown town. The Black Clads! They've a strong garrison in place, proclaimed her scouts upon returning from a foray. And they stand prepared for a siege. Their stores overflow, and we see ballistas, scorpions. Cavaldon can be taken, began Reynard hesitantly. But not without losses. Considerable losses. A retreat? Is that what you advise? I fear the soldiers wouldn't take to such a course. They're eager, Your Grace. They've a fire in them. Order a retreat and you could devastate morale. Our losses may be heavy, said me, drawing her sword. But I'll make certain the vile invader suffers even more. Order the troops to prepare. We will attack. Soon after, the Lyrians moved on Cavaldon, war drums rumbling in step to their march. Upon the walls, the Nilfgaardians stood poised to defend. The Nilfgaardians had indeed prepared well, with grapples to repel hook ladders from the walls and long spears to rain down upon attackers far below. Meave managed on the fourth attempt to breach the defences, but did so scrambling over the corpses of her own men. The Queen was in the field tent when Reynard arrived with surprising news. To be heard over the groans of the wounded, he had to raise his voice. Your Grace, a delegation of townsfolk. They seek an audience urgently. Dozens of burghers stood before the tent, between them and the Queen, a man knelt in shackles. His face was bloodied as if he'd endured a vicious beating just moments before. Who's this? Our blacksmith, 
Todor! Snarled a priestess in a frayed robe. He betrayed you, your grace. Soon after the Nilf Guardians arrived, within hours in truth, he offered his labor and strength. They didn't even need to ask. Forged arms and armor for them, all for Imperial girls. <coughs> Meave gripped the beaten man's beard, tugged upwards, and looked him in the eyes. Did you forge the hooks? And the tips for those spears? I... I, I did, Your Grace. It was fine work, growled the Queen. Damned fine. So in mercy, my lady! cried a withered old man in a flower spattered apron. When a black clad bastard captured my son, they were eager to hang him. Todor spoke for him, saved his life. He helped me too! hollered a woman in the crowd. I were hungry. He shared what little he had. The townsfolk began shouting over one another. Some told of the blacksmith's noble deeds. Others labelled him a traitor, deserving of a cruel and violent end. Meave turned back towards the field hospital, pondering the case, then spotted her soldiers' corpses laid out in rows. Had it not been for Todor, there might not have been so many. Mother! Willem's voice pierced the air, replete with tension. My offences were far graver, yet you show me compassion. Twenty soldiers died today, resting Cavaldon from Nilfgaard's grip, said Meave, her tone cold and unforgiving. Twas your iron that felled them. Twill be your blood that pays the debt. Five lashes for each of the fallen. Todor's torturers were several, as no one man's arm could complete one hundred blows. Amazingly, Todor survived the ordeal, but his body had been broken. He'd never put hammer to anvil again, and spent the rest of his days a beggar. He weren't a bad person, milady. He strayed, I but deserved no such fate. Your Majesty, the hut's untouched. Ripe grain in the fields, tis hard to believe. I feared we'd have another Edurn here, with the black clad setting fire to all. I feared nothing of the sort. Nilfgaard's not stupid. Lands it aims to hold it doesn't destroy. And Willem did bend the knee to the Emperor. Broadhead now loomed before Meave and her force. Once famous for its glowing forges and clanking manufactories, the city now stood silent. Why, you might ask? Because? Mahakam. Decades past, it had opened its gates to human merchants and dwarven arms exquisitely crafted and not nearly as dear as those made by man. The caravans had simply stopped coming to Broadhead. When its black-clad garrison spotted the Lyrians approaching, they'd hastily fled, left the city's gates open wide. Yet, they did not leave empty-handed, their convoy comprising at least a dozen wagons loaded ostensibly to the hilt. With what might they have fled? With something damn heavy, replied Gascon, squinting his eyes. Look at this. Two horses to pull each wagon, and the wheels cut deep into the road. Just a few months past, was we who fled the black-clad hordes, said Meave, her tone and mien betraying disgust. Now our roles stand reversed. We are the aggressor. Well, let them run, I say. And let all Rivia see Nilfgaard tuck tail, rather than face us in a fight. The Queen strode towards the open gates, slowly, deliberately, wondering still what spoils the invader had carried off. Crumbling walls, shattered windows, rotted wood. Broadhead was bleak, a dull shadow of its former self. As the Lyrians entered, the somber townsfolk glared at the arrivals and uttered not a word. That is, until they saw Willem and began to hiss and growl. Meave resolved to address the crowd. Folk of Broadhead, you're free at last. The Nilfgaardian occupation is done. Aye, and a new one starts now. Are you madman? Don't you recognize our banners? The Lyrian army stands before you. Oh, I recognize banners. Served neath them as a sergeant 15 long years. And then I came back to my own town. Know what I found? 
Hardship and squalor, your grace. All had gone to shite. On account of damn dwarves. Been flooding Rivia with their metal goods for years now. Us smiths don't so much as light their pipes in their foundries no more. You call yourselves the Lyrian army. Colours and banners confirm it. Well, what about your arms? Weren't forged in us fires, but in Mahakams. By us worst foes. Hell, I even see some at knobheads in your ranks. And right behind, Prince Willem, who bent a knee to black lads not long past. So what freedom's it you're giving us, your grace? Freedom to beg in common, not in Nilfgaard's mongrel tongue. Beg? What do you want about, man? There's no levy on goods from Mahakam. But without it, us workshops don't stand a chance. And ye, your grace, ye wear their armour, bear their arms, and bring bearded bastards to our doorstep. The dwarves are faithful allies. They help us because... Because they've got some to gain. Simple as that. Enough. Silence. Consider yourself lucky you've a merciful queen. I'd have had your head off by now. Move along. The time came to leave Broadhead, so Meave summoned her advisors, eager to hear their counsel. They put forth ideas, many of merit, but the Queen would decide the city's future. Meave knew she couldn't abandon the folk of Broadhead, leave them embittered, unsure of how to go on. The time's come to bring Hammer down on Anvil again. Take this gold and show the North the value of Broadhead Steel. Even with the Queen's support, the craftsmen could not compete. The dwarves of Mahakam, the goods from their foundries, stifled the city's workshops in but a few months. Meave had gambled much, but gained naught in return. You must raise tariff on Mahakam and goods. Enough to stifle dwarves, make trade not worth their while. When Meave saw Reynard's usually stoic visage rent by a half-moon grin, she knew he brought particularly good news. Your Grace, our toil has borne fruit. The liberated towns of Rivia have hired an outfit of mercenaries conveyed to your command, along with wishes for a speedy victory. Meave cast an eye over the long column of hired soldiers, taking in their top-notch arms and battle-hardened faces. Her gaze lingered longer on their banners, Surprised to see some bearing the Caldwell crest, suggesting Dragomir had proven worthy of the trust she had extended him. With support like this to bolster our ranks, our way grows easier, said the Queen with a smile. Send the townsmen a letter. Say their Queen thanks them for their devotion to the realm, and when the time comes, she shall reward them fittingly. Meave spied the outline of Malabon Castle on the horizon and turned dour. True, no golden suns waved atop its towers, yet that did not mean those within supported her. Malabon belonged to House Obert, long in conflict with Meave's own, and with Meave herself. Behind their ramparts, do you see them, Reynard? Asked Meave, shaking her head. Countless ballistae, collecting dust, while war rages all around. Perhaps... The Oberts will lend us aid, Reynard replied. True, you've been at odds with them in the past, but perhaps now, faced with a common foe. <laughs> a common foe? Snorted the Queen. You mean Nilfgaard, to whom they opened their gates? Caldwell, whom they supported? They supported me, Mother, Willem said. And I know they share my disappointment with General Epdahi's actions. When they see I now stand by your side, they might forget old wrongs. the things I do for the good of my realm. Meave sighed. So be it. Reynard, send a runner to the castle. Tell the Oberts their queen seeks a word. Moments later, the castle's heavy iron gate creaked open. Meave rode into the cobblestone courtyard where Margravine Greta, head of the house, greeted her. Although greeted is perhaps not the right word for Lady Greta granted her only a barely perceptible nod. What can I help you with, Meave? The war, my dear. 
The one being fought outside the walls of your castle. Greta smiled to herself, then intertwined her brittle, ring-covered fingers. I'm afraid that's impossible. It is a vassal's sacred duty to serve her liege, and... And my liege is King Willem. Greta calmly retorted. Hearing his name, Willem stepped forward. I wish to add my name to my mother's entreaty, said the prince. We tried to pact with the Empire. We trusted General Epdai's promises, and he broke them, one after the other. Margravine Greta dropped her gaze. The Oberts had lost lands, their serfs had been deported. Under Nilfgaard's rule, they had lost no less than the other great families. We can brook no further delay. We must strike, united with all our might. Only thus can we retain hope for a victory. Mine is long lost, the noblewoman replied in a whisper. I watched from my tower as their troops marched past. An endless sea of black plate. But you are right, your majesty. At some point, one must say enough. Even if that is one's last word. Willem grasped the Margravine's brittle hand and bowed. Thank you. On behalf of myself, my mother, and all our land. Meave left Malabon Castle reinforced by the Oberts and reassured by Willem's actions. If earlier she had harbored doubts about forgiving her son his betrayal, now she was convinced she had done the right thing. The castle of Rivia now loomed before the Lyrians. Water surrounded it on three sides, and dual defensive walls studded with podgy turrets completed its perimeter. It was famously difficult to take, and had changed hands only once. A few months before, when traitors opened its gates to the Nilfgaardians. Foreign banners waved upon the walls. The Golden Sun and General Epdahi's crest on Rivia's walls. The walls of home. There was somber silence among the troops, the glee and pride of many triumphs suddenly gone. For each knew if the queen ordered an assault, most would lie dead by sunrise. Your Majesty, began Reynard in a reassuring tone. We needn't strike quickly, we've time on our side. To prepare would be wise. Two months, I wager, perfectly enough. We stop supplies from getting through. They'll capitulate, I've little doubt. Or at worst, be too weak to defend the fortress. Reynard's reasoning was sound. There was no need for urgency. Meave had the upper hand for the first time in this war. These invaders have grown fond of Rivia Castle, said Meave. So let them stay and rot. Reynard, erect road barricades and guard posts between city and citadel. Gascon. Seize all boats, barges, anything that floats. Stop anything from entering from the lake. Move! Soon, Rivia Castle stood isolated from the world outside its walls. All roads leading to it were blocked, impassable. Fishing boats, a cordon, embraced the fortress on Loch Escalot. The lanterns on their bows glowed like fireflies in summer. Then, an emissary from the castle brought a message for the Queen. General Epdahi wished to meet, face to face, and half the way between the Citadel and the Lyrian camp. Well, well, some general, smirked Gascon. We've barely snapped the trap shut, yet he's already shaking in his knickers. Be on your guard, mother, said Willem. Epdahi I know better than anyone here. The man always has a trick up his sleeve. We've a few of our own. Sleeves and tricks but I thank you for the warning and concern. Meave proceeded to the meeting point without delay. A lone rider soon appeared on the horizon. He came adorned in rich black robes, their golden trim shimmering in stray sunbeams. She'd seen him before, in Edern, through the megascope. You came as I requested. Good, very good. I couldn't possibly refuse such a courteous invitation, especially as compared to your previous missive. The art of diplomacy, you've improved your grasp. Your realm fell quickly. I expended little strength in seizing it. 
This left me much time to study. But please, we must set aside this bitterness. I'd like to formally welcome you to Rivia, dear Queen. I see you've readily adopted the role of gracious host in my home. In point of fact, I've grown fond of the castle. Fortifications impressive, atypical of the north. Not so your brave soldiers, whom we shall pick off like ducks. I pity them, in fact. Dry your eyes, General. Rest easy. I have no plans for a quick assault. I shall first wait to hear the rumbling in your bellies. Remarkable. You truly believe you can win this war? I've not been in the North long, but have discovered something all the same. You don't grasp complex ideas. You know Nilfgaard is large, but your minds don't fathom its enormity. You see, for every army you defeat, another will come to take its place. One larger and better equipped than the one before. Even now, as we so pleasantly chat, Army Group East is en route to lift your siege. Due to arrive tomorrow. And do you know what will happen when they do? They will crush you against your own castle's walls, like the maddening flea you are. Plow yourself, Nilfgaardian scum. Charming. Is that all you wish to say? I prefer action to words. You'll see for yourself tomorrow. Unlikely. In fact, I doubt you'll reach the walls at all. Pray that I don't. For if I find you midst the fray, I shall strangle you with my bare hands. Without awaiting a response from General Epdahi, Meave pivoted and turned toward camp. Her pace was quick, despite her heavy heart. It's gonna be one hell of a night! Ah! 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 Don't you dare sign the retreat, got it? My axe craves blood! Nilfgaardian blood! Let us hope this proves the war to end all wars. Always darkest before the dawn. Meave's closest advisors already awaited her in the command tent. In a few brief words, the Queen gave a report of the meeting, only with great effort masking the quavering in her voice. An army, an immense one, approaches from the west. If we meet in open battle, we stand not a chance. Damn it! Why did no one warn me? Our scouts were discovered. Captured. It must be that. Yes, it didn't seem right. Our way is so clear, so untroubled. We must flee. Not at all heroic, I admit. But sure as hell better than being trampled into the dirt. Easily said, but for a problem. Our force is chiefly infantry. The army that draws near includes cavalry, several regiments. We cannot hope to escape them. We cannot hope to hide. What do you advise? We've two options. Capitulate. Out of the question. Or take the castle. Tonight. Suppose for a moment it's possible. Tell me how and at what cost. Are we to scale a mountain of comrades' corpses to reach the top of the wall? I know we're at war and many die, but to command our troops to take that citadel is to condemn them to certain death. Rivia's walls are unassailable, I fully agree. But there's more than one way to take any fort, and this fort too. I think I like where this is going. I know this citadel like no one else. I know it's one potential weakness. The boat landing. Wait, that narrowest of piers between the two turrets? The one where the fishermen would land. The same. As I'm sure you recall, Your Grace, at that narrow pier's end stands a narrow door leading straight into the fortress. A small detachment could approach unnoticed, overwhelm any sentries, and get inside. What then? They would need to pass through the fort to the winch in the guardhouse, open the gate for the rest of the force. That is... 
Suicide? Perhaps. But as options go, we have it alone. And I'm to choose to send folk there. Most certainly to die. You needn't choose anyone, for I volunteer. And will take only those willing to do the very same. Bloody wretched plan. And you've a better one, do you? Of course. I'll go instead. Beg your pardon? I don't. Face it, Reynard, you couldn't sneak past a corpse. Sound like a bloody tambourine in that armor. Apart from which, you're Meave's right hand. So you ought to be by her side when the fighting starts. Firstly, Reynard, I'm grateful. Well done, my friend. Thank you, Your Grace. But truth be told, I did indeed hear you walking to the tent from the other side of camp. And yes, you know Rivia Castle better than anyone else, but the assault must transpire silently. Gascon will lead the force. Understood, Your Grace. Cheers, Meave. I'll try not to disappoint. You won't, I'm sure. God speed you on your way, and please, try your damnedest not to die. Gascon hand-picked his men, those most adept with daggers, not swords. Noiselessly, they glided through the dark toward the castle, the light of its lanterns blurred by the evening mist. Meave watched anxiously as the boats glided away, her heart pounding in her ears. All depended on this mission. The fate of her realms, perhaps all the North, the lives of her troops, and her own. Now there was naught she could do but wait. Good luck, she whispered, gazing at the fortress walls, cloaked by the dark that seemed to surround all now. And just when you thought things were about to get dull. You see to the winch! We'll hold them off! The Lyrians prepared for battle, their silence absolute, in darkness, illuminated only by the pale light of the moon. Meave was restless. She paced nervously in a circular pattern, awaiting the signal they'd agreed upon. Blast, it's taking long. Much, much too long. Finally, a torch's faint glow appeared atop the towering walls. It disappeared, then glowed again, and one more time around. Meave leapt in the air, and as she did so, barely stifled a cry of utter joy. They made it. It worked. Willem, it's time. Sound the horns. Attack! Moments later, Lyrians in the hundreds burst from the trees. Lyria! The Nilfgaardian defenders loaded their catapults and ballistae. They did so slowly, convinced the castle walls remained impenetrable. Then they heard chains grinding and clinking, and the sound sent shivers down their spines. Bewildered, they watched the main gate rise as the attacking force rushed forth. General Epdahi dispatched an elite unit to take back the winch at once. Yet he saw this was in vain and all was lost when Meave rode into the castle courtyard. Meave had begun the day known as a great warrior. Yet by night's end, legend was the cloak she wore. Her shield stopped powerful blow after blow as her blade found gaps in her foe's black armor. At first, Nilfgaardian scoured the fray in search of the queen, hoping to prove great heroes. Soon, she was their chief scourge and they began to flee before her blade that sung their death. Retreat! Retreat! What was this extraordinary vigor that surged through Meave? Naturally, she wished to liberate her castle and realm, drive off the invaders, defeat the arrogant General Epdahi. But in that moment, above all else, she longed to fight her way through to the guardhouse and bring Gascon's party relief. Follow me! Move! Move! As she stepped through the door into the tower, 
The silence told Meave she'd arrived too late. Gascon's men lay slaughtered in pools of their own blood. The man himself slumped over the winch's crank. Three arrows in his chest rose and fell with his each ragged breath. Meave tore off her cloak and pressed it against him, desperate to stem the bleeding. Help's on the way. Don't you even think of dying? <sighs> you know... <clears throat> Wheezed Gascon, a slight smirk on his lips. I always enjoyed doing things just to spite you. Medics on the stairs in the guardhouse steps away heard a long, blood-curdling wail. They entered the room to find the queen kneeling, pounding the wall with her fists, her eyes flooded with tears. Gascon lay motionless beside her, covered by her cloak. The queen rose, her fists clenched, her shoulders rigid, her knuckles white. Her face betrayed no sorrow, no despair, just rage. Hot as a forge, immeasurable. Now's not the time to mourn. Seethed Meave, struggling to stay calm. Now's the time for war, for slaughter, revenge. With victory today, we'll recover our home, return to our kin and set our blades aside at last. Yet until victory is ours, they must drink. Drink greedily of Nilfgaardian blood! The Lyrians were at the brink near their breaking point. They'd followed me for thousands of miles, over snow-clad peaks, through forbidding swamps. They'd fought, survived countless battles at her side, and though their gazes were now weary, she knew they'd follow her into fire. Your Grace, the Blackclads, they've holed themselves up in the upper keep. We went to breach the wall, alas to no avail. Meave nodded twirled her sword, then leapt upon a mount. Her eyes spoke pure determination. So we'll bloody well try again. This is the end, Epdahi. Do you hear me? I shall stick your head on a pike! I must thank you. Your fortress has superbly solid walls. Surrounded by fools! <laughs> Archers, let it be night. Obscure the sun with arrows. Make love, not war. Nilfgaard had the upper hand, yet the black-clad spirits had suffered. They now made more use of shields than of swords. When Mee finally broke through their line, they raised their arms in surrender. Rivia Castle had fallen. It was hers once more. Troker! Nein zu Wien! Meave showed her prisoners of war mercy, knowing full well they'd only followed orders. Death would be the fate of only Ardal Epdahi, the one Nilfgaardian who'd issued those commands. Alas, the general had disappeared. A prisoner revealed Epdahi had fled as soon as the Lyrians had surged towards the upper keep. He had glided down to the lower castle in a wicker basket for transporting food. Curled up beneath potato skins and other scraps, he'd scurried away not unlike a common maggot. 
Meave cursed her luck and leaned back against a Merlin. Dawn was yet a few hours off, but the horizon had already begun to glow blood red. The Nilfgaardian reserves now drew near, too late to prevent the castle's fall. I'll get him, muttered the queen, more to herself than anyone else. I swear on all that's sacred, I'll catch the bastard. But now we've a pressing matter to see to, preparing the defense. That night, the war turned, with the battle for Rivia Castle as its fulcrum. Meave's great victory, not only retaking the stronghold in a single evening, but also fending off a further invading army, proved the Nilfgaardian Colossus had feet of clay. The armies of the north had united and now seemed to be on the attack everywhere. Imperial forces, while still far more numerous, lay stretched over thousands of miles. Their position was untenable, and Nilfgaard's commanders knew this. In a decisive battle, they yet stood a chance, so they gave said battle and suffered a resounding defeat. Just a few months on from that memorable night in Rivia, the Imperial army was in utter disarray. Aldersburg, the fortress, remained a last point of resistance. General Ep Dahi and what had survived of Army Group East had dug in there. This place, where Nilfgaard had triumphed grandly in the war's early days, would now bear witness to its impending defeat. It seems history, after all, has a sense of justice, or humor, or both. Though Meave had already reclaimed her realm, she refused to retire her sword just yet. For King Demavend had requested her aid in purging Edern of the invader. How could she refuse? She owed the king a favor, firstly. Yet she also had a burning desire to settle the score with Epdahi. Demavend's envoy and I spoke, Your Majesty. The king has Aldersburg surrounded. He awaits and won't begin the assault till you arrive. Good. I truly hate to miss it. Tell the troops to prepare. Gear and ire. Of course, Your Grace. Yes? Is there something else? Pardon my boldness, Your Grace, but... I can't help but be concerned. You don't sleep. You have the air of illness about you. Hmm. I think back to that night in Rivia often, to Gascon's death. Perhaps I made a mistake. Perhaps he didn't have to die. He didn't, Your Majesty. He needn't have been there at all. I'm a soldier. I swore to serve you. Gascon, not so. He might have left at any time. Guilt, pity trouble you, Your Grace, I know. But he signed on willingly and knew exactly what for. Gascon gave his life for he thought you worthy of it. There's no greater proof of friendship, no greater gift one can give. Accept it, Your Grace, and remember him with gratitude, not sorrow. You're right. I thank you, Reynard. That I needed to hear. We've talked enough. We must march on to Aldersburg. Tis Meave, slayer of the black lads, long live the queen! Just watch and wait. I wager you'll chase the emperor himself off the throne. The Lyrian army had grown into a great serpent. So much so that riding at the column's tail, Meave could not see its head. Footmen, cavalry, and archers stretched like a glistening snake between two horizons. Neve had come a long way indeed, and she felt proud, as did Willem riding at her side. At first, the troops had eyed the prince suspiciously, if not with hatred. But they'd watched him fight for weeks now, and saw him as one of their own. Suddenly, Neve heard angry cries and the clash of steel against steel, all at the column's front. Close ranks! To the left! Mount's left! Support the flank! Meave drew her sword, spurred her horse, and galloped forward along the line of troops. Then, through the swirling battle dust, she spotted shimmering golden sands. 
Normally disciplined, determined to an extreme, these Nilf Guardians quickly broke rank and ran. Deserters! Leaderless, Your Grace. A scout reported. Headed south, they was, towards the frontier. Chained prisoners now sat along the dusty road. Meave stopped in front of one. He was ragged and unshaven. Flies had taken an interest in his poorly bandaged hand. Spotting the queen, he lowered his head and quivered with terror. I know you take us for savages, began Meave, her gaze passing over several scraggy black clads. But fear not. We shan't flay you alive nor eat you for dinner. And when a truce is signed, you'll be sent home. Where I most sincerely hope you'll stay this time. As the queen mounted her horse, she barely concealed a grimace. Her thighs were sore and chafed, her hands raw from the reins. But she bit her lip and rode on, for the prize was now very near. Meave was listening to a scout's report when screams suddenly burst from the prisoner transport. In a moment, Meave bore witness to a truly macabre sight. The Nilfgaardian captives, to whom she had recently been merciful, lay dead, massacred in cold blood among the camp's tents. Blasted all! Seed the queen, looking at the bloodied corpses. Those responsible for the deed, peasants from the quarry at Ravencluft, Meave had welcomed into her ranks the harm they'd endured from Nilfgaardians wielding whips. This was what had festered in their hearts and minds. The Rivians couldn't accept that their oppressors had gone unpunished. So they took matters into their own hands, in defiance of the Queen. This fiends, not folk, cried the peasants, now armed and in uniform. They was owed this, plain and simple. It had been justice by a mob, and Meave knew it should not go unpunished. Yet at the last, ignoring her advisor's counsel, she left the former slave's fate for their commanders to decide. For the Queen had grown weary of choosing between two evils, each one darker than the other. Meave noticed one of her scouts, a certain Corporal Larkin, halt his mount and train his gaze on the woods. Your Grace... I thought I heard something, could have sworn. A whisper, maybe, but... No. It's all gone quiet. I think I might have imagined it, in fact. Imagined? Meave placed her hand on his shoulder. No one has sharper senses than you. If you claim to have heard something, it's worth a closer look. Corporal Larkin saluted, then rode past the trees. Suddenly in shadow, he keenly scanned his surroundings. Something caught his attention. He dismounted then brushed aside ferns, exposing tracks made in the mud. Your Majesty! He shouted, quickly turning towards the road. Sound the alarm! It's squirt! An arrow whisked through the air, pierced his throat and suddenly silenced him. Then the forest came alive with cries in the elder tongue. Elves on the attack. The Scoia'tael fighters stood no chance against Meave. When the sounds of battle finally ceased, the Queen, victorious, tossed aside her arrow-studded shield. She then ordered the commando's leader brought before her. She'd expected a ranter who would turn up his nose, spit in her face and cry, Death to all Dwan! But the bloodied elf before her was no arrogant firebrand. He averted his gaze and his lips gently trembled. Youthful you look, elf. How many summers to you? Thirty? More? Twenty-seven, my lady. Twenty-seven. A wonderful age. A shame to die so young. I beg you, Renner. For mercy, I ask. If not for me, then at the least for... Mercy? You jest. You wait in ambush, come at us like bandits, and now, now you dare ask for mercy. It was no ambush. Don't play me for a fool. I know what I saw, and I'm no stranger to Warcraft. It's not you we wish to fight, Zvere. Then who killed Corporal Larkin, hm? Werebobs? When we saw you on the high road, we fell back and hid in the wood. We wanted you to pass. Your scout's hearing, very keen. He heard something, then spotted our tracks. You must understand, we had no choice. You know you might have surrendered. Like Driston's commando. 
Is that what you mean? They laid down their arms before an Adernian general, who ordered them hanged. One and all. If we're to die, we prefer to die bows and swords in hand. Why are you here? Were you to rescue Epdahi? Rescue someone? No, Renna. We flee. The Nilfgaardians have realized they'll lose the war and have renounced us. Without their support, we stand no chance. Demavend has loosed his hounds. They hunt our units one by one. He's offered 50 gold pieces for the head of each Scoyatel. It's the same in Temeria and Kedwen, if not worse. We wished to join with your Veth's unit, flee together as far as we could. It was our last hope. Why do you tell me all this? Because you listen still. You've not ordered me killed, so... You've clearly a heart. Eseth Aina Eddu. I beg you. So few of us remain. All tired, all wounded. We pose no threat. Let us leave your realm. Let us flee. Enough senseless killing for one day. So be it. You're free to leave. I... I don't know how to thank you. Make certain I don't ever regret this decision. T'would be thanks enough. I thank you. For your compassion. Towards me and all my folk. Meave personally unfastened the prisoner's chains as her Lyrians looked on in silence. They did not approve, this was clear. Their displeasure was palpable. The Lyrian Corps neared Aldersburg, and it could not have been on a more idyllic day. The sun shone, birds sang, trees rustled in a light breeze. But Meave saw it as she had at the war's start. Walls illumined by a fire's glow, the cries of fleeing civilians, the stench of burning flesh. As on that day, Aldersburg was under siege. Yet this time, Eden's flags fluttered in the field, while Nilfgaard's tattered sons crowned the fort's towers. The Queen found Demavent's tent without difficulty. Made of sheets of silk edged with silver thread, it positively shone. Seems the realm's restored to a virtuous path, muttered Meave. Aha! There she is! Queen Meave! Saviour of the North, the Sun Slayer. Mockery I don't appreciate. I wouldn't dare. Not my words, those. You've been painted thus in song. Master Dandelion himself wrote a ballad, The Battle for the Bridge. If you take the bard at his word, you're as fierce with a blade as any witcher. Hm. Is that jealousy I hear? be perfectly honest, Meave, it is. For I hadn't the pluck, nor resolve. And when all the North tucktail went to sight, you alone stepped up and bared your fangs. Let it be a lesson for the future to us all. You called out the future. Tell me, how's your son? Baldwin. Ah, oh, growing like a weed he is and the spitting image of his old man. Good news all, especially given the mother's profession. She's now Countess Demaretta of Gullet, a lady of the court. Oh, your lawful wife must be thrilled. Hard to say in truth. I've not seen her in some time. Duty keeps me away, you understand. Hmm. You work hard, I'm certain. Many a night, too. <laughs> you might say so indeed. But enough about me. As we're chirping away like two gossips in the field, do tell me, what a villain. He's here with me. Ah. In chains, perhaps? No. In coronet and robes. We came to an understanding. What's past is past. A lesson for the future? What do you mean? My dear, this war won't change a bloody thing, you know. Nilfgaard will be Nilfgaard, the North, the North. We'll sign a truce, 
The black clads will turn tail towards home. But the old borders don't satisfy us so. I'm perfectly satisfied with them, thank you. And I just wish other folk would respect them too. You're one hell of a warrior, but you're no strategist at all. Your perspective, you've got to broaden it. Nilfgaard, we cannot allow it to regain strength and spirit, else we'll face another invasion within a decade or two. Measures are required. Preventive, preemptive, whatever the learned call it. Build an army, a vast one, wait in ambush, and when they least expect it, Break their bloody spine. Just think, if we were to join forces... Enough. I don't wish to hear it. Won't even entertain the thought. I'll help you take Aldersburg, but then I'll go home, where, God's willing, I'll live to a ripe old age. As you wish. We can mount the assault at any time, but... But... My scouts report a small Nilfgaardian force approaching from the south. They've stayed off the roads, moved only under the cover of night, escorting someone. Who? I've no notion. Could be a mage. Devilishly unpredictable, that lot. Could wreak havoc in our ranks. Either way, before we rush at the walls, we must make certain they don't reach Aldersburg at all. I shall see to it. Are you sure? You've just arrived. Must be weary after the long journey. An understatement if I ever heard one. But I wish all this to be over, quickly. Neve set out after the Nilfgaardians immediately, a cavalry escort in tow. Her unmatched scouts, who had led the army through the mountains of Mahakam and Angren swamps, quickly found the enemy's trail. This way, Your Grace! It's not far now! That very same day, Meave's force caught up to the mysterious black-clad unit. Lyrian riders surrounded the foe, forcing the Nilfgaardians to halt. All fell so quiet, the creaking of taut Lyrian bowstrings could be discerned. The common tongue. Which of you knows it? I do, Your Majesty. You also know who you deal with, I see. What is your name? Coldvin, Your Majesty. At last, an elf guardian name I can pronounce. So, Coldwin, it seems this war will reach its end in two days' time at the most. It would be silly to die today, wouldn't you agree? It would, my lady. Precisely. I've spilled enough blood. I've lost the appetite for more. So, provided you don't give me a good reason to kill you, you'll walk away with your lives. Now tell me, you carry something for General Epdahi. What is it? A letter. Urgent to the point of insanity, it must be. Who wrote it? The dear Madame Epdahi? No, Your Majesty. The Emperor. My, my. A letter from Amir himself. You must be an important person. A noble, or... Hm. Yet your uniform is simple, with no discernible distinctions. Who are you truly, Coldwin? A spy? A simple messenger, Your Majesty. Don't lie. I know messengers, how they travel. Alone, armorless, atop a swift steed. You're escorted by cavalry of the heavy sort. For I often carry orders the recipients don't wish to perform, thus the escort. Give me the letter. I've sworn to deliver it to General Epdahi, or to die in the quest to do so. Oh, very well. My translator shall read this letter, then return it to you. You shall break no vow, and who knows, you might even survive. And if I refuse? Guess. So be it. I accept your offer. Meave's translator cracked the seal and read. And as he read, his eyes grew wide as saucers. Then he whispered in the Queen's ear. Truly, and you're certain you're not mistaken. The wonders of this world. Coldwin, 
Consider this your lucky day. I allow you to complete your mission with one proviso. And that is? That when you hand him the letter, you will give the General my regards. As Caldwin and Escort set off towards Aldersburg, the Lyrian soldiers looked at their queen with disbelief. To leave a Nilfgaardian to fulfill a secretive task. Meave failed to stifle a rather mean laugh. They'll understand tomorrow, she thought. General Epdahi had prefaced Lyria's and Rivia's invasion with a series of arrogant demands. The Nilfgaardian had been impudent, as he had felt sure he'd achieve a quick and decisive victory. Yet several months on, he too received an ultimatum. One signed by Emperor Emir Var Emres himself. The missive was concise and left no room for interpretation. With General Epdahi dead, the Nilfgaardian army descended into chaos. The kings of the north, united, took advantage and struck at the foe. Their victory was complete. The Nordling forces cheered their commanders and monarchs, but for none so vehemently as the one queen among them. Many dream of achieving the impossible. Meave had done it. Through wit, determination and boldness, she had thwarted the Nilfgaardian invasion. The queen would rule for many more years. Stern, yet ever just. Ha! Ah, so alas saved the North from the Blacklands. That is one way to put it. Well, I'll be damned. And a chap, she find herself one in the end? Leave it be, bloke's been spinning the tail all night. Story's done, time we got some shut-eye. Yes. Particularly as we've yet a long road before us. Phew! Throat must be parched as old leather after all that. <laughs> Except, uh, I'm itching to know what happened to the lot of them. Rainard, Gascon. Ah, oh, very well. Whom shall we start with? Willem? He worked hard to regain his mother's trust and respect took on many daring missions, regardless of the risks. The lad who Nilfgaard had wielded as a tool now sowed terror along its borders, and appeared a successor most worthy of Meave. Gascon was buried with honors of the most refined yet mournful sort. His peer lords themselves bore the casket. Soldiers in parade dress beat the funeral drums, and a new stone figure appeared beside the Brossard family vault, the very pointer from their crest, a ducal crown upon its head. Though Nilfgaard owed its defeat chiefly to Meave, in the Empire her name was uttered with utmost respect. Returning soldiers spoke in awed tones of her courage and generosity, referring to her as Gvedin, the tenacious one. Once the Scoia'tael had withdrawn from the Northern Realms, Non-rebel elves and dwarves emerged from the woods. Though they returned to their homes in human communities, they lived in fear of their neighbors, aware that the next massacre would eventually come. And Meave? As I said, she ruled with an iron hand, not fist, and with her son's unwavering support. She could now trust him again. A great victory. Greater even than Rivia's liberation. And now, if you'd allow me... Of course. Leave him be, lads. Let him get some rest. Till the time comes for the next tale. And just when you thought things were about to get dull,